Good morning, everybody here in Munich for the Chigos days. It's nice to see you in person, but also welcome for those who are remote that are participating. Um, it's my honor to, to co-chair the first session, and it was super double to go for those who wouldn't know me. I'm actually the, the Secretary General of the German Geodetic Commission, um, and actually that the project Geodesy, together with the project um, Geodesy and Glaciology is organizing the, this year's um, uh, Chigos days in these wonderful rooms that we can, can use, use for that. So I'm just then handing over. So, I mean, we are projects of the Academy of Science and the Bavarian Academy of Science and, and Humanities, and we can use these nice rooms here. Um, okay, I just hand over. So the first um, introduction will be given by Chair of Chigos, by Bas Basara Miya Miyahara from Geostatial uh, Information Authorities Japan. Please. Thank you, thank you for, for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning. I, I'm Basara Miyahara, country chair in the Chigos, a global geodetic driving system. Uh, I'm very happy to see you here finally face to face after COVID 19. Um, during the COVID 19, uh, Chigos has two Chigos days. Uh, the with us also our original plan to be hosted by University of Munich, but uh, they are uh, to stick to remote because of COVID-19, but I'm really happy to see you here in beautiful city, Munich, uh, face to face. Um, uh, in this Jigos uh, Days, uh, sorry, uh, this Jigos Days uh, is co-organized by, uh, locally co-organized by uh, German Geodetic uh, Commission, and also the Barbarian Academy of Science and Humanity and uh, in the Technical University of Munich. Uh, in this Jigos days, uh, we will have a uh, uh, usual uh, reporting from Jigos components uh, from Jigos bureaus, uh, focus areas, uh, science panels, Jigos affiliates, coordinator of office and other working groups. But also in this uh, meeting, we will have several keynote uh, speeches from uh, emerging techniques and also uh, important space missions. Um, uh, uh, finally, I would like to uh, thank local organizers for their efforts and contribution to host this uh, meeting here, this uh, very beautiful, and um, sorry, <laughs> wonderful venue. And uh, uh, not only for the reporting from, uh, just reporting of the uh, components from GIGOS, uh, this time, we will have a GIGOS strategic plan workshop after this GIGOS days. So uh, some of the members in this meeting will continue a discussion about the GIGOS strategy, how GIGOS can contribute to the geodetic community, society, uh, community. And so please also uh, have a, a active discussion about the how uh, GIGOS can contribute to the geodetic community in the future coming 10 years. Uh, so uh, this is uh, what I want to say at the first of the meeting. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll hand over to you, Declan, about uh, some logistics. Hello and good morning, everyone. So my name is Detlef Angermann. I'm from Technical University of Munich. And on behalf of the local organizing committee, I would like to welcome you to the GIGOS Days 2022 here in Munich. I would like to express my thanks to the local organizing committee members for the great support and many thanks also to the other uh, colleagues who helped to prepare this meeting. So after two years pandemic situation uh, and virtual meetings only, I'm really happy that we can this have this meeting here in Munich and uh, I'm delighted to see so many colleagues here face to face but I'm also impressed uh, about the large uh, participation from uh, people around the world uh, online. So, um, I'm very grateful to the, uh, to the Bavarian Academy of Science Sorry. That, that we can host uh, 
this uh, meeting here in the representative facilities well located in the heart of the city. And I'm uh, also uh, very happy that uh, Professor Bode, the vice president of the academy, for, uh, finds the time to, to be here in this opening session. And I would like to thank the Bavarian Academy of Science for the, uh, their support. And I would like to mention two names, uh, Mrs. Sokolis for organizational issues and uh, Mr. Radanovic for technical support. So uh, this uh, slide sum summarizes some general information which you all also find in the agenda. I have uh, some more also here. So if you have not taken one already, please uh, grab uh, such an agenda. I just would like to uh, point out a few issue issues. So we have a really large number of participants, uh, about 120. So uh, about 90 remotely. And I think this is a really a good success for GIGOS. And this, uh, I think, is also a record concerning participation. Um, you have high Wi-Fi here. Um, the name is Bayern WLAN. The conference will be recorded. Uh, coffee breaks are served in the neighboring room and uh, the coffee breaks are for free. The lunch breaks are on your own. And, uh, and this uh, view graph uh, shows uh, the location here. So we are located here. And there are some options here, uh, which are indicated here, which are very close. But there are, of course, many other options where you can have an, uh, lunch here in the city center of Munich. OK, and then I would like to announce that we will have a social event uh, this evening at uh, 7 PM in a typical Bavarian restaurant, uh, Andexa am Dom. It's uh, close, uh, very close to the uh, famous uh, Frauenkirche in, in Munich, which you see on many pictures of Munich. And uh, so I, uh, I'm happy that we got a reservation there. It's about 10 minutes walking distance from, from here. And uh, please uh, take cash with you because only payment by each table is possible and we are looking forward to a pleasant evening tonight. I have uh, some uh, more information uh, on the so social event. So we get a special uh, menu uh, for, uh, for the dinner uh, tonight. So we have uh, uh, two starters. We have four options for main courses and two desserts. And the uh, organizers of the restaurant ask me uh, that we should provide an approximate uh, number for, for each of the dishes until uh, lunchtime today. So we will circulate uh, this menu together with the uh, attendance list for the on-site on participants uh, during this uh, first session. And uh, I, I would like to ask you to, to indicate your, your selection, your, your numbers uh, in, um, in the attendance list. Many thanks for your help concerning this issue. And now I have uh, one slide in particular for those participants who are connected remotely. We really regret that you can, cannot be here in Munich to take part in person and for, uh, and that you cannot join us for the social event tonight. However, we appreciate uh, that so many participants from all over the world are connected remotely to join GIGOS days. And one more issue to ensure a stable Zoom connection, we kindly ask you to switch off your microphone and camera during the presentations. And if available, please also use a headset. If you have any comments or questions, please uh, use the raise hand option. And then, of course, uh, please turn on your microphone and camera. And we hope that we will have a stable uh, internet connections during the entire meeting. And also for those who are remotely uh, connected, please uh, enjoy GIGOS Days 2022. So this is my last slide. 
if you have any uh, questions or any issues, please contact me or the local organizers. And uh, finally, please enjoy Gigos Days 2022 and have a pleasant stay in Munich. Okay, thank you, Detlef, for this introduction to the logistics. Now it's my pleasure to invite Professor Bode, his chair of, of computer architecture and parallel systems at the Technical University of Munich, and he's the vice president of the Academy of Science, Bavarian Academy of Science and Humanities. And, for, and he's here. Thank you very much for a few words of welcome. But please. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. A very warm welcome to the Bavarian Academy of Sciences whether you're here in person, which is uh, preferable, of course, or uh, if you attend this uh, GIGOS Days 2022 uh, remotely. Uh, I was asked to say a few words about the Bavarian Academy uh, of Science. Uh, we are, our home here is in a part of the Munich Castle uh, called the Residence. The Munich Castle was started to be built in 1358, uh, and it was the home of the Bavarian dukes and uh, kings from about 1500 until 1918, when the last Bavarian king had to resign. The Bavarian Academy of Science was funded in 1759, so it's not as old as this building is, but uh, however, it's quite old. It's uh, one of the largest of the eight uh, provincial academies in uh, Germany. Not every one of the uh, German provinces has uh, her own academy. Um, and uh, it's one of the most active in uh, research and uh, I think it's a very good demonstration to have the GIGOS days here today as uh, a sign of the activity of the Bavarian Academy. The Academy counts about uh, 190 living uh, and active members in the sciences and uh, humanities. Um, roughly 120 of them are below age of 70. We call them the active members. These members are, have been elected uh, through an internal election process. And we have a very large number of external so-called corresponding members all over the world. So the uh, projects of the academy are working together with many uh, active researchers all over the world uh, not being a part of the ac academy itself, but it takes part in uh, these research uh, activities. The activity currently, uh, the academy currently counts 113 uh, active projects in the different fields of uh, sciences. Uh, most of them are so called long term research projects. For instance, we have a project like the Thesaurus Linguae Latine of the Latin language that has been active for more than 150 years. But uh, as in your case, uh, the Academy of course uh, touches many of today's very important subjects. And I may uh, count a, a few of them uh, where we are very active in, in uh, really today's problems. So we are active in quantum research, uh, both through uh, basic research with the uh, Meissner Institute and also in active quantum computing in the Leibniz Supercomputing Center of the Bavarian Academy, which is one of the uh, three German largest supercomputing centers. Many of the Earth observation data um, are being held in the uh, storage uh, installations and memory installations of the uh, Bavarian um, Academy of Science uh, Computing Center at LRC. Uh, and also uh, many of the calculations uh, in this field are done on the supercomputers such as SuperMOOC, which was the famous uh, supercomputer uh, on uh, 
position number four of the top 500 of the most powerful supercomputers in the world. Um, today, uh, regarding quantum computer, uh, the center uh, and TUM scientists work together to try to attach quantum uh, possibilities and uh, calculation facilities uh, to the uh, active supercomputers such that uh, the researchers have additional possibilities of uh, uh, computing uh, using data in a new way. So on the other hand, uh, many of the projects of the academy are also related to humanities, to the Bavarian history, to the Bavarian language, and to the Bavarian culture. It also houses a new center on uh, digitization, the Bavarian Institute for Digital Transformation, which observes uh, the effects of uh, digitization on society. Uh, there are very active groups in the field of uh, Earth observations, as you all know, climate research, and uh, there are also active uh, groups uh, in the field of uh, junior research groups, and they mainly work uh, with a new group that uh, is uh, trying to measure uh, means of reduction of CO2 emission. So the overall goal of the uh, academy is, of course, the networking of active scientists, but also to take an active part in the society and in the discussion uh, with uh, politicians, and also in the support of young researchers and in the support of active research cultures. So I'm very happy uh, to have you all here. I'm very happy uh, to see this important subject uh, being uh, processed here and continued here. And I wish you a very successful research and would like once again to thank the organizing organizations and the organizers to uh, take the opportunity to work here in Munich. Thank you very much and have a nice day and uh, a nice conference, and a fruitful conference. I would now, now like to invite uh, Harald Schuh, um, Harald Schuh, um, Director of Section 1, Geodesy at the Helmut Center, Potsdam, German Research Center for Geosciences, and he's a chair of the German Geodetic Commission. So please, Harald. Yeah, good morning and also warm welcome from my side. As the DGK, the German Geodetic Commission, is also one of the hosts and organizers of this conference here of the Jigos Days, I was asked to provide a few more informations about the DGK, the German Geodetic Commission, and um, also to give some remarks concerning its contribution to Jigos. My co-authors are Urs Hugentobel, who is indeed uh, the Secretary General of DGK. Helmut Hornig is the Acting Director of the DGK Office. And um... <clears throat> Yeah, okay. now it works. Yeah, let me start with the tasks of DGK, which represents the geodetic research and also university teaching in uh, Germany. And uh, these tasks include, uh, of course, scientific research on all topics of geodesy in a broad sense. I will give a few more details how we understand, how we define geodesy in Germany. Uh, of course, we deal with the coordination of geodetic research in Germany. We provide scientific advice and support for university and non-university institutions. And of course, we also represent geodesy in the national and international framework. We also coordinate uh, the academic teaching and geodetic training 
at the universities. DGK was founded just 70 years ago in 1952 as the German Geodetic Commission within the Bavarian Academy of Sciences and Humanities. The membership and also the definition of geodesy are given here. DGK has up to 45 full members, elected members, so it's limited to 45. Most of them are professors at German universities. We also have corresponding members to ensure a close link with the international scientific community. And we also have permanent guests uh, who provide the connection to administration. For instance, the president of BKG is a permanent guest of DGK and connection also to other professional and associations and research institutions. In Germany, we decided that geodesy is the umbrella. It includes the measuring of the earth and recording its dynamic changes globally, regionally, locally, less, let's say the classical definition, but it also includes and covers analysis, evaluation, visualization of the data obtained and of the processes that are recorded together with other spatial information. So this goes to cartography, photogrammetry and geoinformation. And we also include and cover the development of strategies and concepts for sustainable spatial developments, urban planning, cadaster and real estate management. This yields to four scientific divisions that are given here, earth measurement, geoinformatics, engineering geodesy, and the fourth land and real estate management. And then we have a horizontal division dealing with uh, education and teaching and training. So I don't uh, have to go into the details here, for instance, the land and real estate management division includes all planning and development processes as well as evaluation regulatory measures for the use of land and urban structures engineering geodesy i think everybody is familiar while they are doing an engineering geodesy it's the discipline of recording setting out and monitoring local and regional uh, geometry related phenomena with a special consideration of the quality of the precision or of the results and using a lot of different sensors. Geoinformatics deals with the development application of informational methods for modeling, acquisition, exchange, exploration, analysis, synthesis, and evaluation of the data on space time variant geophenomena. And the education and training and education and teaching division creates the connection between the four scientific divisions and university education. So of course it deals with the skills and qualification of geodesy students with regard to research and the professional world in an international context. And now we come to earth, what we call earth measurement, Erdmessung in German, um, the um, topics covering field of higher geodesy, satellite geodesy, physical geodesy, here, of course, different phenomena such as shape of the Earth, fluctuation of Earth rotation, and the gravitational field are studied. And I guess all of you understand this more detailed definition that we uh, very apply various geodetic methods for which are developed and used to record, model, interpret components of the Earth system on various spatial and temporal scales. Geometric and gravimetric data are collected and are stored and archived in databases within international and national cooperation projects. So that's what we call Earth measurement, higher geodesy, satellite geodesy. And now a few more um, information about selected activities of the DGK divisions. And I will also provide a slide about the student numbers and a social media campaign that has started about two years ago. So selected activities, yeah, in these three divisions, geoinformatics, engineering geodesy, land and real estate management, 
regular workshops are carried out, students colloquial with the PhD students. I don't want to go into details here. Uh, let me spend a few more words about the division earth measurement, where we um, have a very intense information exchange and coordination with the relevant federal offices and organizations. I already mentioned DKG, the Federal Agency of Cartography and Geodesy in Germany. BFG is uh, dealing with uh, uh, monitoring, measuring lakes and rivers in Germany. And BSH is dealing with the um, coastal zone, uh, the oceans, uh, not so far from the coast. ADV is the um, uh, board of all. In Germany, we have 16 federal states. Each of the states has its own uh, surveying agency, and it's the board of these 16 federal states. Very powerful organization. We uh, exchange about, we provide exchange about and coordination of ongoing and planned research activities, the joint research projects, so called research units of DFG. DFG is the German Research Foundation that provides a lot of funding for us, so it's quite, and um, SFPs are special research, um, research uh, programs with also funded by DFG. Mm -hmm. and I can say, I think we have been always rather successful uh, concerning these uh, projects funded by DFG because it is so well coordinated. So we don't, <laughs> don't compete, we cooperate. And of course, then you have higher chances when you apply for funding. And uh, that's also where we have the deepest involvement in international organizations such as IUGG, the International Union of Geodesy and Geophysics, and the IAG, the International Association of Geodesy. And that's where we contribute to GIGOS. And for instance, just about uh, one year ago, GIGOS DACH was established, which is a regional affiliate of GIGOS. Of the three German speaking countries, Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. What was it? <laughs> and um, the, let me just show two or three slides about the IUGG General Assembly that will be carried out in Berlin next year in July 12 to 19. And um, it's going to be conducted in the city cube in Berlin. So please uh, keep the dates already. Uh, second week of, of July. Here's the website. The main organizer is GFZ, the German Research Center for Geosciences. So uh, the National Committee got um, uh, the um, was selected, the National German Committee was selected, and the National Committee asked GFZ to uh, do the organization. Here you see the time frame. We are right here now on 10th of October. There was the call for abstract launched and also registrations open. And you can follow here. Abstract submission closes uh, on mid of February. And then finally, on 2nd of June, the program will be published. Uh, of course, GFZ cannot handle everything by itself and it needs support from other organizations. It's really a big, a big effort. The total budget is more than 5 million euros. And we already got agreement that um, uh, BGR, that's the German Agency for Geosciences and Mineral Resources will uh, provide some support. Also, Alfred Wegener Institute dealing with cryospheric research, Geomar dealing with marine uh, geosciences. Uh, the BKG also promised to provide some support. And um, this brings me, yeah, again, here you can see the website. And what I mentioned here in red uh, for the exhibition. We really would like to get a 
uh, let's say, a high number of exhibitors, of companies, of organizations that contribute to the exhibition. So if someone of you has some contacts to a company or to uh, other organizations, please provide us the link and provide them the link to the it's PCO Professional Congress organizer, which is the company which is in charge of doing the operational organization of the uh, General Assembly. It's a company C minus I N in Prague. They already organized the General Assembly in Prague in 2015, so they have a lot of experience. So uh, we really need to get these contacts to the companies and to get more exhibits. Yeah, very briefly, a few words about the division education and training and education and teaching. The goal is we still believe that the quality level of the university education and training in Germany, in German speaking country is high and we want to keep it high on a high level. Uh, so we also have in Germany, there are also universities of applied scientists they do more the applications and we also establish contacts to these universities of applied sciences but here the main goal is to keep the level of the university training high enough and this brings me to a um, goal that we want to realize and professor bode is here a contact person at the bavarian academy of sciences we want to digitize all DGK publications that were published since 1952. There are more than 1,000 volumes which only exist in analog as analog books. And um, many of them are uh, dissertations, PhD dissertations in geodesy and geoinformation. And um, so that's one of the plans, one of the goals. Another new um, entity is a task force that was established recently on gender and diversity because uh, we uh, found that in particular there's a need to support and to get more female scientists in geodesy and also to cover the topic of diversity. And Annette Eicher from uh, HCU Hamburg is chairing this task force. Yeah, concerning the number of students. We do always detailed statistics. Here you can see in, in um, blue the number of freshmen, of beginners of, of the bachelor program between 150 and 250 in the last years in Germany. And in red, it's shifted by time, the beginners of master students. And there is a um, decrease in the last five, six years. The trend, this is until 2020 and 21, it was a little bit, went a little bit up, but not that much. So there's a strong need to get more students in our discipline here. You can see the um, uh, numbers of graduates between 100 and, 100 and 250 uh, bachelor and master students in the last years. But we really need to get the trend upwards again and not downwards. <laughs> and, uh, um, there is a low number of students in contrast to the great demand on the labor market. That's very clear. In fact, in Germany, we would need factor of two. We would need 500, not just 250 each year. And that was one of the reasons or the main reason that we launched a social media campaign to attract more students this was decided about uh, three years ago, exactly three years ago, and it started two years ago in 2020. And the goal is to attract students and the target group um, should be really young because, so we uh, found that most important is to inform high school pupils, high school students between 14 and 17 years, that they get aware that a cool topic exists like geodesy, where they have a lot of interesting applications, a lot of interesting options. And uh, so the social media campaign with all the um, uh, Twitter and, and uh, Facebook and everything what exists, there, there is a young lady who is uh, uh, leading it and who is in charge of it. 
That was the statistics of the first uh, four months in 2020. We, there were 700 followers. Now the last number is 3,500 followers. And it's of these campaigns is the most successful so far. And um, so 3,500 followers. And, uh, but of course we have to start early and then maybe a few of them hopefully will decide later to get deeper into the field of geodesy and surveying and mapping. Yeah, finally, our last annual conference was already um, in September this year. It was uh, conducted in Innsbruck in Austria because every five years we have a DACH meeting. DACH means roof in Germany, but it includes the three German speaking countries. And uh, so it was in Austria this year. And um, the main focus was um, very naturally on the Alpine region. What are the challenges there for geodetic research? And another focus was on GIGOS, the global geodetic observing system. And the next uh, annual conference will be next year here in this room here, next year in Munich. Yeah, and finally a few contact uh, details about uh, the postal address DGK office. And if you have some urgent requests, of course, you can always contact Urs Hugentobler or myself. Thank you very much. And it's really a great pleasure for me to hand over to Suhi Altamimi, who is the president of IAG, the International Association of Geodesy. So here, it's your turn. Uh, good morning, everyone, for those who are in person in the room and for also our colleagues who are online. First of all, please let me uh, express my deep appreciation to the Bavarian Academy of Science and Humanities and to the German Geodetic Commission for hosting this event. This is an important event because GIGUS is part of IAG. And uh, as you will see, as you already see, the title of my presentation is very short, Future Challenges, because we are going to face challenges, not only GIGOS, but IAG itself. So in my presentation, I will be sometimes critical, sometimes acknowledging the achievement of IAG and GIGOS and the other component of IAG. But this is healthy because we reach the point where we have challenges and we need to face that. And in preparation of the GIGOS workshop on strategic planning, I would like to see these points that I am going to develop in my presentation for consideration to that workshop. Unfortunately, I will not be here in person for the GIGO strategic planning workshop simply because I was committed and agreed to participate in a TV program in France, in Paris, and the TV program called Science in Question. And I am happy to see in France that it's the first time, almost the first time that they devote one hour to geodesy. So I have to be there because outreach and communication to the general public is important for our science. I mean, outside they are using our science, they are using our geodetic products, but they don't know where these products are coming from. So we need to do outreach and communication for that. I will be, I will try, well, on Wednesday, I will devote my day for that TV program. Of the second day of the workshop of the GIGO strategic planning, I will try to connect online. Okay, so challenges are important and this will stimulate us to ask questions where to go from now in the future. So these are the key points of my presentation, which I will develop. When I was elected by the IAG Council, in 2019, I had in mind 
that IAG is our mother association. And I have the duty to preserve the image and the leading role of IAG within IUDG and outside. IAG has 160 years of history. This is this year we count that. And I think that there are experts in the room, especially I want to acknowledge the work of Herman Reves, who knows the history of IAG. So the root, the origin of that goes back to 1862, when we established the Central European Arc Measurement. Sorry, I will not pronounce the German name because I have, I have a bad accent in Germany. So as I said, preserving the role and image of IAG within IUDG and outside is crucial. Uh, the third bullet is about to be critical. GIGOS is seen sometimes acting as independent bubble, and this is harmful, harmful for IAG because GIGOS is not the only component of IAG. It is an important component, but we still need to have uh, all the components to be comfortable within IU, uh, IAG and IAG within IUDG. The fourth bullet is something which I have in my heart since I started working in geodesy more than 35 years. How to remedy the, volunt uh, the vulnerability and ensure sustainability of global geodesy. We have a geodetic infrastructure but we are not the owner of that infrastructure. We rely on investment of national mapping agencies, space agencies, et cetera, et cetera. But we rely on that geodetic infrastructure because it is the only way that we do better science. And this is important for us, for IAG, and it is component to have a well-sustained geodetic infrastructure. So I will go through some uh, chronology of events and see how within IAG, we tried a number of options to sustain the geodetic infrastructure. And at some times we failed to do it just because we are not the owner of the geodetic infrastructure. So then uh, global geodesy and IAG, some facts. And I cannot, of course, do this presentation without mentioning and detailing some important aspect of UNGGIM initiative on the global geodetic reference frame. So we have uh, this initiative and it might be the first time that we have this opportunity to change our geodesy and to change our science and to improve our science. And I will express my thinking about that in this presentation. And we are, for the first time in the United Nations history, had the chance to get the General Assembly resolution on the global geodetic reference frame about its importance, but the importance of global geodesy. Uh, but for that to be within the United Nations system, we have to find a mechanism for governance, simply because we rely on member states. That is the notion of United Nations. That's the work of United Nations. So then we ended up by the idea of creating a global geodetic center of excellence that will be hosted by the German government in the United Nations campus in Berlin. Now, the last bullet, obviously we have to ask that question, how GIGOS should evolve? And I would even add how IAG should evolve as a function of the above. You like it or not, the United Nations initiative will continue. And we have to get the best of it for our interest, for the interest of geodetic science. Uh, when I was elected in 2019, I had, of course, a speech 
in Montreal, and I put this slide with key messages to all the component of IAG. I will not go through all these. You have the time to read what you want to read while I am talking. So Commission 1, Commission 2, Commission 3, Commission 4, I will skip that. You know that structure and the ICCT, which stands for the Inter-Commission Committee on Theory. Uh, the, uh, we also have new component, an international, uh, I mean, inter-commission committee for geodesy for climate research. And this is a good point because geodesy contribute to climate research. And uh, we have also the ICCM for marine geodesy. These are a new entity during uh, this current uh, executive committee term. And we have a project, and we will hear about that, I think, during DIGO's days, uh, which is about novel sensors and quantum technology for geodesy. So we have to embrace new technologies in order to make sure that geodesy up, is up to date in terms of sensors and technologies, etc. Now, GIGOS, I said at that time in 2019, GIGOS should focus more on advocacy to the outside and promote the work of IAG, it is commission and services. We need GIGOS to focus more as an observing system of the IAG, not replacing the IAG. We have to be careful about that because IAG is our mother association and we need to preserve that role. Uh, GIGO should bring the IAG services in product, uh, and products to the front. And I noticed before coming here, I went back to the website, and thank you, Martin, for uh, maintaining that website. The new GIGOS website goes into that direction. So I am happy to see that, and I wa want to acknowledge that. Now, more about GIGOS. Uh, in 2019, I put this slide here, because during the past executive committee, and the president was Harold Chu, who organized a retreat in Potsdam in 2017, if I am not mistaken. And we have a strategy document. And among other things, we have these new intercommission committees and the new projects, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I want to really take this opportunity, opportunity thank, to thank Gerhard Butler, who actually uh, played a major role in that strategy. And he wrote, GIGOS, more than 10 years after its creation, is not yet working as originally intended. Insufficient communication among IAG component and overlap of commission work with GIGOS were mentioned as part of the problem. The relation between IAG and GIGOS should be clarified and the overlaps minimized. I think this statement is valid today, although I acknowledge that there were some effort to minimize the overlaps, et cetera, et cetera. It is important for us, it is healthy, it is good to ask questions, to put on the table for discussion, any kind of issues that is not clear to everybody. Now, coming back to the executive committee, we traveled a lot, but online. And this is just a snapshot of one of the photo that our Secretary General, Marco Putanin, sitting in this room, took as a screenshot for our fourth EC meeting. Okay, sustainability of global geodesic, chronology of the events. The start of the brainstorming was in 1998. And you can read why I, I think even before that, as far as I remember, as what I was a kid in geodesic in 1991, during the IUGG in Vienna, Ivan Mueller took Gerhard Butler by the sleeve to a meeting 
where I attended because he wanted, I'm talking about Ivan Mueller, he wanted to create a kind of integrated global geodetic network. And that was actually in the mind of Ivan is to share what we know in geodesy within the IAG with others because there are many, many users who are using our products and are using our networks for their application. And then we need them to acknowledge that. Anyway, in 1998, uh, and it was not in this room, but in this building, maybe Herman remember where wa that was, we had this IAG section two symposium, two worlds and integrated global geodetic observing system. And I attended that meeting. And we really started to have the brainstorming about how IAG can sustain our global geodesy. Now, in 2003, at the occasion of IUGG Sapporo, the formal integration of IGUS, Integrated Global Geodetic Observing System, within the IAG structure. And in 2007, in Perugia, the IAG bylaws explicitly mentioned that GIGOS became an integral part, an integral component of IAG. And one of the main mission of GIGOS at that time is the development and maintenance of existing global geodetic infrastructure. See, the geodetic infrastructure is the central basis for us. Now, in 2009, we realized that we are in danger because our infrastructure is not sustainable enough. And the president of BKG at, time, at, at that time, his name was Grunreich, uh, convened a meeting in Frankfurt to discuss the creation of an intergovernmental committee for, uh, for GIGOS. I am listing these just because to let you know that we started very early to see what are the options in order to sustain our geodetic infrastructure. So in 2009 in Frankfurt, we recognized that the global infrastructure, infrastructure was far from ideal and not sustainably funded. And we had a Frankfurt declaration that became an agreement between agencies. In 2010, we created what at that time was called GIGOS Interagency Committee, the GIAC. Two words an appropriate intergovernmental agreement aimed at enhancing the sustainability and quality of the global geodetic reference frame. But when I say GGRF, the global geodetic reference frame, please think about global geodesy. It is not the mathematical definition of a reference frame. It is really global geodesy. Now, in 2011, the ECOSOC, the uh, Economic and Social Council of the United Nations created, established the United Nations Global Geospatial Information Management Committee of Experts. And the Committee of Experts means that you have members, and these members are the heads of national mapping agencies in particular. And they decide everything, but with a consensus. There is no vote. You need to have all countries to agree to all decisions. And in 2013, uh, we created a working group on global geodesy, on the GGRF. And in 2015, GIAG was dissolved because we realized that the United Nations Initiative is the path to go in terms of sustaining our geodetic infrastructure. Therefore, GIAG was not able because we, at that time, GIAG had, had no authority on member state or national mapping agency or actually find an agreement between agencies uh, was difficult. Uh, in 2015, uh, the United Nations General Assembly resolution on the GGRF for sustainable development, and this was the first time of the United Nations history that in their documentation, we have geodesy there. 
Uh, now, uh, we had a su successful working group achievement, and therefore the Committee of Experts of United Nations Global Geospatial Information Management decided the creation of a subcommittee on geodesy, and this is by itself is an achievement. So you see, we did a great effort since 2013 when we created that working group up to now, and we should not miss that opportunity. And uh, in 2022, I don't know when, will the Global Geodetic Center of Excellence will start operation. Maybe we will hear about that more during these two days. Some facts. Uh, you know, I don't learn you anything when I say geodesy is fundamental science that quantifies Earth system changes, but needs to be well known by the public. It is a scientific association to advance geodesy with no legal authority. It provides geodetic products via its services critical to science and society. And here I am coming from a service, which is the International Earth Rotation and Reference System Service. And believe me, the work, the hard work is there within the services. They are much bigger than uh, the, those who are working for, for GIGOS, which I, of course, appreciate very much. There is an enthusiasm uh, within uh, the GIGOS Executive Committee, for instance, etc. But the services are working hard to, to provide the best products of uh, their techniques. Uh, IAG is not the owner of the geodetic infrastructure, which is in danger of degradation. We rely, as I said, I repeat, uh, uh, we rely on investment of others. And the UNGGIM initiative on the GGRF is an opportunity to sustain the geodetic infrastructure on the long term. It is not a threat. So uh, keep in mind also, we have to comply with the UN system. So IAG as a mother association, not a component of IAG like GIGOS, is member, observer within UNGGIM and consequently within the subcommittee on GOTC. IAG role then with its component to provide guidance and science plan. What does that mean? That means quantify and specify the infrastructure needs in order to meet science requirements. Does not mean mathematical or theoretical formulation of the GGRF because United Nations, even the Global Geodetic Center of Excellence will not deal with science, okay? This means actually enhancement, sustainability of global geodesy as defined in the roadmap of the working group based on science requirement. So some questions, what are the science questions where geodesy provides answers? What are the geodetic products needed to address scientific and societal questions? What are the science requirement, precision, accuracy, timeliness for each set of the IAG geodetic products? Does the current infrastructure meet science and societal requirement? If not, what is missing? What is needed? And there are things that are missing. And there are a number of things that are needed. For instance, do we need more SLR stations? The answer is yes. How many? Geo geographic distribution, technology, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Do all countries have access to the ITRF via GNSS technology? The answer is no. We need also to comply with the United Nations system. We have 193 countries, members of UNTGIM also, and they are coming to each session in August to say what they want for each area of work of UNGGIM, including geodesy. So we have to listen to them and we have also to provide means for them to access the ITRF, but not only the ITRF, probably 
they would need geoid, they need the gravity system, etc., etc. So what are the gaps in gravity data, for instance, networks and gravity missions? These are the, the kind of questions that IAG should formulate in order to have them ready for negotiation and discussion with the Global Geodetic Center of Excellence. So we, in that respect, I myself took the time and I invested of my time to conduct a survey questionnaires in 2020 within all IAG service to ask them to express their needs so to improve the quality and accuracy of their products. And we receive responses. We know what they need. We exactly know what they need. But the Global Geodetic Center of Excellence will not solve all the problems. We have only four years to experiment that notion of Global Geodetic Center of Excellence. And then there will be an assessment evaluation of the outcome. And if it is successful, then we can propose to extend the Center of Excellence, provided that we need, of course, investment, not only from Germany, but other countries. Okay, so, you know, I spent all my career in terms of research and science development on the ITRF. So we know that there are gaps and weaknesses, and I will take just the geometric part of the notion of GGRF, which is the ITRF as an example, show you two slides. This one, which shows you the current collocations, which means multiple instruments at the same site. These are the three techniques, SLR, VLBI, and DORIS, with the numbers that I showed that are currently operating and collocated with GNSS. I will remove DORIS just for clarity, leave SLR and VLBI. As you know, SLR and VLBI are fundamental for the ITRF, but we have a poor and uneven distribution. You know that already. What is not shown on this map is that more than 50% of these instruments are old generation systems. So we have to upgrade. And the answers of the geometric services to the questionnaires are available. You can see what they need. So this is just the slide uh, reminding you the content as the key point of the United Nations General Assembly resolution. You see in red global cooperation, open geodetic data sharing, improve and maintain national geodetic infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. Now, uh, this slide gives you also the chronology of the achievement in geodesy within UNGGIM subcommittee of geodesy and in the beginning as i said in 2013 creation of the ggrf working group in 2015 the general assembly resolution in 2016 we developed a roadmap in 2017 we have the creation of the subcommittee on geodesy in 2019 2021 20, uh, during the pandemic we drafted two reference documents. One is a position paper on sustaining the global geodetic reference frame. And the second one is concept paper on establishing a global geodetic center of excellence. Now, uh, the idea uh, of having the center hosted by Germany was even initiated or started to uh, be in the mind of BKG colleague, colleagues, and especially the current president, Paul Beaker, who was sitting next to me in 2019, and I had the chance to talk to him, and he, had, he said to me, Germany is interested to host that center. So in 2020, Germany is offered to host that center. In 2021, at the 11th session, uh, the Committee of Experts adopted the two reference documents by the subcommittee of experts. And in 2020-22, in August this year, it seems to me the agreement between the United Nations and Germany were finalized to get that center operated, in operation. 
So why I am talking about you and GGIM as IAG president, it is just because I said in the beginning, it is our opportunity to improve our science through improving our geodetic infrastructure. Uh, okay, uh, I think it is important, it is useful to remind you the definition of the GGRF. For me, it is a framework. It is not a mathematical definition of a reference frame. We wrote, we wrote in the roadmap that the GGRF or that geodetic framework includes geodetic observatories, networks, data collection, data analysis, the ICRF, ITRF, et cetera, et cetera, the height systems, but also the workforces and product generating system. That is important to keep in mind. It is not, again, about how we define a reference frame. It is global geodesic. Uh, now, I am member within the Bureau of the Subcommittee on Geodesy, and I have two hats, one on behalf of France and one on behalf of IAG. And believe me, I defend IAG more than I defend France, just because France will have its voice and IAG is an observer, and I need to express my feeling as IAG president, what we need, what we expect from the subcommittee on geodesy and the future global geodetic center of excellence. So I always remind my colleagues within the bureau that there are two priorities. The first priority is to ensure the long-term sustainability and accuracy of the DGR. We use the word accuracy, it doesn't mean it is a mathematical definition of a reference frame, but it is written like this. But to do that, we need to sustain the geodetic infrastructure. And this is the first priority. The second one is to ensure accurate access to the GGRF by all member states. Uh, this includes capacity building, data sharing, standards and convention, and also regional and national, et cetera, et cetera. So if the first priority is not well maintained, well uh, uh, taken into account, then the second one will suffer from that. So that is really the order, the first priority and then the second. Now, uh, we should also be very careful I mean, the IAG should be very careful because we have to define reasonable agreement between the subcommittee on geodesy, the Global Geodetic Center of Excellence, and IAG. And we have roles and, of course, perimeters to, uh, to agree with. So the whole idea, again, of the GGRF initiative is about the sustainability. The science should remain within IAG. The GGCE should not interfere in science. Taking into account the questionnaires, responses of IAG services should be considered in the work plan of the center to elaborate what we call global geodetic development plan with priorities, of course. Uh, there is, this is the last slide before the conclusion. <laughs> so we expect to have within the center two uh, entities. One is in the left, steering committee. And the steering committee, the seats will be taken by DISA UNSD, United Nations Statistical Division of the Department of Economic and Social Affairs. Of course, the host country, Germany, but there are question marks, contributors. There might be, and we encourage other countries, other institutions to contribute to that center. So have they, will they have the right to sit into that steering committee? And I am also pleading for having IAG sit, sitting there as an observer, because IAG, not only the president, it is the community, we can, of course, put, uh, agree on who will represent IAG. And then on the right, you have the International Advisory Committee. We know that IAG, FIEG, Subcommittee on Geodesy will sit there, space agencies, 
and maybe other experts. Now, the next step is the establishment of that, and this will be a United Nations Center. And within that uh, United Nation, you will hear, uh, have a director or chief, uh, plus two technical experts, etc. And we need to start working with the GGCE in order to develop what I call Global Geodesic Development Plan. In conclusion, so my key points are to preserve the image and it is leadership for IAG in geodetic science. Focus on the geodetic infrastructure but because that is what we need to do better science. It is vulnerable, sorry for, <laughs> and in danger of degradation. It is an, uh, yeah, the United Nations initiative is uh, our unique opportunity. And IAG should be a major and active actor in shaping the work of the GGC. More involvement of IAG within subcommittee and the Geodetic Center of Excellence are needed. Exploit the IAG services response. And I will, I already mentioned to the Bureau of the subcommittee that I would like to see a working group of experts, see member, uh, one member per service to prioritize the needs of the services to be considered by the GGCE work plan. Now, the last, last bullet. I hope I will not offend anybody. How GIGO should evolve on this? And even IAG, as I said, remember that IAG, not GIGOS, is an observer and should be a member of the Center of Excellence. We need to evaluate GIGOS achievement over the past 20 years. We need to avoid the applications of effort within the IAG component, subcommittee in GODZ and the Geodetic Center of Excellence, because we are a small community and even I mean, within the subcommittee, we have geodesists that are contributing to, uh, to IAG. So I have two questions at the end. What we would miss if GIGOS did or does not exist? We need to ask that question. I hope that question should be considered in the strategic workshop the next two days. Do we still need GIGOS in the context of UNGGIM subcommittee on GODZ and the GGCE? And if yes, how and why? So put everything on the table for discussion and don't be shy to ask questions because this is healthy and this will improve our global GODZ. And I leave you with this last slide and thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, and a lot of open questions that can be discussed in the next days. Just one information, I met Paul Becker last week, and he told me that now finally the contracts were signed. So the signed contracts between UN and the German ministry are finished now. So. Something is working, yes. Um, Two, two small things. I think one of the objectives of GIGOS was uh, to make evident the contribution of geodesy to the observation of the Earth system. Uh, do you know if this were when GGIM initiative has contact with GEO, the group of Earth observations? Because uh, you, yes. <laughs> Yeah, actually, GEO is an observer like IAG within UNGGIM. And uh, up to now, if you want really a clear answer about interaction between the subcommittee on GEODZ and GEO, this did not happen yet. But we have in mind to explore other uh, relations with OGC, with ISO, with others, because we are developing nowadays new terms of reference of the subcommittee on geodesy and this is one uh, thing that annoyed me a lot is iag is, is not recognized as official member of subcommittee on geodesy so i am actually advocating and arguing uh, my arguments is without iag you can do nothing and we need to have iag within 
a, a, an official member uh, with rights to vote, etc. if we need to vote within subcommittee of judges. And in the meantime, other colleagues from the member, uh, from the Bureau, mentioned other other uh, organizations, uh, organizations like JU or, as I said, OGC and ISO, etc. Did I answer the question? Very. <laughs> uh, maybe I think we are okay. running out of time a little bit. And <laughs> so we, we still have plenty of time for discussion later uh, this week. Okay, let's move on now. And I like to hand over to the GIGOS president, to the chair of GIGOS, who will give uh, the GIGOS report now. Thank you. Thank you, Hara, for the introduction. So I'd like to briefly uh, make a report about GIGOS activities, uh, mainly on uh, last uh, one year, but also including uh, three years. Okay, um, yes, uh, as, as you have already mentioned, uh, GIGOS is in a, a system of international association of JODC IEG, and uh, our server is IEG central interface to the scientific community and, soci and to society, um, especially for outreach communication, and they provide uh, uh, an, uh, the base uh, for future advancing geosciences. As you can see on the diagram, the uh, under IEG, GIGOS is listed uh, with the other IEG components. Okay, then the, as uh, I'm sure the, uh, 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 I guess uh, some of the, uh, the participants uh, are not uh, know much about the GIGOS yet. So uh, as you can see on the figure, the geodic observation is now from the Earth's surface to the uh, space and covering uh, a lot of uh, aspects of the uh, the measurement, and uh, they are capable to detect the uh, very small movements on the Earth, uh, even in real time, and also uh, the of course detecting the shape of the Earth. Okay, and uh, uh, these observation techniques are provide us in the point positionings and also our uh, scanning of sur our surface and also uh, distribution of uh, gravity field. And all of them are combining to the, uh, the three pillars of geodesy, uh, geometry and geometrics, and those as rotation and gravity phase, and all of them uh, uh, contribute to the uh, geodesic reference frames. So GIGOS is uh, working to uh, make these all of things to uh, more sustainable and uh, to make uh, the people understand the value of these activities. So the vision of GIGOS, uh, so as I mentioned, uh, we will have a strategic plan workshop after this GIGOS day. So uh, these missions and the goals also need to discuss in the workshop, but the current GIGOS strategic plan, we have these vision and uh, missions. Vision of GIGOS is advancing our understanding of the dynamic Earth system, by quantifying our planet changes in space and time. And GIGOS has three missions. The first one, they provide the observations needed to monitor, map, and understand changes in the Earth's shape, rotation, and mass distribution. And the second one is to provide a global frame of reference that is the fundamental backbone for measuring and consistently interpreting key global change processes and for many other scientific and societal applications. The last one is to benefit science and society by providing the foundation upon which advances in arts and planetary system sciences and applications are built. And then the GIGOS goals, uh, the first goal is to, prim to be the primary source uh, for the global geodic inf information and expertise serving society in our system science. The second is uh, to advocate uh, for improvements in the integrated global geodetic infrastructure needed sorry, needed to meet our science and society requirements. The third is to coordinate with the international digital services that are main source of key parameters and products needed to realize a sustainable global frame of reference and to 
observe and study changes in the dynamic Earth system. And the last is to communicate and advocate the benefits of GIGOS uh, Geodesy to user communities, uh, policymakers, funding organizations, and society. Uh, GIGOS has the structure uh, shown in the diagram. Uh, we have GIGOS Consortium uh, Steering Committee and the GIGOS Coordinate bo Board uh, decision making bodies, uh, which has a representative from IG services, commissions, intercommissioned project, and the other related stakeholders. And uh, we also have GIGOS science panel who are uh, given advice from a scientific perspective. And uh, uh, we have two GIGOS affiliates, GIGOS Japan and the hub. Uh, GIGOS coordinating office, uh, now uh, hosted by uh, VEV Australia to uh, support GIGOS uh, as a uh, coordinating office. And uh, the main part of the GIGOS activity, we have two bureaus, a Bureau of Networks Observ Observation, chaired by Mark Palmer, and the uh, other one is G GIGOS a Bureau of Products and Standards, uh, chaired by Dr. Hangaman. These two bureaus uh, work uh, uh, mainly uh, for the uh, coordination of the observation network and also products and standards. And we now have a uh, GIGOS focus series, three focus series, geophysics and uh, unified high system, and also uh, geotech space weather research. And of course, GIGOS depend on the IG services, commissions, and intercommission committees uh, strongly. Uh, they provide the infrastructure, products, expertise, and support to the, our, our work. Okay, uh, let me move on to the report of GIGOS activities in 2022. Uh, in this term, uh, GIGOS uh, strongly focus on geodesy outreach. Uh, we updated GIGOS website, and the uh, uh, main new feature of the uh, GIGOS website is uh, new pages for geodesic observations and products. And also, uh, GIGOS developed the uh, GIGOS short film uh, to show the value of geodesy, uh, not only for scientists, but also for the general public people. And uh, uh, as Harold already mentioned, uh, GIGOS welcomed a new uh, GIGOS affiliate from a uh, uh, region, uh, German-speaking country, GIGOS the hub, and uh, GIGOS, GIGOS also already have a GIGOS Japan. Sorry, uh, the uh, duplication of the uh, content, but uh, GIGOS affiliate, uh, this should be GIGOS the hub, GIGOS Japan, sorry. And uh, 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 we also now planning to update GIGOS strategic plan. Uh, we will have GIGOS strategic plan uh, workshop after this uh, GIGOS days. And uh, for the preparation of the workshop, uh, we conducted GIGOS strategic plan survey uh, to uh, hear the voices from IG services, IG components, and also other related people, what they need GIGOS, uh, what from GIGOS, and uh, what uh, they want GIGOS. And uh, uh, yes. Uh, and uh, also, we also have an important uh, progress in DORIs and uh, GIGOS is now uh, capable to assign DORIs for general technical document in GIGOS also on IG. So uh, the update of GIGOS website. Um, so originally uh, the GIGOS website used to concentrate on the organizational structure of GIGOS, but uh, now the GIGOS website is concentrated both on organization, uh, GIGOS as organization, as also for the GIGOS as observing system. So uh, IIG services are now on the top of the site of the GIGOS uh, website. And also we have now new two features, uh, pages for GIGOS, uh, uh, sorry, geodetic products and also geodetic observations. Uh, under the, this uh, contents, uh, we provide two entrance gates to access geodetic products. And the uh, uh, pages have easy explanation and eye-catching visuals, and also appetizing questions to attract more audience. So you can see two entrance pages on the front, and uh, through the two pages, you can access through uh, geodetic things, five geodetic things like um, uh, geometry, uh, gravity field, reference frames, earth orientations, and also positioning applications. Of course, uh, uh, the other gate provide uh, access to the generic products through the category of our system components and space. And uh, after the development of the uh, pages for uh, GIGOS products, 
Uh, we also develop new pages for geographic observations. And the uh, page is now covering the conventional uh, geodesic observations and through the new items, quantum gravimetry, optical uh, atomic clocks, geogenesis uh, refractometry, and so on. And the uh, only content uh, now uh, under development is INSA. INSA will come in soon. And there were, uh, GIGOS also developed GIGOS short film. Uh, the purpose of just the short film is to outreach the importance of geodesy to the general public. Uh, uh, in the film, uh, we try to uh, explain why geodesy is important uh, for people, for society, why geodesy, uh, how geodesy contributes to the society and science. And now the, on the GIGOS YouTube channel, uh, the films in different, 10 different languages on you, uh, uh, in different languages are available. So uh, I, I, I think, I guess uh, you already, uh, uh, see the uh, this film, but uh, please uh, look at the Jigos uh, YouTube and see the films. Uh, on the Jigos YouTube channel, uh, there are also another uh, outreach films of Jodeci, uh, like an uh, uh, importance of collocation, uh, local survey, and other thing. Also, uh, okay, so uh, as I mentioned, uh, we now we have two Jigos athletes. One is from Japan, Jigos Japan. It, was the, it is the first GIGOS affiliate. The second one, GIGOS the hub. Uh, collaboration to strengthen the uh, re, uh, region uh, in German speaking countries, Germany, Australia, and Switzerland. And uh, uh, GIGOS the hub uh, uh, instrumentalized contributions activities to GIGOS and IG services from the hub and tighten the links to with GIGOS. Uh, the GIGOS the hub is shared by Hans Jo. Uh, now, uh, Jigos Daha and Jigos Japan, two Jigos Sahavalites also have a discussion to strengthen the uh, cooperation between the Jigos affiliates. And uh, uh, we hope we will uh, welcome the third Jigos affiliates from the, uh, Spain and Portuguese, uh, hopefully, coming year. Okay, and uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we are now planning to uh, update Jigos strategic plan. The current Jigo strategic plan was published in 2014 and uh, already eight years uh, passed. And it's time to update it, uh, the plan to meet the demands of the global agile community. Uh, in order to hear the voice from the global agile community and also the uh, people outside of Jodeci but related to Jodeci, uh, like GEO and CEOs, and, uh, uh, we conducted an uh, Jigo Strategic Plan Survey uh, 2022 this year to ask IG services and the other people what they need from Jigos and identify what need to be kept in Jigos uh, and what should be changed in Jigos. And the uh, uh, result of the survey is already uh, integrated and analyzed, summarized by Matt Martin and already available to the uh, participant of the Jigo Strategic Plan Workshop uh, after this Jigo days. And we will have uh, two days uh, in-person, uh, partly hybrid workshop uh, after Jigo days 2020. And we will plan to do SWOT, strengths, weakness, opportunity, and threat analysis in smaller groups, and then refine our 2022 draft Jigo's goals and objectives. And uh, I think it's different for the comments about our planning. Uh, we will definitely consider your comments. And uh, please also give us uh, your comments during this, this Jigo days. And of course, after the uh, Jigo Strategic Plan Workshop. And uh, uh, final thing I would like to uh, emphasize is that uh, Jigo's uh, working group on DOIs, uh, chaired by Carson Elgar, is uh, uh, doing a really nice job about the DOIs for geodetic uh, data sets, but only if, uh, not only for geodetic data sets, but also DOIs for general technical doc documents in GIGOS and IEG. Uh, GFZ data service a country uh, provide an, uh, 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 capability to assign DOIs to IEG GIGOS documents. Uh, under this service uh, distributor is uh, GFZ data services, but publisher is GIGOS or IAG. And the advantage is to assign uh, DOIs for general technical documents is, uh, it is 
uh, it, it will be citable, uh, easier, uh, easier citable, and uh, it is it, it, uh, become easier versioning links to all the, uh, it, uh, it will be possible to link, make a link to all the uh, newer versions. And also uh, it will provide an opportunity to uh, send DOIs for not only for the whole document, but also for sub chapters. Uh, it uh, helps uh, to better cite and honor the authors of subchapters. Uh, possible use cases and GIGOS TOR strategic plan implementation plan, also IAG travel report, uh, and other IAG services, for example, uh, IGS technical documents like Linux uh, for document uh, descriptions. And GIGOS already started to assign DOIs, and all of them are available on the GIGOS website. And uh, the last thing I would like to mention is an uh, uh, upcoming GIGOS meetings. Uh, uh, AGU 2022 next month, we will have a GIGOS session. Uh, the title of GIGOS Global Geodetic Observing System, Geodesy for Sustainable Earth Observation. Uh, it will be held in December 12, all our session and 13 post session in Chicago, USA. And we will also have an, uh, a GIGOS session in AGU 2023. Uh, at, at the same title of AGU. And uh, GIGOS code being board meeting, uh, it's still not decided the details, but uh, usually it will uh, be, hold, be held in conjunction with EGU 2023. And uh, maybe uh, the next time we will be hybrid in person and in virtual. And um, uh, of course, IUGG, IUG General Assembly 2023, GIGOS will have its own symposium. And uh, uh, GIGOS Days 2023 is currently planned to be uh, planned to be held in Yaba, Spain, uh, hosted by IGN Spain, and uh, sometime maybe early September. So please uh, keep your schedule to the next GIGOS Days 2023 in Spain. Uh, this is the final slide of my presentation. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much for this overview and about um, the future plans. I think now it's time for having a break. <laughs> Enjoy the break and see you again at 10.30, please. And I just uh, started to introduce your talk about novel sensors, quantum technology for, for geodesy. So just uh, start with your presentation, please. Okay. Thank you very much for inviting me and uh, I'm sorry that I cannot be in Munich with you, but I have too many obligations here at the university. I will present uh, you some ideas on where we can benefit from novel sensors and one technology for various geodetic applications and I will also uh, present a few ideas uh, or project parts from our major research uh, project TerraQ. So, uh, let me uh, start very general uh, because we are in the GIGOS session. So what, what we plan, uh, what, we, what our uh, task are is to observe uh, and carry out measurements uh, to better understand processes uh, and rotation and, uh, and measure uh, and size of the earth. And uh, so this is one, one pillar. And what we apply are many uh, space techniques. This is taken from the GIGOS webpage, many satellite techniques. But uh, my focus now will be more on the gravity field side, so where we want to better determine mass distribution and mass variations. And here again, we apply satellite techniques. Uh, one famous one is GRACE or GRACE follow on. And now the question is, is it sufficient or do we need more? And should we apply a different kind of technology? And this is why we have set up, IHG has set up this uh, new project on novel sensors and quantum technology technology for geodesies qg and we have defined uh, three uh, major working groups uh, uh, one is dedicated on uh, using quantum gravimetry in space and on ground uh, is, is chaired by uh, colleagues from french and belgium uh, we have a group working on uh, improved satellite missions improved laser interferometry and we have a uh, group on relativistic geodesy with clocks. And we, I will show you uh, what we do and what, uh, where we can benefit. 
Uh, but my starting point, I want to remind you once again that our knowledge on the Earth's gravity field is rather poor, even with the best uh, data or long-term observation of grace and growth follow on. We are restricted to see only a very long-term mass variations uh, on Earth. Uh, and for sure, we have to improve the, uh, the accuracy, so, so go down. Uh, to uh, see small scale effects or which are not uh, with a big amplitude and we have to achieve a better or higher resolution and for for the global coverage we certainly need some improved uh, satellite tracking tracking methods and on ground for, for example we can em employ quant gravimeters this is an example from the french uh, system to also uh, cover the whole, whole spectrum of gravity field uh, knowledge Con concerning uh, uh, so reference frames. Uh, here I once again repeat Chico's goal, which is one millimeter and 0.1 millimeter stability. Uh, uh, we, we see that the gravimetric parts, the geoids, height systems, the physical height systems are much worse than the geometric systems. So whereas we approach a one millimeter already for the geometric part. Uh, thanks to the, the major work of DGFI and uh, Suha and his groups. Uh, in the, for the gravity field parts, the height systems, we are off by centimeters to meters. And there we may in future employ uh, clock networks, uh, not only to get a better knowledge on the physical height systems, but also to link the gravimetric and geometric part, as uh, both are based on time measurements. Okay, now I will cover the three topics, uh, uh, laser and, uh, uh, and atom uh, interferometric sensing in space and on ground, uh, main, mainly in space, and also the clock business. Uh, as a reminder, uh, has already been uh, partly said, uh, we have the global security field missions uh, where we use satellite measurements in the, in the satellites as a test body uh, in the uh, in the uh, Earth's gravity field. And uh, one important thing is that we need accelerometers in the center of mass of the satellite because at the low orbits where we have to operate our gravity field satellite missions, as the atmospheric drag plays a major role, a, per, a major perturbation, and so we have to determine it. And I mention it because this is a limiting factor right now. Uh, but there exist other systems, uh, for example, the, uh, what has been realized with the GOCHE, where we uh, use many test masses in one satellite and uh, in a certain way uh, the relative acceleration is tracked and Roland uh, will afterwards certainly talk about much more configurations, uh, more complex constellations uh, where we can even better observe the Earth's gravity field. Now, uh, what can we do uh, uh, or what is needed? So from Grace follow on, we learned that laser interferometry is, um, uh, provides much better, can potentially uh, provide much better results than in the uh, Grace case, because we have now uh, replaced, or we have demonstrated that the LRI in the satellite tracking uh, is much better uh, than the KPR tracking. This is the blue one is KPR tracking. And the red is a LRI, and if you project it on the Earth's surface, and we can see that uh, in a certain measurement bandwidth, we can get much more uh, signal and much less um, noise. But we also see that uh, some, some obviously some measurements uh, show discrepancies. Here's a, uh, from a paper of Bano et al. Uh, see the comparison to auto altimetry, and we see that uh, if you combine. Uh, the grace full on measure as uh, a grace measurements uh, with the measurements from uh, um, or at uh, uh, the drifter measurements that has some discrepancy which is not completely resolved. But we also see that we have this huge striping effects still and uh, these striping effects uh, also affect the uh, determining of the earth gravity field measurements here you see a typical uh, non filled result and uh, one one of the problems is related to the accelerometer measurements and is illustrated on the figure uh, on the left hand side that uh, we have at the, uh, uh, to the lower frequencies uh, large errors due to the drift of the accelerometers. 
and here we can really benefit. Uh, if we do not uh, resolve this problem, uh, then a typical processing is that you apply some filtering on the, uh, to get rid of the stripes, and then you, you get a certain uh, signal, uh, but it's not what you really want to get. So because you have a lot of uh, uh, smoothing, uh, not only of the error, of the noise, but also of the signal. And I will now the following, uh, so, so uh, many reasons for this driving, and I will uh, give you an example how we can benefit uh, if you have an improved actual meter. Anyway, we also have to benefit uh, the background modeling, but today on new sensors, it's the actual meter where we can work on. And uh, this is shown in this figure. So, for example, on the right hand side, uh, one option is that you still use this electrostatic axiometers, but uh, uh, employ some uh, optical readout. And this is uh, now shown. So, on the left hand side, you have a typical unfiltered grace uh, follow on case with a KBR, KBR ranging, so, so microwave ranging. If you used so some optical axiometer, new optical uh, axiometer, you can uh, see that it goes down, the striping effect, largely it goes down. And if you then switch on the LRI, you can even more benefit. So that means uh, uh, by reducing uh, this low frequency errors, uh, you can either achieve this KPR, KPR ranging signals, so this is a dotted uh, one, or in the best case now, graceful on future missions, you can approach this. And uh, in a, so this new technology really helps you uh, to uh, improve your data. Uh, and you can not only use uh, some electrostatic uh, axiometers plus, um, uh, electro, uh, plus optical readout, you can also use uh, cold atom interferometers. That means uh, you can uh, do your acceleration measurements by using atomic uh, clouds, which are uh, excited to follow different passes. So uh, you change the state uh, th uh, three times uh, by manipulating the atomic clouds via, uh, with laser pulses. And then you can read out this phase shift uh, at the end after a certain cycling time, and uh, you can get the uh, acceleration measurement. And as I said, for GRACE-like missions, uh, you need it in the center of mass. So that means you need such a, a system to send off mass and again, reduce uh, uh, the low frequency errors. And uh, in the, some ideal case, you will, uh, uh, depending on, on the performance of the chi axiometer, uh, you will add it by some hybrid, uh, uh, by, by some electrostatic axiometers. So that means by adding uh, or combining the electrostatic and the uh, chi axiometer. And the benefit, uh, is that you can achieve, uh, uh, have a much better uh, sensitivity, 10 to minus 11 or 10 to minus 12 meters per uh, second squared by square root of hertz, and you can cover a wide spectral range uh, with this high accuracy. And so you can use it for brace like missions, but you can also use it for. for um, uh, let me first show you uh, how these systems look like. So, so if you run it in some these hybrid sensors, this is some new on electrostatic axiometer behavior, and these are combinations of this chi-based ones. And so you can see, in any case, you always uh, get, can reduce uh, this this large drift at the low frequencies. And on the following slide, I show you an example where we can use it for goes. Goche follow, uh, follow on mission, gradimeter mission. So, uh, the typical uh, Goche result is so the, the dark black one is what we, the signal we want to observe. And this, this dotted line is what we got from, from uh, Goche. And if you use this new kind of sensors, chi or optical uh, uh, readout based electrostatic gradimeters, uh, we can in any case improve the situation. So here once again is the goal, and here many, many test, test cases, and you can not only reduce the high frequencies, but also the low frequencies, and uh, such a new mission. So ca you can really benefit from this um, kind of uh, sensors. And also on ground, just one slide. To also, uh, do, do, uh, do not forget these ground measurements. You can also have these ground gravimeters, and the benefit is that you have high measurement accuracy in, in short time. And this is what is also um, built or constructed in our research uh, project. 
and the advantage is that this, this ground machine, you can go to local mass variations, for example, uh, some groundwater uh, mass variations uh, uh, close to the coast, where, where some salt uh, water may, may affect the freshwater lenses. Uh, but you can also use those devices uh, as a registration uh, measurement. So not only point measurements as an FG5 absolute gravimeter, but you can also use it as a registration instrument uh, to, to also compete with the superconducting gravimeters. And in Hannover, we also have uh, been building a very long pace and atom interferometer. So this one is one meter height, this one is 15 meter height, so that, which can serve as a new gravity reference some in the future because with this uh, uh, longer uh, uh, cycling time for, of the atoms over 15 meters, you can get uh, incredible high accuracy if you can control all the other effects. Okay, and one major part is this chronometric uh, leveling. So using clock measurements uh, for, uh, for geodesy, for the height systems. So we exploit the effect as predicted uh, by Einstein's theories that each clock shows its own proper time, tau, uh, and uh, this is related to the potential difference between two locations on clocks on Earth. And with this uh, measurement, uh, and uh, uh, let me say, the accuracy is 10 to minus 18 for this re relative frequency measurement. So this uh, clock measurements can provide this frequency shift and it corres uh, corresponds to a clock uh, height change of about one centimeter. And this frequency shift as shown here uh, provides us this potential difference. And this is exactly what we need for physical height, for example, for orthometric height. And then uh, we do not have this uh, potential measurements. Right now we do it by leveling and gravimetric measurements. We only have these clock measurements in future. And if you add some GPS measurements, uh, measurements then you can also get the geoid. So uh, GPS plus or GNSS uh, plus clock measurements provide you point-wise geoid values. And I should not forget uh, that uh, this raw clock measurement is not of any help because you only uh, you observe clock um, um, differential measurements between two clocks and you have to connect the clocks. And normally we use on ground fibers, optical fibers, but in future we need also connections to satellites to have time transfer via satellites, low flying satellites like the ISS or high, some high flying satellites. So we should not forget it. Uh, this is an experience we did with a colleague from PDP in Track, our Metrology Institute, a few years ago. Uh, we, at that time, achieved a 30 centimeter uh, height transfer between Track and Paris, uh, where our classical methods stack at four centimeters. So this is what we achieved classically. At that time, we achieved 30 centimeter. We did, uh, as the colleagues, improve the systems. And today, we can achieve a, a 10 centimeter accuracy. And the goal is we will have uh, new measurements early next year uh, in, in uh, connecting various places. And so we want to approach the sub uh, 10, uh, so the centimeter level, not the sub centimeter, the centimeter level, so less than 10 centimeters. And we will do it soon. And the core of this clock measurement, so the transportable clock, uh, is in such a container or trailer. And as uh, a clock looks like this. So this is a strong lattice clock that uh, it is uh, run in, in Braunschweig. Uh, and what we already did in Hannover is we, we, we showed by simulations that if you have um, so uh, clock measurements providing the potential difference, and we have uh, some simulated errors uh, in uh, height systems, and we used as a European height system as a reference where we introduced artificially some errors, uh, then, uh, and the arrows that we introduce have some uh, lati lati uh, latitude or longitude uh, variations, but also effects which are uh, which uh, illust um, uh, which um, uh, simulate uh, uh, that if you go away from tight uh, gauges or if you have noise leveling lines or whatever or offsets, that we can really resolve it by putting uh, clocks uh, in uh, in these areas, and we can then uh, reduce. Uh, errors which are have could have been in the DC meter level to the few centimeter level just by putting a few clocks in uh, at, at uh, nice places uh, in, in some places uh, of the high systems and we can really resolve 
systematic distortion in, inside uh, say, uh, say height systems, but also between different height systems. So, so really powerful this clock uh, measurements. And we also showed in simulation that we can, uh, if we assumed having clocks on nice places in, in, in Greenland or in Amazon, and here this is, this is the double arrow shows the, the, the clock accuracy of 10 to minus 18, which is achieved in, in labs right now, so that we can really observe those mass variations. And I will zoom in or in more detail for the Greenland case. And uh, on the left hand side, let's start with some reminders that you, we not only observe the mass changes, uh, which happens by ice melting, uh, but also the deformation because we have some elastic response. Uh, so, we, uh, and this is shown here so that in our simulation, we also include the deformation effect and some real GPS sites and the mass change effects in these sites, and the clocks always can observe the sum of both. And if you are interested in one part, then you have to add the clock measurements or combine it with GPS measurements. And But we see that uh, these changes which are observed here uh, over the years in all places are in touch uh, with the clock measurement accuracy right now. We can also use uh, clocks in space, and then we have to go back to this, this, this timing formula, uh, which connects proper time and coordinate time. And uh, 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 then we have to use the formula in a little uh, different way, a little bit different way to what we use on ground, because now we have to take care of the velocity, which can be observed by, for example, GPS measurements on, 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 uh, on the satellites. And then we can compare uh, satellite clocks with ground clocks. And uh, uh, but we will resolve the potential difference. So that means not the height, the potential difference, and the 10 to minus 18 corresponds to 0.1 meters squared per second squared. And uh, we could show it by simulation, depending on the clock accuracy, it's 10 to minus 17, 18, and 19, that indeed some long wavelengths uh, mass variations uh, could be observed. But this simulation was with, uh, assuming a, a, a high accuracy in very short time. If we do it more realistically, uh, and assumes that we, we, we collect the clock data over one, uh, one hour. Uh, then this example shows us that uh, this degree two coefficient, coefficients could be observed. So for example, degree two uh, uh, C to zero coefficient uh, as obtained by such, such a clock measurement over uh, a few years uh, can well be uh, derived. So this summarizes the clock part that we can use it for uh, resolving uh, uh, discrepancies between height systems, we can unify height systems, uh, we can uh, monitor uh, potentially geoid values, uh, mass variations, and maybe in future also support some gravity field uh, measurements in space. And here's a summary plot. If you want to apply it for the gravity field recovery system, new measurements, for example, uh, we can we could show we can show that the cold atom interferometric gradimeter can outperform what we have from Goche. Uh, the clocks can only help, it's a very long, low frequencies, but a quant technology, this is a grace case, this green curve, uh, uh, will help to even improve uh, the high grace or grace follow-on measurement performance by uh, reducing the errors in this part. And this summarizes my, my talk. So we can use atomic and laser interferometric sensors very well to provide better gravity, a static gravity field, height systems, a geoid, but also say mass variations, which are so much relevant for better understanding our climate change processes. And the clocks can serve as a kind of anchor points of an, an, uh, uh, by, by providing a frequency. So the clocks can be a new kind of tight gauge uh, in future. The frequency can be a tight gauge stable clock. So it's helpful for reference systems, uh, may, uh, mainly on ground. And it can also provide some uh, interesting gravity field information. And uh, we will work on this uh, to better understand in our uh, research project TerraQ, uh, but also in our uh, IHG project QG, and this is summarized here once again. A reminder, uh, if you want to support it or, or connect to us, go to our webpage, see what we do, uh, do you, you find the, uh, the addresses. And this slide just summarizes uh, where we expect our major benefits. And this uh, on all levels, uh, mass observation in space, on ground, uh, 
also for the health systems and the reference systems. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Jürgen, for this excellent overview. Really exciting perspectives, I think. Are there any questions from the audience here? I do not see a hand. Are there questions in the chat or? <laughs> I see a hand by Robert. Uh, but not his voice. Uh, can I speak already? Do you copy? Yes. Yes. Ah, okay. Um, thank you. Uh, very interesting presentation. On the last slide, uh, Jürgen, you mentioned that uh, these measurement systems could potentially also improve celestial reference frame. Could you uh, explain this a little bit? So, so we uh, we could imagine that we have, uh, for example, uh, a, a, a clock uh, on the moon, some master clock, which could also uh, uh, um, um, distribute uh, transfer frequencies, for example, to the GNSS satellites or to other. Uh, so later on, we will uh, uh, listen to the G uh, Genesis uh, mission. Maybe in future, we will have more of those missions. And then uh, those clock measurements could support also um, so, so you have one unique frequency uh, could uh, support those uh, satellite missions. Unfortunately, Genesis will not have an, a clock module, uh, but maybe someone in, in future, you may know the Kepler uh, system uh, of uh, connecting future GNSS satellites. Maybe someone in future, you will have one clock on the moon, a stable uh, reference clock, which, uh, which can be used by all these uh, techniques, which uh, benefit from frequencies or which are using frequencies. So then I guess in a few years, we are going to have an international clock service for Maybe. Uh, I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Thank you very much again, Jürgen. And let's move on to the next presentation that will be given here in presence by Roland Peil about the gravity missions and the various concepts. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I would like to give you a short special brief for on satellite gravity mission. Thanks for that. It's better, okay. Thanks for uh, the invitation to this. Uh, maybe before going into detail, let's go one step back. I looked into the mission of Chigos, uh, which everybody of you knows, so therefore I don't have to repeat it. And I would like to address where I think or we believe that the gravity missions uh, are really related to this mission statement of uh, Chigos. Uh, first of all, regarding observations needed to monitor, map, and understand changes in the Earth shape, rotation, and mass distribution. Here is that with gravity missions, we can directly observe mass variations, uh, which are caused by geophysical uh, signals and mass transport processes. Regarding the global geodetic frame of reference, which was already addressed several times today in the morning, uh, gravity, of course, uh, is the basis for a physical height reference system surface, and gravity is, of course, also related to the uh, datum definition of uh, terrestrial reference frames. And regarding benefit for society, I claim that with gravity missions, we can at least contribute to a quantification of climate change. So uh, I think th the most important geodetic goal of gravity missions is their contribution to GGRIF in the IG definition, meaning a joint uh, and consistent uh, reference, global reference frames, including a consistently geometry and, and the gravity field. And here, of course, uh, gravity missions form a substantial basis because they provide with homogeneous accuracy, at least along to medium wavelength contribution for such a, a global um, um, uh, genetic reference frame. Um, regarding products derived from gravity emissions, very coarsely, you can distinguish between the static gravity field, which is mainly related to, to the height reference frame, but not only, because also uh, temporal gravity variations are, of course, important to see changes in this physical reference frame. 
And regarding corresponding missions, very coarsely speaking, you can associate the static gravity field with the successful Gucci mission, uh, 2009 to 2013, and GRACE, and currently GRACE follow on, the only mission in orbit now, which is mainly dedicated to temporal gravity variations, but of course also contribute to the static gravity field. So this picture was already more or less presented by, by um, Jürgen, just showing their, the specific strength of these different mission types. Goche is mainly responsible for the higher spatial resolution, while RACE is mainly dedicated to the, the long wavelength, and they are, uh, you can mainly map temporal variations in the gravity field. If you compare the performances of these missions with uh, let's say gravity field products before the mission area see a dramatic step so we really did a good job during the last 20 years well i would like to stress that we consider satellite gravity missions as really an integral part of the geos infrastructure and we talked about uh, observation gaps and so on and i would really would like to stress that uh, there is currently no redundancy in this central part of the GEOS infrastructure, meaning we have just one mission in orbit, GRACE follow on. Uh, you should know that GRACE follow on is currently working already on the redundant unit for two key parts of this mission, meaning if one of these two redundant components is failing, we won't have any gravity field determination from space for the next five years. So this is about redundancy of, of this uh, central uh, component of the geos infrastructure uh, and we would miss a lot we believe because gravity field missions are really a unique measurement system for mass transport processes in the earth system with a lot of societal benefit for example water we are monitoring on a regional to global scale changes in the in the water cycle and therefore also can answer to some extent the question regarding uh, freshwater availability uh, it's simply important to know how uh, water is redistributed in the Earth system. And with these gravity field missions, we also contribute significantly to many essential climate variables. You probably know this list of about 50 essential climate variables, which were defined by GICOS, the Global Climate Observing System, so the counterpart as GIGOS for, for the climate. And it was really a very, very big effort and a big success that a few weeks ago, total water storage. So the total, uh, the total storage of the, the total water content, which is more or less directly measured by Grace and Grace follow on, at least the changes of it are new and now a new um, uh, essential climate variable, meaning we are now really observing one of these essential climate variables uh, directly, and this is, I think, a very, very important step also to continue uh, on working on, on let's say, sustained uh, concepts for the future. So uh, maybe also hopping a little bit back in the in, in history, we uh, formed or shaped also, let's say, the user community of this in terms of an IOGG study, where we did also questionnaires and so on to identify what are user priorities regarding future mission concepts. And this is more or less the backbone of all the current developments and this joint uh, activity under the umbrella of, of IHGs is really uh, more or less the, the backbone for the science requirements we are still discussing today. And we expressed this in, in numbers in terms of uh, threshold and target requirement. So what should such a mission or an extended mission concept should uh, perform to get a significant benefit? What is especially important, and this is especially important also for the, for the ESA part, for the European part, is that we have to demonstrate that there is really a societal need or there is societal benefit and societal uh, outcome of this mission. And this is not just that we state, okay, we can see, uh, we can see ice masses changing, we can see uh, changes in sea level, but what means by a uh, societal benefit is really also a direct contribution to operational service applications meaning we need a much higher temporal resolution. We are talking about very short latencies so that we can feed our products into drought monitoring, uh, flood forecasting, water management applications. And this is really a prerequisite so that we get a European component of this 
uh, gravity infrastructure. Um, based on these studies, there were some activities also from the from the science community, also under under the umbrella of of IAG and and working groups of this. Uh, for example, two mission proposals for the Earth Explorer 9 and 10 for ESA, which were not successful, even though they were rated very or ranked very high regarding the science part, but usually the technical uh, issues and risk and so on was, was the neck breaker. But this was important to have because this gave us a foot uh, into the doorstep of ESA for next activities and currently we have really a joint activity of NASA and ESA on a let's say joint uh, constellation concept which would extend significantly what we have today. This is formally done within ESA under the mass change designated observable so gravity field or mass change was uh, defined as one of the four most important observables on NASA side and on ESA side uh, regarding next generation uh, Gravity mission, we are currently in a uh, in a phase A study at the end of a phase A of MAGIC, which I will talk about in a few minutes. So this, this MAGIC it stands for Mass Change in Geoscience International Constellation. And uh, the uh, collaborative effort by ESA and NASA is uh, represented or reflected by a joint mission requirements documents so based on the science requirements of our community uh, there are already joint mission requirements so what uh, should this mission uh, or how should this mission perform us so or what is what are the minimum requirements and on either side we have two parallel ESA phase a studies uh, on this and uh, a magic science study, which I'm leading together with uh, GFZ Theo Delft and Knes. We are more or less doing the scientific counterpart and uh, of this um, ESA industry studies. And one of the main goals of the science study was then to identify what is the best or what is a, a realistic uh, uh, future mission regarding technology, also regarding cost frameworks, and therefore in this study we also investigated different types of missions, extended mission concepts. So on the left you see uh, the the uh, inland single pair, so grace and grace follow on like. Then we have already proposed a pendulum single pair where the second satellite is, pen, uh, is doing a pendulum motion with respect to the first one, which is reducing our biggest error in the system, which is temporal aliasing. We also investigated a, a three satellite concept, so where a grace pair is followed by such a pendulum. And then we, uh, on, uh, on the very right, uh, we see a double pair mission, which is more or less the same as grace, but twice, where you have a second pair within an inclined orbit which reduces also dramatically uh, these temporal aliasing errors. And what we did in this study is to investigate uh, the performance, the expected performance in very, very realistic um, numerical uh, closed loop simulations, uh, where you see that uh, um, at first, if you just improve the instruments and the key here is the accelerometer, not the ranging system, you can do just a little bit uh, regarding the uh, a grace type um, mission concept, so a single pair. This is also a little bit of, of a consideration when we are talking about quantum sensors in the future, because we have to do something else together with the quantum sensors, because just improving the instruments does not help a lot, because temporal aliasing is the key issue. Uh, if you go into pendulum, depending on the pendulum angle, you can improve significantly. Uh, this marble concept is even worse than the pendulum concept with the uh, with the uh, assumption error assumptions made for this, mm -hmm. and you see the big jump once we go into a random uh, bender double pair concept. You see that you have not just a square root of two improvements due to redundancy, but we get the effect of a five to seven improvement just by adding a second pair. And then we did some studies, and if you then go into a lower orbit, then of course the lower the better. Uh, this is an intrinsic uh, property of gravity field determination from space. So, and, and based on this conclusion, we now really are going for this double pair concept, uh, just to show um, in, in terms of error maps, what is really the, the improvement. So what we currently deal with is this one, 
so we have we get very very stripy solutions due to temporal aliasing so these solutions have to be uh post filtered where you reduce both noise but also signal and just by flying a second pair you get already a quite clean solution you see that uh, this would really a significant jump uh, from what we currently have to a future uh, concept so what is the status of this the polar pair uh, is going to be built so there's currently some issues regarding funding the polar pair will be funded by nasa together with dlr at least this is the neg negotiation now in the frame of this nasa mcdo study and runs on the, under the, the the acronym mc for mass change on in germany under the acronym grace i because this i stands for icarus because there's also a bird observation component planned and the inclined pair isa uh, is uh, at the end close to the end of phase a and we will have a very important meeting next week which is the ESA ministerial where the budget for the next four years is distributed and we really hope that we get the decision there to go into the next phase meaning in the implementation phase of this inclined pair by ESA, uh, by ESA uh, as in the phases b and c so uh, tuesday and wednesday next week are really very very big dates for uh, magic just to give you in the end a little bit of an of an a feeling uh, what what could be done more so if you look for example at continental hydrology applications currently with grace we can do in in uh, europe basically danube catchment but all the other catchments are to spatial resolution too small so that we can really do significant uh, things there and we would feel uh, the map in Europe with many more catchments which we could uh, investigate uh, if you had this this magic constellation and additionally we could of course also do much more in the bigger catchments which are already blue with grace because we also there get a much better spatial resolution uh, so that uh, we can uh, in do investigations on sub catchment level uh, this is more or less is in, in shown here so on top of a higher spatial resolution we will also get a much higher temporal resolution weekly maybe even uh, uh, daily or several daily time scales which is important as i mentioned beforehand for operational service applications and we really we really have to justify that we can contribute uh, to this this was an analysis based on, on one year of simulation data. Again, uh, uh, what is the, the RMS value in terms of equivalent water height, so what, uh, total water column um, for single pairs and double pairs. And you see uh, the more bluish, the better. And you see that in many, many regions, uh, we get significant improvements by means of a um, constellation. And this is really based on 20 years of experience of daily, of, 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 of uh, a real data processing, meaning these re uh, simulations are really very realistic and, and it's not just out of the blue, but really are based on realistic error assumptions. Um, what is really important is to already now do a kind of let's say lobbying to get into operational service applications copernicus services there is currently one project the 3g uh, uh, g3p uh, for including a groundwater product which is mainly based on gravity field missions but we have to do more and uh, we have to be much more active in this direction because the long-term strategy of course if you want to maintain gravity field as a as an observational component, it would be to include a gravity field mission as part of Copernicus program, meaning that one of the next Sentinel series are gravity field missions. Um, what you can do more in uh, in uh, ice mass is it shown here. So I see the dramatic improvement of grace-like missions regarding the noise behavior and uh, a vendor type mission in red where uh, the the simulated truth is the black one and you see that with the banner type mission you can in many catchments in greenland and antarctica come very close to the truth with quite a low noise level so from a strategic point of view uh, we are also working uh, on this uh, mrd on the on the mission requirement document and did in the frame of this project also some 
suggestions on updates and improvements on uh, the science impact for hydrology, cryosphere, ocean, solid earth and climate research. But we also included as a new uh, chapter, the geodesy. Uh, I think it's important that this is properly reflected also in a mission which is mainly dedicated to time variations. Um, why we have identified three main aspects. The one is global unification of height systems. It's not only that we might improve the static gravity field by means of this mission, but also that we get uh, significant improvements on, on the time gravity field. That is especially in regions where you have GIA signals and others where you have height variations of in, in the millimeter, millimeter to centimeter level per year. This is also highly relevant for height systems, of course. Um, we have identified GNSS leveling as, as a new tool to replace um, spirit leveling in the near future. And we have also identified uh, that, of course, with a better gravity field, you can improve also the, geome the geometry part, meaning you can improve orbits. You can then by this indirectly also improve geometric heights. Um, we are also quite active in advocating, for example, two weeks or three weeks ago, we more or less acquired a support letter by IHG President Kathy Whaler to ESA and NASA headquarters as a support for matching, and maybe this is drop on the stone for a positive decision next week. We hope at least that this, uh, this will happen. So I think this is also important, and this is also part of GIGOS and the, the corresponding uh, satellite mission working group uh, to uh, advocate these missions and to organize this type of support if needed also on short request. As a conclusion, we believe that uh, satellite missions are an integral component of the GIGOS infrastructure. I would even claim this is the most critical component to maintain. As I have mentioned beforehand, we need this gravity information in the IG, IG definition of a GGRF. Um, we have made within IOTG uh, great efforts uh, for a sustained gravity monitoring from space. We are, by the way, also preparing an IOTG resolution for Berlin next uh, year. Uh, we can show by means of very realistic numerical simulations that with such a Benda type advanced gravity concept, we could improve significantly, which is especially regarding temporal resolution, very important uh, for operational service applications. In this context, I would quickly mention with a little smile in my face, the term of essential genetic variables as genetic products. And uh, the long-term goal is, of course, that we can implement gravity missions as part of the Copernicus Sentinel infrastructure, but this would, because this would mean that automatically we would have also a, a long-term component of GIGOS uh, maintained uh, for several decades. Thanks for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much, Roland, for this very interesting overview about the uh, ongoing planned uh, uh, gravity missions. May I start with a short question? What is going to be the, uh, the spatial resolution of the magic uh, bender type mission in terms of kilometers? Um. <laughs> This is a very difficult question to, to because we will also need some kind of post processing, even even in this case. But I would say, um, compared to Grace, you will improve by a factor of one point five to two at least. This, uh, but this is uh, of course heavily depending on the signal strength, on signal to noise ratios, and so on. And it's very difficult to uh, to answer uh, in general or in on a, in a global sense. Yeah, Jose Manuel, maybe. Uh, I have another question that it's about the expected accuracy of the C to zero or second degree harmonics. Will be the, the competitive according with the laser ranging 
solution according to simulation or not yet? Yeah, uh, see to theory is also a problem because we are we are seeing uh, in, in grace and grace follow on a significant discrepancy between simulation and, and reality. <laughs> so we'll see what happens in a, in a so that this is mainly also dependent on how the, the actual satellite system works because in C to zero, which is tightly related to the revolution frequency, this is where all the systematic errors end up in the system so we will see what happens there so we have a, a good backup solution because we have slr to combine with but uh, the hope is indeed that also with the double pair we can improve in in this respect but also now already with grace and grace for on the graz group for example made significant progress in a standalone estimate of c20 from grace and grace for on are there any questions on the chat <laughs> Uh, probably I didn't understand correctly, but uh, last Saturday I, re I read uh, in the newspaper that the federal government of Germany approved the budget for Grace I. That's true. Mm -hmm. For the next studies of Grace I, not the final, the total budget, but Grace I will be continued. But to my understanding, the I was dropped. So no mm -hmm. Icarus component anymore. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about the new acronym. <laughs> <laughs> and it, NASA called it MC. So it's not very attractive name. But, <laughs> but the good news is uh, um, all planning is going on. Mm -hmm can be continued for the next five years. Yeah. So launch date is 2027, I guess, target or yeah. one year later. And for the, the ESA pair, it will be 2030 or 2031 yeah. target. Yeah. So there was a long struggle and a lot of discussion and now finally it was approved. So also good news, I think, because it's gonna be a joint mission with NASA. NASA will cover about 65% of, of the whole mission. And so the perspectives are very positive. Anyway, let's thank you very much again, Roland, and let's move on to the next presentation that uh, was already mentioned here. Genesis is another satellite project, a new mission that hopefully will get approved soon. And Markus Rotacher is giving the presentation. Yeah, good morning, everybody. I will talk about Genesis, uh, one additional attempt to try to get a collocation mission in space of all the geodetic techniques. Um, this uh, presentation and the work behind is on behalf of the Directorate of Navigation of ESA and has been pushed very much by the GSAC, which is a GNSS Science Advisory Committee of ESA. And that's also on behalf of this committee that I give this presentation here. Um, as Roland Pyle already mentioned, next week is an important decision um, also on Genesis. So next week, 2020, 23, uh, 23 of November, there will be the ministerial and there will be a decision on this mission as well. Yeah, let me... Start with an overview. I will start with some introduction history. I will talk about the motivation behind this, which you all know, about the deficiencies we want to correct or improve uh, as a goal of a unified reference frame, the science objectives, and show some of the benefits we expect and come to some conclusions. So, when we think about collocation in space, and that's not really a new business. Um, we have satellite altimetry satellites like Topax Poseidon was the first one where we had GPS stories and SLR on board. So three of the major techniques. This was extremely important for LEO orbit determination progress. But we see one of the really central observation, observation techniques, VLBI, is missing here. We also have collocation on GNSS satellites with the satellite reflectors. Um, again, the VLBI Doris are missing here. That would actually be the ideal point for collocation. Um, yeah, when we look at the LEO satellites, 
Then there is also SLR and also GNSS uh, on most of these. Uh, we are missing again some important techniques and APOT, which included actually VLDI, uh, Chinese CubeSat mission was flying, but uh, because of the resources, this was a very, very limited mission. So we have no real dedicated mission containing all these uh, observing techniques in one run. There have been several attempts to get such a collocation mission. You may remember GRASP was the beginning by, uh, uh, um, with NASA, two proposals, 2011, 2015. Um, the second best mission proposal in the second uh, trial, um, but not the first one. EGRASP, a proposal of the European community more for EE9 um, in 2016. There were 17 proposals, five elevated, but none was selected because the money was thought to be too small for all these missions. There was a new call and an updated EGRASP proposal, and this was had a very good evaluation as well, but it was not selected. So you see, all these four attempts were not successful. We had another proposal in Switzerland, but this was considered too expensive. This also included relativity tests. Uh, with an extremely eccentric orbit. And also with GFC, we had some projects going on like NanoGem and NanoX, um, but they were also not funded. APOD really is the only one where VLDI was part, but some problems with instruments, especially with GNSS L2 and the limited resources made it not really very helpful. Yeah, so the idea is clear. We have all these different levels. And we are missing inside here on the LEO level, we are really missing the connection between the techniques. And so the idea would be that Chigos is really one system of observations containing a lot of different parts. And one central part should be the collocation missions. Uh, when we look at what the ITRF requirements are, then you really know what we want to have. I think the two main limiting factors for the ITRS realization are still those that we always had. It's uh, local time measurements that are extremely demanding, thinking of the intersection of the axes of these large instruments, the phase centers of TNSS and so on. And on the other hand, we know that there are a lot of systematic effects in the individual space geodetic techniques. Uh, we will come to this later. So the fundamental improvement with Genesis is a complementary, highly accurate collocation of all four space geodetic techniques in space on the same platform on a level of one to two meter spacing. Particular attention will be will have to be paid to the time and space metrology on board. That means every instrument will have to be extremely carefully calibrated. Without this, this mission will not be worth flying. Yeah, when I will, I just would like to illustrate these two deficiencies in a little bit more detail. So measurement of local ties on the ground may seem simple. But you see, for instance, wet cells, three VLBI telescopes, two SLR telescopes, an array of GNSS antennas. And between all of these, you need to know the reference points to better than one millimeter. It's not so much that you cannot do the terrestrial measurements, even if this is an effort, but to find really the reference points like the phase center of the GNSS antenna. This is a crucial part here. Um, when we look at the de deficiencies or discrepancies we have, when we look at the collocated sites, and we now have something like 110 collocated sites that have more than one instrumentation of a different technique. You see the collocations, uh, there are quite a lot of them, um, always with GNSS, that's clear. Uh, but when you now look at the discrepancies over here, then we can just look at this uh, numbers here. In the red, you have the numbers of ITF 2020, and you see 50% half of the stations have discrepancies larger than five millimeters. 
we try to get the one millimeter level finally, at least at the global level. And you see the same happening for SLR and Taurus. So between 30 and 50% of our primary sites have errors that are bigger than five millimeters. So we have to work a lot on this. And for this, it would be nice to have a complementary a complementary system in space. Here you see the second part of the problems. Technique specific systematic effects. I do not have to go through all of this. Each of the techniques has them, like uncalibrated phase center patterns of beacons, South Atlantic anomaly for Doris or solar radiation problems for the geocenter Z component. In GNSS, all the phase center effects the discontinu discontinuities in the position time series, the orbit modeling deficiencies, and so on. Also, SLR with time and range biases, or VLBI with uh, gravitational sag of the telescopes, with quasar structures that go into this. A lot of effects are not fully clear and have to be treated. Um, yeah, here just one of the examples. This is actually ITF 2014, but the picture didn't change significantly when you look at the long-term behavior of the scale and you also see the geocenter for instance stories is a typical case that is very difficult in the z component you really have very large deficiencies um slr certainly is doing better but this has a rather sparse network so these are the things we want to tackle with a genesis making yeah so goal of genesis is clear have all these techniques on board, um, including a VLBI emitter or transmitter, including a Doris antenna, and also satellite laser ranging reflectors and GNSS equipment. What is not yet clear, or what is probably not, will probably not be on board, is a really high accuracy clock here. This would be extremely nice to have also clock ties but because of costs, this is not part of the present um, of the present baseline. Let's say this collocation should not be a com a concurrence or a competition. Uh, this should be a complementary task. As one part is on the ground and the other one is in space, they will complement each other because the satellite is going over all the ground stations and connect them with its orbit. That's the fundamental difference. Okay, when we look at uh, the mission at the moment, I just show this slide. There has been a special study group to do a lot of analysis. Uh, the, the orbit will be around 6,000 kilometers. This is because of VLBI, that's a necessity. Uh, it will be a direct injection into the orbit. That means not with an additional step inside. There is to be expected that there is a harsh uh, radiation environment. So one has to pay attention with equipment. It's certainly much different from a 500 kilometer orbit as we had it so far. Uh, you see the different instruments here. I will not go into too much of the details. Uh, this would be somehow the look of such a satellite. Yeah, what are the science objectives? A uh, white paper was actually written by um, a lot of colleagues that are also here, uh, defining all the science objectives, but also defining the mission itself in quite some details. And, you, and this white paper is actually uh, submitted and will be appearing soon. Uh, there are the reference frame issues. I think that's clear. We don't have to go into more details, especially geocenter and scale should be the factors that, uh, that profit. We have Earth sciences with a long wavelength gravity field, probably the one mission that could complement some of the low degrees that are missing in most of the low Earth orbiting um, missions, uh, uh, gravity missions so far. We have the sea level rise uh, coming out of the, the, of the reference frame, geodynamics and so on, thermal, uh, thermospheric density measurements that is also a new type of applications and finally through the ITRF improvement we will also be beneficial for global positioning for GNSS antenna phase and the calibration for positioning in general and also time and frequency transfer 
yeah, when we look at where Genesis has to be put, then it is at the very bottom of this pyramid. This pyramid was mentioned in the NRC report in 2010, and it shows that we need a very important part here, down here, that is the geodetic infrastructure. Without this, all the above will not be realized with the necessary um, accuracy. From this, we will go into the, the terrestrial reference frame, the primary geodetic products, and so on and so on, and it will get more and more subtle coming to the scientific applications that are really um, important for society with sea level change, water cycle, geological hazard, and so on. So this is infrastructure, so to say. Yeah, just a few examples that show that we need this type of mission. Here you see the tide gauge vertical motions that are vital for sea level uh, applications. You see different solutions that are plotted here for this tide gauge network um, from ITF 2014, but also from the University of La Rochelle and other solutions, JPL, NGL, and so on. And they show that the differences between these solutions are at a level of 0.36 millimeters per year. We are aiming at the factor of four, smaller values of 0.1. And you see all these stations here, all these tight gauges here, that are rather at a at few millimeter or one to two millimeter level that uh, also play an important part here. When we look at the geocenter estimates that should improve significantly, then the uncertainty in the geocenter is really dominating three error, error parts, namely the errors in the ocean mass trend, the gravimetry base, so that it means how much mass is in the ocean, how much is increasing, um, the uncertainty in the 20 year trend of the altimetry base global means sea level, and finally also the uncertainty in the geodetic based Earth energy imbalance. So when we look at this in a little bit more detail, and we see um, we see here in the table that the geocenter with the ocean mass measurements is really the critical part with 0.19 out of the different parts that are also important here. You also see that the land water storage the land water storage, there also the geocenter is at top with 0.22 millimeters um, variation per year. And when we look at the Earth's energy balance, imbalance, that means the heat going into the ocean, how much heat is going into the ocean, we need to know the thermal expansion. And this depends very much on how we know the mass because they are complementary. And so you see here, we would like to have something like 0.1 watts per square meter over a 20 year mean. Uh, but at the moment, we still have a factor of two to go. Yeah, so Genesis would be really here at this end. That's what we hope. And the new step in the quantification of sea level rise, if we really can improve the ITRF significantly. You also see some other applications. I just chose the uh, have chosen this um, calibration of TNSS antennas, uh, something that JPL was doing for a long time. That means you use the low orbiting satellites to calibrate the TNSS or Galileo satellites antenna. And this is beneficial because when you are at a LEO, you are higher, you have a better view of the phase centers. And Genesis is even better because it is at 6,000 kilometers. That means it will be able to monitor much more of the cone of the signal that comes from the GNSS satellites. You see here the experiments that were done earlier times. The JSON here without calibration showing a clear trend of about 3.7, so almost 4 millimeters per year. And this was corrected by trying to calibrate the GNSS antennas down to about 0.1 millimeter per year. That's what we want to go for. It's clear that nowadays we have the Galileo phase center calibrations, but still I think an alternative to this and to check all the other systems is still very important. 
yeah, with this, I already come to the conclusion. Uh, these are also the conclusions of the white paper that you can read. I could also send it around. The primary object is this clear accuracy and stability of the international terrorist reference frame realization, um, providing uh, this in orbit collocation with four techniques, including Doris, that's maybe an important thing to say, on a highly calibrated and stable platform with all the instruments extremely well calibrated. This is then really uh, trying to help to achieve the accuracy of one millimeter and stability of one, uh, open one millimeter per year. I think the accuracy of the ITRF is, is very important for climate change, as we have seen. It's not only sea level, it's also mass, uh, ice mass balance, it's also energy, uh, Earth energy imbalance, and uh, with these very important observables, typically those that also uh, Roland Pyle was mentioning, you can do a lot of climate study, uh, climate change studies. And the improvement with Genesis will also be beneficial for many other applications, geodesy in general, but also precise navigation and positioning that profit from a very accurate reference frame. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much. Markus, are there any questions from the audience in the chat? <laughs> so, no question from the chat. Jose Rodriguez asks uh, the duration of the mission. How Sorry? Duration of the mission. How long? Duration. Duration of the mission. Oh, I think this is not yet fully clear, but it could be at least several years. Several, I think five several years. years. Five Something years, like five plus. Five years. Well. Similar to Grace, Jam. Hopefully that it will work longer. I mean, it will be exactly the same problem as with the gravity missions. If you have this, uh, it will be necessary at some point to have another one when things develop over time. Thomas Gruber. Uh, you, you mentioned in the beginning that you need for the local tie these one millimeter accuracy on ground. Uh, basically, you would need the same in orbit, meaning also the orbit has to be determined, I guess, independently by a millimeter or probably better. How can you achieve that? <laughs> Is it possible? Uh, this will certainly be a challenge, no, no question. Um, but uh, you should also keep in mind that the satellite will fly at a totally different altitude. With 6,000 kilometers, we are out of the air drag. That's one important aspect. Uh, we will still have solar radiation pressures, which will probably be a challenge. Um, but the satellite will certainly not be as bulky as the TMSS satellites. But it's clear, um, orbit determination will be a crucial part in this. But we will have four techniques to find out. And when you remember Topix Poseidon, but also the Jason missions were substantial, uh, substantially contributing to progress in orbit determination. That's where actually most of the process was done, progress was done over the 90s and 20s even, yeah. Yeah, for, for me, I think the most, the highest benefit will be um, because of reducing systematic effects that still show up in the ITRF caused by systematic effects and satellite orbits, for instance, and to reduce these systematics is very essential. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much again, Markus. And now let's move on to the next presentation. That will be given by Anja Wendt. And we have a long title and a long list of authors <laughs> so you can see 
title and author list here. Anja, please. Yeah, thank you. I will talk about a combination of satellite remote sensing and glaciological and geodetic field measurements for the study of mountain glaciers. And this is indeed a quite long title, but it's one way to describe the work we do here at the Geodesy and Glaciology Group at the Bavarian Academy of Sciences and Humanities. As you can see from the title, we focus on mountain glaciers. So let me start with the uh, closest mountain glaciers we have. These are the Bavarian glaciers. On the picture here, which is the front page of the Bavarian Glacier Report, you can see two of the glaciers. Uh, this is the northern Schneeferner and here the southern Schneeferner at the um, plateau of the Zugspitze. Zugspitze is the highest mountain in Germany. And uh, this report is published together with the Bavarian State Ministry for the Environment and Customer Protection. And the last uh, issue of these reports was published in April 22, uh, reporting about the state of the five glaciers in Germany, which are at the Zugspitze region here and further to the east in the Berchtesgaden Alps. And then there came the mass balance year 2022 where we had a low winter snow accumulation on on all uh, alpine glaciers and there was a um, sahara dust event in spring which uh, enhanced the uh, melt of the snow in in spring and then there was a lot in hot, hot summer which in total led to an extreme uh, glacier melt so um, at the end of the summer season, the southern Schneeferner had to be downgraded from a glacier to a perennial ice patch and taken out of the uh, observing system. So there are only four glaciers left in Germany. So let's now move like the, for 60 kilometers to, to the south of the Zugspitze to Pernachtferner in the Ötztal Alp in Austria. Uh, the first topographic map of this glacier was produced in 1889 by a member of this academy here, and we will see the map uh, in, in a few minutes. And uh, since 1964, uh, a mass balance program is run on the glacier. Uh, you can see the snow stake network here as the uh, black squares. On these snow stakes, uh, winter accumulation and summer ablation is measured to determine the mass balance of the glacier. And there are also three automatic weather stations on the glacier and a permanent GNSS site uh, close to the glacier. Here in the south of this image, you can see uh, our research station with a permanent, uh, with permanent meteorological and uh, hydrological measurements. And this is also the base for field campaigns to the glacier. Uh, so Fernachferner is one of about 40 reference glaciers of the World Glacier Monitoring Service under the auspices of the World Meteorological Office, UNESCO and the UN Environmental Program. And uh, the data are archived with the World Glacier Monitoring System and on the Pangea data server and it's also reported to the uh, global, glacier, global climate observing system we heard of before. So um, last year was also an uh, extreme year for Fernachtferner. In this uh, image, you can see the comparison of optical satellite data from Sentinel-2 satellite from 2021 and 2022. So, um, this summer there was no snow, no snow left on the glacier, not even in the highest part here. Um, so we had um, a record melt also for, for Fernachtferner. The data of this year are yet not yet finally uh, processed, so I can show you just a, a map from the year before. This is a mass balance map. This is derived uh, from these uh, stake measurements. The bluish colors show a net accumulation and the reddish colors ablation. And here in the lowermost part, here in the lowermost part of the glacier, we had a, a mass loss 
between three and three and a half meters. Um, and this year in this part, we had a melt of more than five meters. So we already know that the mass balance will definitely be more negative than uh, what you can see here. And I guess there will be no bluish color on the uh, new map. From these measurements, we can derive a mass balance of a, a time series of glaciological mass balance. In blue here, you can see the winter mass balance, which is quite noisy, but uh, stable uh, in time. And the uh, reddish bars are the uh, summer balance, where you can see a clear negative trend towards more melt. And the difference of the two, the annual balance is plotted in, in yellow. You can see that from the 80s on, there's a, a mass balance a negative mass balance, and that means mass loss in all years. This peak here um, is the former extreme summer 23, um, where we had more than three meters of melt uh, averaged over the glacier. And so um, uh, more than two meters of mass loss averaged over the glacier. But uh, this year will probably, or not probably this year will be worse. Um, this is the glaciological way to determine glacier mass balance. And there's also a geodetic method, which uses volume changes from DM differencing to uh, derive the mass balance or to derive height uh, changes over the glacier. And for Fernac Ferner, this can be done since the first map in 1889. You can see here the time series, which has just one positive episode in the 70s, but negative um, mass balance for all the rest of the time series. And um, this geodetic mass balance, we can also derive from satellite measurements. Here you can see elevation change rates that are derived from INSA processing of Tandem X data. Tandem X is a, a German uh, radar satellite mission consisting of two satellites that fly in a close constellation. And here you can see the uh, height difference or the rates of height difference between 2015 and 2021. And we can add a, a bar to the time series here. Um, but the question is how do these satellite uh, derived results compared to the previously used uh, airborne measurements. And for this, the International Association of Cryospheric Sciences set up a working group, which is called RACMAC. RACMAC stands for Regional Assessment of Glacial Mass Change. And um, in this working group, a glacial volume change in the comparison experiment is set up where, where the participating groups calculate volume changes for a validation period, either using optical satellite data from ESTA or uh, tandem X data, as you've seen before. And one of the test sites, for instance, is uh, hinter Eisferner close to uh, Fernacht Ferner. The challenges with uh, satellite data is that the timing of the data is not always close to the reference date, which is always uh, the the end uh, of the ablation period. And resolution and coverage uh, of the satellite data are usually lower than for airborne data. And in the case of INSA, there's the additional um, issue of surface penetration because the uh, radar signal is not necessarily reflected directly from the surface, but can penet penetrate into uh, snow and ice. But the obvious advantage is that there are global observations uh, available. Um, you can imagine it's not possible to, uh, to survey all about 200,000 glaciers worldwide by uh, airborne or even terrestrial measurements. So there's a community effort going on right now to agree on corrections and to define best practices for uh, how to derive uh, glacier volume changes from satellite data. So what do we do with the data we measure from the glacier? 
here in the green boxes, you can see uh, what we can measure from, from above. These are the surface mass balance, uh, surface elevations, and also the velocity field. Uh, what we do not know, for example, are the basal conditions. We do not know whether the glacier is stuck to the uh, to the bedrock or whether it uh, slips on the ground. And so therefore, uh, ice flow models can be set up that uh, describe all the uh, physical processes. And for Fernacht Ferner, here you can see a 50 meter mesh that was set up in the um, ice flow model Elmer Ice. And it turned out that a sliding even dominates over the uh, internal deformation. And with such a, a tuned ice flow model, we can reconstruct uh, past uh, glacier changes. For instance, in, the, uh, in this middle view graph, you can see the velocity field um, for the, the time when the first topographic map uh, of the glacier was, was produced. And we can then also forward model the uh, to, um, to simulate the behavior of the glacier under different climate scenarios. Let me now come, or let's now focus on the, uh, on the mountain, on the Alps uh, as a whole, and coming from the ice to the bedrock in a joint project with the German Geodetic Research Institute at the Technical University of Munich. Um, we analyzed um, the tectonic uplift of the Alps uh, using more than 300 permanent GNSS stations for the time span of 2004 to 2016. So the, the average uplift <coughs> was determined to be 1.8 millimeters per year and largest uplift rates are around two millimeters per year, for instance, here close to our station Fernachtferner and there are lower rates towards uh, the margin. And uh, the other triangle here is uh, the Zugspitz region. So let's have a look there again. Um, in a collaboration with the German Research Center for Geosciences, the University of Hannover and the Schneeferner House, which is the research station on top of Zugspitze, um, the University of Hanover carried out um, absolute gravity measurements between 24 and 2019. First at, uh, at both the summit of the Zugspitze and Schneeferner Haus, and also on a non-glacierized mountain nearby, which is called Wank. And here you can see the results of these gra gravity measurements for the uh, Wank there is no um, gravity change uh, observable for the uh, time span of, of the measurements. And from GNSS, we know that there's also no significant vertical movement there. But uh, for, for the two sides at Zugspitze, we see a negative gravity change. And uh, when we estimate the, the or the effect of the vertical movement of the uh, of the Alps, this can only account for less than 15% of this observed trend. So there has to be another effect. But as we know, there are glaciers on the mountain. The direct effect of the glacier retreat <coughs> is about four, uh, 75%. So it explains uh, a large amount of this um, gravity change. And there are also other processes going on like permafrost processes and changes in the local hydrology. So uh, GFZ set up a super superconducting gravity meter in uh, 2018 to, uh, to answer this uh, question about these processes in, in more detail. And for uh, the final topic of my talk, we have to to look a bit further away, away to the uh, Pamir Mountains and uh, specifically to the Vivacni Glacier there. As we all know, uh, glaciers are indicators of climate change because they act as a low-pass filter for changes in 
in uh, temperature, precipitation, and radiation, but there are also uh, some glaciers that show changes independent of climate changes, and these are the so-called surge type glaciers. And um, the Vachni Glacier is uh, one of these surge type glaciers uh, that had a surge between 2011 and 2015. Surge type glaciers in general are characterized by a quiescent phase and an active phase, and during this uh, active active phase, they show a sudden advance with the increase in speed and mass transport from a reservoir area to the lower glacier. And this um, active phase can last from month to years. There are <clears throat> different theories on the search mechanism, but I will skip this part. Um, I would like to show you what we can uh, see from satellite measurements and what how we can monitor this uh, this search event. Uh, from elevation models prior to the search, in this case, um, uh, the model from uh, the shuttle radar topography mission from the year 2000, and the first of a series of tandem X uh, elevation models, we can see that prior to the search, there was an elevation increase here in the uh, upper part of the glacier and a, a pronounced decrease in the, here in the middle part and the moderate elevation decrease uh, in the lower part. And if we flip through the uh, different time steps we have, we can see that this elevation change uh, moves down the glacier until it comes to the um, confluence with the larger Pechenko glacier and there the, uh, the surge stopped. So we can see in quite uh, great detail how this um, movement took place. And we can see the, the total elevation change, which is about 80 meters here in this upper part and reaches up to 120 meters in the, in the lower part of the glaciers just between in, in four years. So um, these uh, height changes have definitely to be taken into account if we want to relate glacier height changes to uh, climate changes. And we can also uh, monitor uh, the velocities of, of the glacier during the search. So before the velocity, uh, before the search the velocity was quite low, but then we can see how it uh, increased until reaching uh, nine meter per day um, in, in its most active phase and then uh, got back to, to normal velocities again. So the satellite data help us to monitor the elevation change and the velocity changes uh, of this event in, in a high temporal resolution in a remote area that would not be possible by any other means. So uh, summarizing my talk, uh, we have seen that glaciers are subject to unprecedented changes due to climate change, but can also show quick changes due to dynamic processes. And uh, long-term long -term observations are important to document these trends and to help to distinguish between uh, the two mechanisms. And satellite observations offer the opportunity to observe glaciers in remote areas and also globally. But Nevertheless, field measurements stay important for the validation of this satellite data. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you, Anja. Are there any questions from the audience? Yeah, Alison. Alison Crater. Meet me too halfway. Uh, thank you. This is actually very, very interesting. And, and a lot of our work with external relations is about the applications of this in, in, a, in a more tangible way. And I was wondering if you had any uh, experience with the Mountain Research Institute at the University of Bern? Uh, could you repeat, please? Uh, have you have you been working at all or have you had any communications with the Mountain Research Institute or the Group on Earth Observations Mountains Initiative? Um, 
maybe we should talk about oh. this uh, later. Uh, at the moment, I, mm -hmm. I'd say no, but uh, I can check with my colleagues. <laughs> Just bringing it up because things like this are where we can start leveraging our work with organizations like the group on Earth Observations so that you know, work like this can be connected with uh, multi-technique, multi-disciplinary uh, work uh, on researching how the mountains are changing due to climate change. And this is these are things that eventually get the word geodesy put into, say, reports from the International Panel on, on Climate Change. So I know that they actually are in Egypt, I think, right now, or just left. So anyway, just great things. And it's, uh, it's very interesting to see how we're using geodesy and all these new applications that we can try to make sure that people know about. OK, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Anything from the chat? No, then thank you very much again, Anja. And let's move on to the last talk that will be given before the break. It's an online presentation again, and Martin Horvath from the Technical University Dresden will be the speaker. So um, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. And I humbly say, so we have uh, heard a lot, uh, such a lot about um, uh, details and uh, and techniques and Markus Rotacher mentioned this pyramid we where Genesis is on the very fundamental button. Now this talk will be a very general level um, uh, talk about the top of the pyramid, the uh, uh, the application side, and it will just underline. Uh, anyway the importance of the geodetic infrastructure and analysis so um i will um, yes talk a little bit about numbers uh, of ice sheets contribution to sea level within uh, the sea level budget uh, talk about the uncertainties and where they come from and then anyway be a little bit educative and say what's going on with the ice sheets beyond the partly wrong a notion of that they are just melting um so let's have a look at um, the wonderful results from the satellite altimetry time series that we have been having since the, the beginning of the 90s this so and we could continue this uh, time series up to today so we have this uh, three point something millimeters per year uh, trend in global mean sea level measured by satellite altimetry, and we can uh, attribute this change to the steric effect, basically the thermal expansion we get from uh, thousands of thermometers, so to see, in the global ocean. And we have the ocean mass effect that we get from GRACE at least um, uh, since 2002. And we can further uh, decompose the mass change into the different um, components by all the global glaciers. Anya mentioned uh, a number of them uh, by the Greenland ice sheet and the Antarctic ice sheet and uh, not to be neglected and maybe the most uh, debated uh, uh, by the land water storage contribution. Uh, we can put, uh, we can condense these monthly time series into mean linear trends over a certain interval, which is uh, basically the grace period here. So we have a total sea level trend. We have the steric contribution. We have different ways of estimating the ocean mass change from grace at the one hand, or as the sum of uh, individual contributions assessed individually. Um, and we can take the, the sum of the steric and the mass contribution and compare it to what we observe with altimetry. And the message here is that uh, we get misclosures or discrepancies in the budget that are mostly within the combined accuracies uh, associated to all these estimates. We can also do the mass budget itself, so compare what Grace sees with what the ind individual contributions say. And again, uh, in most of the cases, oh, so we are in the within the one sigma um, uncertainties quoted here. 
but so we could uh, oh, oops uh, we could um uh, just, just visually um, decompose the global mean sea level change into this good third associated to steric expansion over the last 20 years and the mass contributions. But of course, the interesting thing for us geodesists and uh, the annoying thing and the thing to work about is um, the uncertainties that are uh, given here and they are still substantial so they are on the order of uh, 10 percent of the total signal uh, dependent on where you look here but 10 percent is maybe a good um uh, number to to mention and most of these and to come to the um, geodetic uh, results in those lists here so all the mass and volume uh, changes that are involved in this budget. Most of the uncertainties in those are not to measurement noise, due to measurement noise, but they are due to systematic uh, uncertainties in the techniques and in their corrections. I guess all of it was already mentioned in some tables and uh, in the talk by Markus Rotacher. I just put another scheme of it, a personal scheme of mine, uh, on the uh, interconnections of uh, uncertainties and maybe inconsistencies in uh, core geodetic uh, measurements and their analysis. For example, um, we get ocean mass change or ice sheet mass change from grace and grace follow on gravity fields, as we know. Um, we can even ask whether the inferences on the ocean mass and the ice mass changes are consistent in their methodology. Um, but the major uncertainties on either ice sheet or ocean mass changes are due to the uh, degree one um, mass redistributions, also on the other low degrees to C, C20, maybe uh, C30. And as we know, GRACE doesn't see degree one itself. So one way of estimating degree anyway is to take uh, GRACE starting from degree two and take some modeling assumptions how water distributes on, on the global ocean. Uh, and this method also needs some correction or some knowledge of glacial isostatic adjustment. So there are ways how the grace community treats uh, degree one they are probably and degree one of course is related to geocenter motion and that's related to reference frame uh, realization and reference frame uh, uh, community treats degree one and the geocenter differently mostly from what the grace community does but satellite altimetry as you know very much depends on the reference frame realization and it is uh, uh, one of the again, of the major uncertainties for the altimetry results. And again, we may ask whether uh, the altimetry is treated um, the same way in a consistent way for ice sheet applications and for sea surface applications in terms of calibration and many other things. Okay, so now I have annoyed you with numbers and uncertainties. And the second uh, part, I will talk about the processes and what we re really see. Uh, on the ice sheet. So that's a scheme of an ice sheet, which is basically nourished by snow accumulation and loses mass by ablation on the surface and by gla glacier flow. Um, on the Greenland, so the left hand um, part is typical for Greenland. The right hand part is more typical for Antarctica, where there's not much melt at the um, surface but the loss of glacier mass by the by, by the ice sheet is by flow um, across what we call the grounding line so that then the ice gets a float is not part anymore of the grounded ice sheet and forms these uh, floating ice shelves 
So what do we observe and how do we observe um, mass change of either ice sheet? We can try to assess the surface mass balance, so snowfall and melt, et cetera, individually from the flow across the grounding line. We can use satellite altimetry for volume changes, which need to be converted to mass changes, or we use satellite gravimetry. And uh, we get very similar uh, patterns, uh, each with its uh, uh, weaknesses and strengths, of course. But for Antarctica, uh, mass loss is dominated by this part here in West Antarctica. And the reason for it, again, is um, maybe illustrated here, illustrated by a map of uh, flow velocity. Oops. So that's on the left, we have a flow velocity observation at the uh, particular epoch. And at the, right, at the right, we have the acceleration of the flow velocity um, along time and this accelerated transport of ice away from the grounded ice sheet into the ocean is the reason why we have those mass losses in West Antarctica. And this acceleration again is triggered by the floating ice shelves like that one here. And now things get complicated. So the ice shelf got thinner in the past because it uh, because of its contact to warming ocean water and this thinning of the ice shelf, which provides a buttressing force through the ice flow, um, then uh, led to an increase of ice flow velocity. So one of the nice headlines about it is warm ocean is eroding the Western Antarctic ice sheet. Um, the same uh, game with somewhat different results for the Greenland ice sheet. Again, we have the three techniques we, we, which show coherent patterns with the different resolution they have. For Greenland, we may note that um, the, an acceleration of ice flow velocities also plays a role, um, but um, melt at the surface, increasing melt at the surface um, uh, is equally or even a little bit more important. So both the change of the glacier flow velocities and surface melt add to the large mass losses of the Greenland ice sheet. The IPCC summarized uh, projections of uh, global mean sea level rise and its contributions, and uh, they are illustrated here. And the sum of the thermal expansion and the different mass contributions is shown here. So whether we take a climate uh, protection scenario or a business as usual a greenhouse gas scenario, we end up at the median estimate of 0.4 meters or 0.8 meters as global mean sea level rise in the current century. What I maybe want to emphasize is that the physics of thermal expansion and of uh, the mass loss of all those small glaciers is quite well understood. The error bars are not so large, but uh, the error bars are huge for the ice sheet mass changes, in particular for Antarctica, which is due to our limited understanding of these glacier flow changes in interaction with the ocean, but also with the uh, reactions of the solid earth and, uh, and, and with the atmosphere, of course. I have been showing a little bit outdated time series maybe. So here's an update which uh, has been recently published or is in the, in the process of publishing uh, um, an, an update from the ice mass balance, ice sheet mass balance into comparison exercise. And here you see for Greenland and for the Antarctic ice sheet that uh, uh, with some interannual variability and variations, um, the ice sheets continue to change along the path they, they have entered in the beginning of the 2000s. And if we compare um, the past trajectory 
of the sum of the two ice sheets now expressed in terms of uh, sea level contribution with different scenarios of ice of, of projections by the IPCC sixth assessment report then we find that those projections are not so bad in um, uh, reflecting what we have observed recently so we are ice sheets are currently about at a median um, scenario of, of IPCC in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emission. And that brings me to the conclusions. Um, the two ice sheets contribute about 24 and 9% to global mean sea level rise over the past two decades, so over the grace period. Those numbers differ uh, in terms of the period and and of the plus minus you should add to it. Uh, for Antarctica, an acceleration of, uh, of the outlet glaciers triggered by ice ocean interaction is the main mechanism for mass loss. For Greenland, we have both increased surface melt and glacier acceleration with uh, contribute to the mass losses. Antarctica has the largest uncertainties because these glacier dynamic processes are poorly understood. It has the uh, largest uncertainties in terms of um, projections, but also in terms of uh, estimating the changes over the past two or three decades, to be honest. Major uncertainties in this estimation of the past changes are related to uh, what GIGOS and the IAG research uh, work is about. It's about core elements of geodetic data acquisition and analysis. And it's, of course, also in future about the availability at all of uh, gravity missions, for example. And I listed a few uh, things. Degree one, mass redistribution and geocenter, other low degree components, uh, the reference um, system realization and glacial isostatic adjustment, which, which is not uh, something purely geodetic, but it, as a correction, it plays into a lot of, of these uh, geodetic analysis tasks. And by that, I thank you for your attention. And um, after possible questions, of course, um, I wish you a happy lunch break. Thank you very much, Martin. And I'm sure there will be some questions from the audience and from the chat. From the Martin, probably could you read uh, the question in, in the chat? Uh, yeah, wait. Um, I need to. Uh... Let me uh... ah, there. Now we see it. Yes, now you see me and I see the questions. By Ohan. <laughs> oh, okay. The question is. Uh, what data product I would I would recommend for the pre uh, Grace and that is pre Argo era basically. Uh, so in the project I I, I have reported uh, on, which was an ESAS climate change in initiative project, we tried hard. The University of Reading tried hard to to improve the error characterization of a steric product, which was, which was for the Argo era. So I don't think I'm the person who to recommend the best pre-Argo <laughs> steric product. We used, but that was, so uh, the toulouse Lagos group used an ensemble mean about uh, uh, different products, which also springs with, which always brings with, with itself problems in uncertainty characterization, of course. Thank you very much. 
for the answer. Okay, thank you. More questions? No question from here, people are hungry. So <laughs> thank you very much again, Martin. And thank you everybody for listening. And this concludes the morning sessions. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye bye. The first part of the uh, afternoon session is Jibos uh, Internal. And uh, I'd like to invite uh, Hansel Kudra to make a uh, report on Jigo Satellite, Jigo Sahab. Hansel. Mm. Thank you, dear colleagues. Uh, I will try to not speak too loud. Uh, I think this works. Um, I'm happy to give uh, the status report on Jigo Sahab. And uh, just try. Okay, try again. So, um, present status. As uh, you all know, the uh, Chico Stach was approved uh, one and a half years ago as uh, the second Chico's affiliate after Chico's Japan. And um, it's a little bit uh, differently designed uh, compared to Chigos Japan. It's about uh, Chigos related activities in the DAH region, in particular for stimulation and incubating um, Chigos related coordinated research to bring uh, people institutions together to, to do scientific work in this regard, but but also to, to be a forum um, like uh, in other places, also to, to meet uh, infrastructure providers. We plan uh, to, prep, or we are about to prepare and we plan um, research unit funded by the German Research uh, Foundation, DFG. And uh, we had a call of interest uh, about one year ago, uh, 19 expressions of interest from all three countries in the Dach region, Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, from universities, from research institutions, and from national agencies, so very broad interest. And we had organized um, a DFG round table. That's a preparatory step in this regard, just after the last uh, GIGOS coordinating board meeting in May in Munich at the Technical University. Um, we have ongoing good exchange and cooperation with uh, Chigos Japan. Presentation uh, on Chigos Dach at the Chigos Japan meeting also right at, the, or it was before the last uh, Chigos coordinating board meeting. And uh, we plan to have a joint proposal. Here the lead is uh, in Austria as member of the Dach region. And um, we also had um, a stay of a KIT master student at uh, GSI um, Japan um, in spring this year. We had a presentation on Chigos Dach during the annual meeting of the three geodetic commissions and uh, participation today in the Chigos days. So that's more or less uh, the formal report. In this regard, um, I think what's all of interest uh, for you in, in this group here, but also listening outside. Um, we have a paper or had a paper in German on GRDC 2030, but written in German, strategic paper of uh, the colleagues from all geodetic commissions in uh, Switzerland, Austria, and Germany um, for the next or the ongoing decade and there was some request also in uh, with respect to um, Dach becoming Chigos affiliate to have this paper also available in English that's possible now it was published with an DOI which is indicated here and uh, as you will receive the slides you can also use that so that's what uh, the national geodetic commissions think as an outline or consider as an outline um, until the end of this decade, addressing, of course, observation infrastructure, 
um, addressing uh, processing chains really from the uh, raw data until final products, but uh, also what they uh, are doing with respect to innovative techniques, as uh, Jürgen Müller, for example, presented this morning, or as uh, Roland Peil did with respect to the gravity field missions. So um, the scientific goal is to prepare a joint research proposal, proposed length for those of you who are not directly involved, some um, additional information. A research unit is for our group the most suiting funding scheme of the DH, DFG um, with respect uh, to the geographical distribution and the participation of um, institutions, persons from three countries. There is, if successful, a funding opportunity of two periods uh, of four years each, and uh, there are typically up to 10 cooperating components in such a research unit. So this is a significant uh, number of resources available then for doing dedicated overarching research. And this is also a requirement which needs to be covered. Uh, we need such a research idea and, uh, of course, an outstanding experienced group of PIs. But uh, neither of the two is a problem in the Dutch region because of the very strong uh, and long-standing tradition um, of research in this field. Some of you may know, and I want to mention it here, there is possibly or probably and or maybe already installed an upcoming complementary research unit led by Uli Schreiber from Technical University of Munich on clock metrology, novel approach to time in geodesy, which is really complementary and also a good basis to do a lot of interesting work also in the frame of GIGOS. Um, in this regard, uh, we are also talking, have been talking, doing that um, on, on the meaning of integration. Um, and uh, we have been talking about these three pillars of geodesy since more than two decades. And uh, for me, this is still a valuable um, figure we have to consider, but uh, we need uh, to, to do some um, or put some more effort into integrating those pillars in, in such a way that they are not uh, silos, um, but, but uh, really something which is stabilizing everything which we want to do in geodesy, not only today, but also in the next uh, at least one or two decades. And this means if we look at the um, vertical um, column in the middle, this means uh, to work more on comprehensive uh, geodetic products as it was already uh, presented during the second session this morning. It's also about uh, space geodetic observation techniques, also terrestrial techniques as well. Uh, put more work in a joint parameterization, not only with respect to the single groups, which we know geometric uh, techniques, gravity field techniques, and so on, but really creation of ties to work with and to deal with. And uh, the third column the right uh, on the right-hand side it's about numerical modeling of the Earth system, and also in this regard, we need integration in terms of uh, coupling of partial models, unification, but also considering of physical constraints not considered up to now. And these are all discussions uh, which are a basis for formulating our overarching research proposal. And based on this, we can, can come back to the need of the generation of a really, truly integrated geodetic frame of reference. And this also reflects the GIGOS duality in terms of reference frames and surfaces on the one hand and acting um, as an observing system on the other hand. And uh, so from a more a uh, future dedicated point of view is really a need to consider geometry, earth rotation, and gravity field as uh, different sides of one metal, uh, of one object, and really uh, 
without any artificial distinction between these components because uh, the observing systems are mostly sensitive to all of them. And this means for the use, uh, for, for triggers, it's really necessary to have the use uh, or to enable the use of an integrated GGRF in this regard as uh, the backbone for all that in order to perform an integrated observation of the Earth system beyond what we had during the last decades. And um, in this regard, we properly concentrate uh, the proposal on GIGAS related aspects of such a global geodetic uh, reference frame. We have a focus on two main research fil fields, both reflecting this integration aspect. First one uh, in terms of con consistent combination of geometry in terms of volume and gravity in terms of mass, including temporal variations, because that's what is needed in order to, uh, to describe climate change, global change, and uh, things like that. And the second thing is to get the best out of uh, the different layers of uh, the Chigos architecture to integrate them as we also had uh, presentations uh, this morning to see where we are heading to. This is very promising. And uh, the DACH uh, GEOS affiliate uh, wants to contribute significantly in this regard. There is further elaboration needed, but uh, this will be continued and the proposal will be submitted hopefully next year. That's it at the moment uh, for Chico stuff. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to answer your questions. Okay, uh, thank you very much, hans -Jerk. This presentation, a report from Jigos Japan, is originally planned to be <coughs> delivered by Toshi Otsubo. Uh, he's uh, in Munich, he's staying at hotel, but he uh, attended the uh, ILS workshop uh, last week, and the workshop was really dense, and he's uh, a bit sick and <laughs> staying at hotel, and I will deliver his presentation on behalf of him. and. Uh, <coughs> Uh, how, a lot of half of this presentation will be delivered by Yusuke Ayokota uh, in remotely. He will make an, a report on the DOI's activities in Japan. Okay. <clears throat> uh, the Jigos Japan uh, established in 2013. Uh, space geodesy uh, situation was complicated uh, in Japan. Uh, agencies such as uh, GSI, uh, Japan, NSCT, uh, Japan Coast Guard, uh, NAS National Institute for Research, National Astronomy Observatory, JAXA, has participated in GIGOS through IGS, RBS, ILS, LS, but uh, these agencies participate in, the, in international observation individually and collaboration between them are not so intensive. So uh, many research works have been conducted in the field of cluster deformation. Uh, as you know, Japan is very active uh, in context of cluster deformation. So uh, not so many research in global geodesy. Uh, the most of the research is, is concentrated on cluster deformation. So uh, we decided to establish GIGOS Working Group under IAG Subcommission of Japan in Science Council of Japan. And, and uh, uh, as you know, uh, later the GIGOS Working Group escalated to GIGOS Japan in 2019. The purpose of the group is to promote and enhance mutual cooperation among the space geodetic agencies in Japan. And uh, we uh, conducted several activities under this uh, framework. Uh, the, one of our focus is outreach of the importance of geodesy in Japan. So we developed a uh, GIGOS Japan leaflet and uh, that one was updated. Uh, unfortunately, the most uh, important point of the update is in the commission of some stations, but also uh, establishment of new SLR station in Tsukuba at JAXA headquarters is good news for us. And uh, uh, copies are printed and distributed to the several uh, domestic meetings and PDF are also, of course available online on the GIGOS website. And uh, this news, uh, new station at the JAXA's headquarters in Tsukuba, uh, the JAXA closed that SLR station in Tanegashima in 2021. A new SLR station uh, installed in 2022 after the 
an、uh, avoidable delay due to the pandemic.、Uh, the station was originally planned to establish in 2020, but a、uh, two year s delay because of、uh, COVID 19 pandemic. And the arranging test is now ongoing. And uh, uh, we have、uh, nine core pe- members in、uh, Jugos Japan. Toshi、uh, chair e d Jugos、uh, Japan, and I'm、uh, secretary of the body. And、uh, we have five representatives for each technique with the ISL Genesis s t o r a s and Gravity. And our focus is, of course, one of the focus is outreach, and the other one is DORIs. And、uh, we have already have nine years' history. The,、uh, as I mentioned, the working group was established in 2013. And、uh, we are issued a special issue in the、uh, Japanese、uh, domestic research journal uh, uh, and, uh, uh, about JUGOS. And uh, uh, in 2017, we became the first JUGOS affiliate and hosted JUGOS Days 2018 in Tsukuba.、Uh, some of you attended the meeting. And、uh, we updated TOR and named、uh, uh, Jugos Japan and created Outreach and DOI's working group. And uh, uh, yes, and now the recent focus of us is to uh, make an, a co- collocation, collaboration in Japan uh, at the uh, Japanese uh, sites, which have uh, multiple uh, techniques, and also co- co- collaboration with、uh, Jugos Taha. And uh, 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 recent activity we are planning to launch is uh, uh, to uh, have some investigation on the,、uh, where in the ideal j i g o s q u a r site、uh, in Japan,、uh, considering the several aspects of the Japanese, Japan, uh, rega- uh, for example, the、uh, access to the station or the Uh, site visibility and、uh, weather, weather condition.、Uh, we are we, we prone to consider such、uh, things and uh, uh, identify where is the best place for,、uh, for Japanese space colli-、uh, Jersey colleagues to establish a core station in Japan. And we also、uh, contribute to the、uh, outreach of JIGOS, and we、uh, translated a, a Discover JIGOS short film into Japanese. And also, we developed a, a short video about、uh, Ishioka Weber、uh, Station、uh, Locata Survey, a joint project with the Hitotsubashi University and GSI. And、uh, we developed、uh, two versions, Japanese and English, and a、uh, short version in Japanese. So,、uh, so th- I'd like to show you the short version of the video.、Uh, one- Okay, thank you for your attention. And、uh, we will also plan to、uh, develop、uh, another video to outreach the,、uh, our activity to the people in Japan. And uh, as h a n s h o k already mentioned,、uh, we accepted uh, uh, students from Germany、uh, early this year, a three month stay at GSI, and have、uh, some collaboration between GIGOS Japan and the HUB. And、uh, she、uh, Did、uh, research and、uh, uh, integration of a、uh, uh, varsity field derived from、uh, Chorus, Genesis Chorus Station, and also INSER.、Uh, and、uh, she did quite a nice job and had a presentation to,、uh, of course, to uh, GSI, uh, Jigos Japan colleagues, and at the university. 
Um, it was a really nice experience for Jigo's uh, Japan colleagues to accept her because uh, she was highly motivated and uh, uh, it was uh, not so often for Japanese colleagues to accept uh, students from foreign countries and it, it was a really good opportunity for us to uh, be stimulated by her. And uh, uh, international collaboration uh, excursion, uh, uh, the, uh, we took her to the several uh, sites in Japan and uh, have discussions with uh, institutions. And uh, uh, we will host IBS general meeting in 2024 uh, in Tsukuba. Uh, so uh, please keep your dates to the general meeting. Okay, uh, the next part will be presented by Yusuke. So let's move to, on to the uh, DOI working uh, group of the uh, Japan region. So oh, then, so in this page, so we show that uh, uh, Jigos Japan's uh, DOI working group studies. So in recent years, so we have begun to uh, consider assigning uh, DOIs to geodetic data in Japan. So and permanently strong uh, storing them. So in advance, so we surveyed the uh, current situation of many Japanese data systems, and uh, then so the uh, Geodetic Society of Japan plans to organize the Japanese data uh, using these three systems: so WAP and JSTAGE data and JALOC. The WAP is a, a project in which the National Diet library it permanently stores the digital data of national institutions and the justice data is a project of the uh with the feature share uh, which was run by justice so they had started a data storage project in collaboration so then the uh, finally JAOC is a uh, membership system so to enable uh, japanese institutions to grant dois uh please next page okay uh, thank you so then, uh, uh, so we we, uh, we made a uh, data system working group in the, uh, uh, also G G Geodetic Society of Japan. So then we have set up a, a study group. Uh, then uh, as a uh, characteristic of Japanese institutions, uh, many Japanese agencies uh, can, pre can prepare uh, their own uh, repositories, but they do not have a system for assigning DOIs depending on the uh, uh, institution's requirements. Yeah. So therefore, uh, our policy is to organize the data in the geodetic field and assigning uh, that assign the DOIs for them. And we are also considering hand, uh, handing over the DOI assignment uh, function uh, to administrative agencies and other uh, agencies. So, but it is currently in preparation and metadata is also under consideration. Uh, and next please, next page, next page is the final page. And the finally, so I'd uh, like to show the uh, other uh, uh, as a, as a studies and uh, as a CIFO uh, geodetist uh, for me. So let me give you a little appendix page This in this Zigos uh, ICCMs. Uh, and the Zigos ICCM recently started to consider the format of CIFO geodetic data. And in particular, so GNSSA is a CIFO geodetic method and the water pressure gauge data uh, will be examined first. And the Japan Coast Guard Group uh, has taken the lead uh, open, open data system and open analysis system of CIFRA geodesy. And we are currently conducting studies based on the uh, Japan Coast Guard system. And uh, uh, this uh, slide and this figure uh, is a uh, Zoom screen of the first meeting in, uh, on October, uh, in this October. And uh, that's all. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Skip. Oh, okay, finish. Okay. Oh, this is our final slide of the uh, report of Jigos Japan. Thank you very much. Any questions, comments? Yes, please. Ah, yeah. I have two short questions. You mentioned Kashima is finished, completely stopped. So there is no space to Odyssey at all. Um, uh, Yes, officially. Uh, actually, some staff members are still working in NSCT, 
but in, uh, uh, the name of VLBI disappeared in the in their uh, working plan uh, at least for the uh, next five years. Yes, and then there is no antenna. Okay. No antenna anymore. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, actually, in Kogane, uh, there is Bravia and uh, SLR, but they are not so operational. Uh, they, they, I'm not sure, but uh, they do not do any oper uh, routine oper operation now. In Kogane, yeah. yeah. And second question, um, the new laser station in Tsuguba, how is it connected to Ishioka? I know that the distance uh, is 70 kilometers, but there are some Yes, a very good question. Very good question. Um, Actually, the distance between the uh, SLR in Tsukuba and uh, Beba in Shioka is 20, uh, 70, 70 kilometers, but uh, there is no way to connect two stations. Um, so we are con considering to uh, see the uh, variation of the Genesis space la line lengths between the stations because uh, Ishoka has IG station and uh, uh, Tsukuba uh, SLR station also now uh, apply to the new IG station. So we will plan to see the uh, variation of the coordinate time series of these two stations. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions? Okay, so I would like to invite the next speaker from incoming, uh, Jigos Iber Atlantic. Hello, good afternoon. I'm Esther Adkler working at the National Geographic Institute of Spain. And I'm going to present today with my colleagues, Jose Antonio Lopez Fernandez, that is the General Subdirector of Geodesian Astronomy in the National Geographic of Spain, Jose Manuel Ferrandi, researcher in the Alicante University and president of the Working Group of Theory of the Air Rotation and Validation in the International Association of Geodesy, and Luisa Magallanes, that is the president of Rife's Authors Association. We are going to present today an initiative that we hope you find interesting, but more of that necessary too. We are going to present the proposal of create a new GIGOS affiliate that is called the GIGOS affiliate group Iber Atlantic. We are uh, presenting this affiliate group that it will cover the region, that it will be all the block, the dynamical block of the Iberian Peninsula, also several archipelagos and islands in the Atlantic Ocean and all the west coast of Africa that you can see here. In this moment, this initiative arises in a collaboration between Spain and Portugal. Then in the next slides, I'm going to focus in this collaboration, but we are open to more countries if they want to participate as if there is any listener that can be interested in this initiative that uh, it cover all this area. We, we hope they contact us and we, we are open and happy if you want to join to us in this exciting adventure. In all this region, there, there is a very interesting point that is the triple jontium or three tectonic plates. This is affecting all the region and all the countries that we are there. All the countries that in some case we have common borders are water seeds, similar, um, similar geographic distribution, uh, we all this, in this country have similar scientificness and interest, needs and interest, sorry, <laughs> but also similar risks. And this is a very important point because geodesy has to be a tool for society. And then we have to serve to the citizens and be prepared in case uh, of something of these cases or of these uh, proofs of, of activity in the area happens. Here you can see several pictures of different uh, activity, volcano activity, seismic activity that we have had in the area. For example, here you can see the La Palma eruption that ha uh, it was the in, in 2021 in, in Spain, Gran Canaria, in La Palma, sorry. <laughs> uh, also here you have some, some proof of that may, this activity is happening in Forna, San Miguel. Here are some pictures on some of some droughts in Spain and two uh, earthquakes that happened uh, in the last, well, this one was in, in Spain in 2011 in Lorca that it caused five casualties and it was the Great Lisbon earthquake in 1715, that uh, 55, sorry, that I know you all know and it affects all the, well, it almost destroyed Lisbon but also affects Spain, the south coast of Spain and Morocco. 
all these countries, we have then a, a, we are exposed to all these natural risks, and we need to modeling to have a, a good modeling of the earth system and good knowledge. And a, as a consequence, we need reference system and French for studying all these phenomena. Why are we interested in becoming a GIGOS affiliate? Well, we have divided our goals in two kinds of them. We have some general goals. The first one is that we agree, sorry, we agree with the GIGOS vision and mission, and we would like to join efforts in the GIGOS activities. But also we think that the important point of GIGOS is that it's trying to bring geodesy closer to society. And this is a point that uh, sometimes, very frequently, the scientists forgot. And also that is thinking in global geodesy as roadmap, as a point of future. And we think that is an interesting point and that we also serve. But we have also specific regions that we, we would like to to mention that is that uh, it will create a forum for discussions in this area that as we have all these things in common we think it's a very important point and also it will be a way to have an easy access to projects uh, it will bring us the possibility of coordination between different organizations but also cooperation between countries and organizations and in particular we will be very interested in now how other affiliate group works and even uh, to have some project in common and activities. We, we think that other important goal would be that we it will help us to promote the geodetic products and application in all this region, and also to encourage to improve the instrumentation and as well the data analysis, creating this forum and discussing between all the experts in the area, even with external consultants. We think that also is important that uh, will, this will help us to work in emerging techniques that I think that is a lack uh, of a uh, working area that we have now in this in all this region. We will be more implicated in new studies and new techniques and things uh, for, uh, uh, that it will help us in the evolution and quality of our research. And, and a special point that we would want to highlight is to encourage the research and in especially the young scientists. A problem that we are uh, noticed in the last year, it is very difficult to find people, uh, young scientists that want to work, well, not in UDC, but uh, there are very few of them. And sometimes they are, they are focused on universities, but not in federal agencies. And I th we think that if we create a group like this one that can, uh, collaborate with other groups, have international projects, maybe it will be something attractive for the young people and that uh, they, they, that help them to interest in geodesy and, and decide that uh, area of study for, for working. This uh, cooperation that I'm talking about is not new. We, in the past, Spain and Portugal have collaborated in different geodesic campaigns. We have, a, they have been very successful. And now in the present, we have also several projects of collaboration. I want to highlight two projects. One of them, it was the Iberian anti five campaign. This campaign settled the basis for the current national frames in Spain and Portugal. It was a GPS campaign that it was done in 1995 that it was a, different, a direct cooperation between the National Geographic Institute of Spain and the Cartography and Cadastro Portuguese Institutes. And this campaign was focused on densifying the European terrestrial reference frame in the Iberian Peninsula, obtaining accurate co co site coordinates in Spain and Portugal, and establish a high precision three-dimensional network. It was formed by observation in 39 stations, and it was processed with scientific software and highlight that it was approved by the Europe as an official densification network. It was a very successful project of collaboration. And now we can see over in the present, the RISE project that uh, we will see in the next slide. This project is shared between the uh, Governo de Azores and the National Geographic Institute of Spain. And it's been a very fruitful and enriching project that I'm going to present in, in, in the next slides. 
And also this need of discussion that I'm talking about uh, is not new neither. We have the Spanish Portuguese Assembly of Judeci and Judeci on the visit that we are uh, work um, it have several editions since 1998 and the next one is going to be in two weeks in Toledo it's a, an edition very successful because we have more than 250 contributions between uh, of different organizations between Spain and Portugal and this assembly have nine scientific topics one of them is geodesy um, before my next slide, I want to do a, a small disclaimer. We are going to do a, a review of the geodetic capabilities in the Bear Atlantic region, but I, as I'm going to uh, present in the last slides, uh, this uh, affiliate group or the steps that we are doing, is in, we are in a very initial steps. Then there are some organizations that we are not contact yet because uh, of bureaucracy and we, uh, and we can't have that contact, but we are going to do them for do this initial study that it's only for evaluate what organization are will be interested and what capabilities and infrastructure we, we will have. Uh, we have a uh, use uh, public data from their website and from the International Association of Geodesic Services, but uh, we are working on that and uh, we have yet a lot of work to do and a lot of organization to contact with. Here, uh, first, we have a start our analysis of um, doing an initial survey of what organization are, are could be potential collaborators in this affiliate group. Uh, for that, we have uh, do not, uh, the, done a study of what organization are working on Geodesy in the Iber Atlantic region. We have divided these organizations uh, in three groups. In green, is, there are organizations that we know that they have analysis capabilities or they are working in scientific research on, on geodesy. You can see in the table and in the map. In blue, there are organizations that they have geodetic infrastructure. And in red, there are organizations that they have both of the uh, they have analysis capabilities or, or do research, but also they have infrastructure. Uh, we have localized a total of 31 organizations in Spain and nine in Portugal, but they, I think we think that there are more than the, the ones that we are so, so here and we are doing some research yet. And I'm, I, I'm sure that in the next uh, months, we, we amplify this table. Other analysis that we have done is what a uh, collocated site there are in the region, uh, understanding collocated of uh, spatial geodetic techniques. And we have uh, found that there are five observatories that they have several space geodetic techniques collocated. Uh, for example, we can see the San Fernando Observatory that from the Royal Observatory of the Spanish Army that they have as SL, uh, ISLR but also a GNSS station, both of them contributing to the services from the International Association of Geodesy. And there are also a Doris station in Punta Delgada that is from uh, the Universidad dos Azores that is collocated with a GNSS. And we have also the four stations that are part from the RAIDE project that I'm going to present in the next slide that are the observatories of Yeves, Santa Maria, Flores, and Gran Canaria. Two of them, uh, there are still on the in progress, but uh, the other two are already operative. I'm going to present here. The RISE project is a, one of the successful collaboration that we have between Spain and Portugal that I mentioned before. It's a collaboration uh, where the National Geographic Institute of Spain and the government are working together. And the objective is the management, the of building and operation of four fundamental geodetic stations or collocation sites for geodetic and geodynamic purpose. Uh, this project is focused in technological development. An example is the Observatory of Dieves, that is a technical development center of the international VLBI service, but also in the analysis. And for that, we have several collaborations. For example, the one that we have with the University of Alicante for uh, exploding all this data and big observations. 
Here you can see two of the observatories that are already operative. You can see the Yeves Observatory in Guadalajara, Spain, and the Santa Maria Observatory in Azores, Portugal. And you can see the techniques that we already have working. The Cellar in Yeves Observatory will be prepared for the beginning of the next year, we hope. But we already have uh, BLVI antennas that with the um, special characteristic that are new generation BLVI antennas from Vigos. Uh, we have data from the superconducting gravimeter, DNSS, and MASER. And in Santa Maria, the same with the lack of the SLR. In the, in, we hope in a close future, uh, we'll have two uh, observatories more that are the Observatory of Flores and Gran Canaria that are still in progress. This was the project that uh, was the seed and the idea for try to become this affiliate group because we we have here an example of how this collaboration strengths both countries but also several organizations and we hope that uh, sorry we think that if more organizations were implying this kind of collaboration we uh, it will be a win to win <laughs> a win win for all of us. There are more uh, geodetic uh, resources in the area. For example, here you can see that all the Iberian Peninsula is covered for uh, different uh, for GNSS station from different public networks. There is a total of 373 stations. There are uh, 17 public networks in Spain, plus five in Portugal. And some of these stations are contributing also to the, uh, to the IGS uh, uh, they are integrated in the IES network and also in the European Permanent Network. A quick review here we have also two, uh, the different gravimetric network that we, we have in the Iber Atlantic region. In Spain, we have the, the data from the National Geographic Institute of Spain, that, uh, the absolute data from the gravimeters as are in, in, included in the A graph database. And in Portugal, we have a uh, showing the data from the Dirección General do Territorio. And to this uh, network, we can, we can add the four superconductor gravimeters. Now, two are already operative and two in progress. Yet. And here we will have all the leveling network that we have in the, we have found in the area. Uh, as uh, only a curiosity, the main difference in vertical datum between Spain and Portugal due to the, the origin of, the, of the, the different origins of the vertical datum is around 11 centimeters. Here uh, we can see the different type gouges, some of uh, 11 of them collocated with GNS station that we, are, uh, we have in the area. The, the Spanish vertical datum will be Alicante between the Portuguese vertical datum is Cascais and there are local vertical datum for the different islands. The present state of the proposal is the next one. The initiative arises, as we mentioned, in the right project. The, and and it, it, this initiative has followed two different ways. In Spain, the IGN of Spain and the Alicante, University of Alicante do a proposal to the Geodesy Committee of the Spanish Commission of Geodesy and Geophysics. This proposal was approved. And then this proposal went to the plenary of the Spanish Commission of Geodesy and Geophysics that also approved. But this approved was with the condition of form a working group with experts of different organizations that is in charge of doing a viability study. This, uh, in the other way, RISE authorities have been doing some first contact to the Yodeti Portuguese community, and this work is ongoing yet, and we are waiting the, for an answer. Once we have also some experts from Portugal, this working group allow, and will, be, will, elaborate this, will elaborate this study, sorry, and this study will need the final approval of the national Yodeti committees from both countries. If all uh, once we have this final answer, successful answer, we will do the proposal to GIGOS, and after we will we will do a call for participation to all the organizations in the region. 
then the future st steps will be to waiting for the answer of our Portuguese colleagues ongoing and doing this study of viability that uh, the focus or the, uh, the topic of this study will do be uh, do an analysis of the current statute of the Spanish and Portuguese geodesy to evaluate their needs and by viability of forming or the, of forming this Diego's affiliate group. Uh, this group will be will have a spirit expertise from Spain and Portugal, but also maybe we can need international advisor or consultants. Uh, the, the the topics that it, it was it, we have to to study or include in this uh, study is uh, the, the, to identify the possible focus areas and the relation, the relation with geodesy, to uh, define the geodetic challenges and needs that uh, we have in this region, study or do one state of the art of the international background and goals. And we, after we have two last points that will be more specific of the region that it will do a, study in detail of the current scientific, technological, operational and outreach capabilities that we have in all this area, identifying all the activities, the projects, works, infrastructure, analysis and research groups. And at the end, it will finish with a define a specific steps, a specific actions in different topics as a technologic development, mathematic modeling, analysis that data, data, products, application, divulgation, and to uh, do the roadmap that we are going to continue in, uh, to follow from this point. The, the, my life is, <laughs> last slide, sorry. The conclusion that will be that the Spanish organization are informed through the Spanish Geodetic Committee that supports this initiative. Spain considers Portugal adherence is funda fundamental to strengthen the activity of this future affiliate. At the present, we are waiting for the answer of the rest of Portuguese organization be positive in the light that in the past we have had very well past and, and now <laughs> in current. We have a, um, a very fruitful collaboration between Spain and Portugal. An example of that is Rice Ployen that uh, I uh, mentioned before. And after the viability study is successfully approved by the national committees, a formal proposal will be issued to GIGOS. And Spain and Portugal have already shown their commitment to the state extents, but could more countries close to them be interested? We have to study if somebody in the audience and now so is uh, is working in a, a institution that can be interested. Please, we will like they, they contact us and uh, try to work together in this exciting art venture. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any questions or comments? Thank you. You mentioned at the beginning and also on your last slide that other countries are also potential partners. Which countries would you consider? Morocco or which? Yes, um, we have thought in Morocco or maybe some countries on the of the west coast of Africa that maybe they want to they want to join. I, we don't know if they have infrastructure, but maybe if they want interest in collaborate or we will be open to them, that that will be a very desirable point. We we want we won't, don't want to be close to Spain and Portugal. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it would be interesting also to include these countries on the West Coast. It, it will be great. <laughs> we, we, we didn't talk yet because we this is this proposal has a lot of steps, a lot of bureaucracy, and it very difficult to organize between two countries. But the idea is that with the final call of participation, maybe we can contact with some people, organization that there is in the in this area and ask if they are interested. But the idea will be that people, this presentation arise to the people. If there are some people in the audience that work in 
in geodesy in this region they can free contact with us and ask about the status of the proposal what we can do we can what we can share or collaborate it, we will be happy to have more countries than spain and portugal in the affiliate So uh, I'd like to invite the next speaker, uh, the chair of Jigo Science Panel, uh, for Keheki. He will make the report from remotely. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. And uh, my talk shall be fairly short. And I'm going to talk about our activities in 2021 and 2022. I'm uh, Kosuke Heki. Uh, recently moved from Japan to China. Uh, this is a structure of Jigos, and uh, so here is Jigos, a uh, science panel. Our members of science panels are to be selected from uh, two people from IAG Commission and the two from Intercommission Committees and Project and one from each uh, GIGOS focus area. And this is a slide I showed uh, last year in GIGOS days. So there were 14 members. And during the last one year, uh, several changes occurred. So this is uh, this year. Uh, one from United States, Chen Jianli has moved to Hong Kong. And I moved from Japan to China. So there is some redistribution of members. And also, uh, there are three new organizations in IAG, and they have uh, two re new representatives from individual observation, uh, individual organizations. So now we have uh, 20 of us. So this is our role. According to the terms of reference, uh, Geoscience Panel is an independent and multidisciplinary advisory board that provides scientific support and guidance to the Geos steering and coordinating coordination entities as requested. So, so we are ready to do uh, anything requested by uh, Geos. And what we did mainly last year was for example, uh, contributing to reviews of GEO's website, a product page. And this is finished last year. So this is geodetic uh, product list. And if you click uh, any of those and we go to such page and the description has been reviewed by our members. And this was already finished last year. And the main activities over the last uh, one year is to organize geo sessions in major scientific assemblies such as EGU and AGU. And what we do is to propose sessions and encouraging submissions, inviting speakers and making schedules and sharing sessions. And uh, scientific meetings have been uh, greatly influenced by the COVID-19 pandemic. So before 2020, everything is uh, on site. And the, during the last two years, everything was uh, remote. And now it is becoming hybrid. And last year, AGU is not highly hybrid. So it is mainly uh, remote and only partly on site. And maybe uh, next year, AGU will be largely uh, on site and only partly remote. But anyway, uh, it is changing uh, day to day. Uh, there is a large country dependence. And uh, now I'm in China. The situation does not change uh, over the last two years. And it is easy to go out, but it is difficult to come back to China. So that's the situation. And uh, these are the Jigo sessions before uh, COVID-19. And 
I made this slide last year for Jigo's days to make us happy. So COVID-19 is not 100% bad for science. So there are several benefits indeed, uh, possible to attend without paying uh, or air tickets. And uh, our presentations are available on demand even after meeting. So there are several uh, benefits. And I want to ask uh, after COVID-19, how do you feel? So maybe, many people are starting to uh, go abroad to attend sessions on site but i think you still think there were some benefits for remote meetings so i guess hybrid uh, part will remain even after uh, the end of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic so these are the Agile uh, sessions and during and after COVID-19, uh, remote and hybrid. So we have been doing uh, every year, uh, twice a year, Agile uh, sessions. And uh, last, uh, next year, there will be EGU at Vienna in April and IUGG in Berlin in July. And what I want to emphasize is that for these two meetings, uh, currently uh, call for abstract, so they are open now. For EGU, uh, deadline is the 10th of January. So what are our sessions like? The title is the combination of uh, the Global Geodetic Observing System plus uh, something else. And this sub theme could be, for example, uh, infrastructure and science, society, or a combination of these words. And these are the session titles over the last 10 years. Uh, the next AGU and the next EGU will be done with uh, uh, a session title, GIGOS and Geodesy for Sustainable Earth Observations. So your submissions are welcome. Okay, and many years ago, there are uh, session titles focusing on some parts of geodetic science, for example, gravity or positioning, but nowadays it is getting uh, omnidirectional, so without any colors. Uh, future issues and perspectives for GIGO sessions, uh, we definitely need more papers by early career scientists. So I ask each of you to encourage your students to contribute a paper to our session. And also there's a difficulty in keeping specific scientific uh, discipline to the session title, because if we say a gravity, there's another session dedicated to gravity. So uh, there's a conflict. So necessarily our title become uh, omnidirectional nowadays. And region diversity has been improving, I think. And uh, potential roles are expected for future science panel in general. I believe this will be discussed on Wednesday and Thursday this week. Okay, I think that's all from uh, the science panel. Thank you very much. Any comments to the floor, from the floor? Yes, Uh Kuzuko Eki san, do you hear me? Yeah. 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 Uh, I get from your activity report that most of the activities of the science panel is to organize sessions. Uh, the yeah. EGU, EGU and uh, also Japan EGU. Uh, what about the activities? How active are the members of the science panel in relation to the statement regarding the science panel objectives in the terms of reference? Uh, I must say it is not so active. So I think most of the activities are done by the chair. But last year, there was a big task to review uh session uh product descriptions and as 
I assigned two members to an uh, individual uh, product. So there were uh, many tasks last year, but this year, uh, I don't think they did a lot of things, but I think it is to be discussed later this week. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Okay, uh, thank you very much again, Hekisan, uh, for your presentation evening, midnight in China. Um, I'd like to invite the next speaker from uh, Working Group on DOIs for Juliet Desets, Karsten Eva, uh, to make the presentation on the uh, DOIs for Datasets. Can you hear over here? Yeah, here, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm, I thought I, and this is what I already announced um, in Thessaloniki, that I will not give a report on what we are doing because I have done this already two weeks ago. And I see that at least half of you have been at the UAW. So in, in, in a change, I would like to tell you a bit more of once you have a DOI for data, what you can do and what, what does it involve both for the researcher side and also for the group or for the, for the institution that is minting DOI. But just a brief introduction on the GIGOS DOI working group. We have been formed in October 2019. Group members are now about 40 with um, official and associated members representing all IAG services and geodetic data centers and the general aim is to establish best practices and discuss options and possibilities for reasonably minting of DOIs for geodetic data. Okay, so I would like to address three questions. What does the minting of DOI mean include? How does this help to make my data fair? We are all speaking about fair data now. And what, I, what can I do to support this? First, I would like to set some definitions. When I speak of the publication of the data, I mean the publication of the data in a research data repository, which is an archive for data. It's an access point and a point where you can find the data. And I'm not speaking about having any data supplements to research articles. The collaboration with the repository means that the data are findable because we are using international well, standardized machine actionable metadata that can be copied and then sent to, to different data portals. When we have the DOI, the data has can be directly accessed via the DOI link. The data should be documented and I'm taking uh, talking to the, in the conditional because this, this depends strongly on the repository that you're choosing. So in case you have a research data repository for a domain, like for geosciences data, there are several around. You can, you are certainly asked to, to provide your data or to provide some documentation of the data. If you go to one of these self-service stores like Zenodo, you have to know what you upload and then you get your DOI, but there's a quality difference. And, and I think this is very, very crucial. Data assigned with the DOI are citable in papers. Almost all publishers, worldwide are now accepting and even asking for publishing data and now citing data and articles. And therefore, we need to, to enable the citation of the data, we need this metadata. And I, when I, at this point, I mean the DOI related metadata, which is mainly metadata for data discovery. Metadata is everything that you, that you need to describe your data, including data formats, site logs for, geo, for GNSS data and everything. On top of this, when you have a data DOI, you need discovery metadata, which includes titles, um, links to the data downloads, uh, connections between the, um, the data, and related articles, related papers. Ideally, you have keywords, controlled vocabularies. At GFZ, when there is a spatial domain, we always put the, the spatial, the, the geographic coordinates that in a catalog, you can already see where you have, where you go. Um, including everything you need for a data citation. And if you look at this generic way to cite data, having authors, a publication, your title publisher, 
resource type and the DOI, it looks very much like a normal citation of any other research paper you, you always cite. So just treat data similar to treating any paper. These metadata for discovery are essential for, for data discovery. We need them for the UI registration and, and this is very good, they're international standards that are valid across all scientific domains. So you can compare every DOI related metadata up to a certain point if you well, if you focus on the on the mandatory fields, which are the one I, sh I showed below, then you can really put together data from geosciences, from humanities, from medical sciences, from all over the world. Um, and when you cite data, I just give this example. I've already shown this in Thessaloniki. The first thing that you need to cite the data in the article, um, then you add the full references and you see that these references really look like references for papers. And from the DOIs that are, can I show here this one? Sorry. Ah, no, I, I don't touch anything. My goodness. Okay, sorry. Okay, you see the DOIs below and these link to the DOI, to the landing pages of the, of the data. And of course, from there, we make sure that there is a link back to the to the article to really have this this full this full overview of the data. Um, I would like to go a little more into the metadata because there are other topics or there are other fields that might be not mandatory but they're extremely useful and one of them is the the license that you select for your data, and it is really recommended to include the license in in the machine actionable metadata because then everyone knows, okay, this file or this data has can be used according to this license. Um, it is of course recommended because we're speaking about open science that the, data, the, the, the license is as open as possible. Um, therefore, um, for data, we usually recommend to use Creative Commons licenses which are which can be expressed like a link and are therefore also findable and, and really machine actionable. So if you have an XML metadata and you have a link to the license in the metadata, every machine who receives the data when they're going for data mining on the on the global scale, they know exactly well this comes with a CCDY or with a CC0 and everyone knows what to do. So this is one thing that I would recommend to always add to the DUI metadata. The next is that there are, I don't know how much you have ever heard about like persistent identifier or PIDs. A DOI is one of the persistent identifiers that's usually identifiers that are registered at one specific point at one computer and they're internationally unique and can be resolved by, by a link. And we have, we speak a lot about DOI for paper, for data, for software. But there are also, there's the ORCID, which is the, it's a highly recommendable persistent identifier for persons to avoid um, having five John Smith and not knowing which person, which of them is the author of the paper. There is, a, there are persistent identifiers for, for funders to avoid double naming and spacing. And there's also um, the, the new persistent identifier for institutions that I would I have more slides about that. And the good thing is all these persistent identifiers can be expressed like a link and are therefore machine actionable. And um, this is how they should be displayed. And at this point we leave, we can leave the, the domain of only human accessibility for information, but we can really make it also accessible for machines directly. And they are resolvable, which means when you click on the link, you come to the object, very similar to like whether it's it's an IGSN for physical samples or everything. And with this, I just like to to go come, come a little to to my to my domain. I'm a geologist, and we speak about samples. And I would like just like to to make a little circle of what what objects they are and how you can can connect them. So in geology, for example, everything starts with a sample. For geodesy, this would be a a measurement, for example. The sample in this case is analyzed to produce data that's geochemical data analysis. Then you may or may not have a code and then by interpreting the data, you publish papers. When we now speak about these options for the digital data curation and everything around fair data and persistent identifiers, 
we will have the sample that is assigned with the IGSN, which is this identifier, uniquely identifier for the for physical samples that link to the sample description in the internet. The data are published with the data DOI. And the connection between all these objects can be made by uh, cit citing the other object via these persistent identifiers that they all bear. And having this in mind, I think it's something that that's definitely worth including in any DOI related metadata that you might you might use. <clears throat> I would like to, I don't know how much time if I speak too long, you just stop me. Um, <laughs> I would like to, to, to make it a bit more, more illustrative. Um, I would like to ask the question, why are these important? And I would like to make an example for the raw identifier. It's a very new persistent identifier developed for research institutes. Um, and the reason for having it becomes clear from this from this slide. I have just listed the different names. I can call it the world of names for GFZ. And you see that there are different, we have four different ways of naming, of putting the, the GFZ name, even officially in, in any affiliation. We have name changes over time. So Geoforschungszentrum Potsdam is not existing anymore. Now we are the Deutsches Geoforschungszentrum. Um, there are typos. If you see the red, the red numbers like GFZ, the center is British English and many people write it with American English. So all in all, this leads to one institute when people look at it because we can make a the connection, but for machines, it will be eight institutes. And if you think about asking how many times those data from my institute have been published or have been cited, then you have to consider these different names unless you use the raw identifier. And this is how it looks like. Um, it's the research, the search result. So raw has a has a, um, a catalog and I guess all your institutions are already there. And it has on one hand on top, you see the machine actionable and resolvable raw number. You have the human readable legal name. You even have other names. And, and this is good about the raw identifier. It integrates pre previously existing institutional identifiers so far as far as it's possible. And, and this is also, that is quite new. I just made it today because it has changed. Like GFZ, for example, is the Helmholtz Center. So it is also related to the Helmholtz Association. And if you click on that, you will see all the Helmholtz centers. So you can even build up this hierarchy. So if you somehow need or you make your, your DOI metadata, you should consider to, to use this raw identifier. I would not ask the, the, the researchers themselves to include it. They shall just go on providing the affiliations, but on the data center side, it's worth making a mapping and additionally providing the raw identifier to really make it unique and also findable in the, the metrics when you have these citation analysis. The other important thing is to use ORCIDs. And this is something that every one of you needs to support because the ORCID record can only be done and maintained by each individual researcher. When I publish data, I make sure that I'm asking the, the authors to provide as many org IDs as, as they have of all the co-authors. And which means that ideally, the data entry, that the data publication is included in the ORCID record. So you have your works. And then when you, when you do some settings that I'll explain later on, you can automatically when you have a data publication it's automatically included in your in your orchid record so you don't need to do anything i think many of you have experiences with research gate where they upload all the informations all the publications when you use an orchid and you allow orchid to fill your profile you only need to include the orchid in any publication and it's automatically done so it's really much less work for you and in addition once you have a new publication, you get an email notification from ORCID org. And um, it already happens twice for me that I first received the email from ORCID that a paper was published where I was co-author. And only two hours later, the, 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 um, the publisher sent the email, all oh, the paper is now published. So this is really something that is that is working. But we need, I think, you need to 
to have um, something in mind because when I when I get this DUI metadata GF set, um, I usually try to find the persons um, to the names and their orchids. And for that, it is important that you that you consider something. This is a an example I have just created this morning when I heard the talk of Jürgen Müller because Jürgen Müller is such a great name where I expected to have many, many versions of like there. If you look at this, there's um, one, uh, one, two, three, four, five, there are six Jürgen Müller plus several Jürgens and everything. This is the search, search result for the orchid search for Jürgen Müller. Jürgen, I hope you forgive me that I, I use your, <laughs> your name as, a, as an example. What I see here is that I do find one Jürgen Müller from the Leibniz University of Hanover. And if I, if I, it's the, the third one, and if I open the, the record, it's really, it's a great orchid example because you can see the name, you have the, the affiliation, you can, you see that it's really the Jürgen Müller from Hanover, and you even have the works where you can see the papers he's writing, and you can go to the papers and really see that this is the right Jürgen Müller. And there's even the connection to the Scopus ID. So this is everything that it makes it very, very useful for a data curator to access the ORCID. If we go back to the over to the list and we, for example, check one of the other ones, like the one that has the, the capital letters. If I open this record, I only find a little notification, no public, no public information available. So I can't do anything. And if I, I have many cases where people are, but I have three different choices and none of them have any public information available. And this is something that makes it quite difficult for data curators to, to work with this and also to, to really make use of the, the, um, the ORCID. So it would be great, and for making the best of your ORCID, that you make sure that a minimum of personal information is publicly visible, at least the first name, last name, ideally the affiliation, and if not, at least some works, because based on the scientific context of the works, we can access the papers and we can see if it's the right person. To always include your ORCID in articles, data publications, code publications, wherever you get a DOI. And of course, for the data centers that they have to reserve a field for a DOI. And, and this is something that makes it really comfortable um, to allow DOI reg registration agencies like DataSight and CrossLev to automatically fill your ORCID record. DataSight and CrossLev are the largest UI agencies. I know that the Japanese agency is also different. So, but um, usually when this happened to me when I wrote a paper, um, when you provide the orchids of your of your co-authors, you will get an orchid request. Do you allow this publisher to fill your orchid record? And they say yes, and then it's automatically done. And this is really something that everyone can do. And for those of you who have who who understand German, <laughs> we recently have published some user uh, recommendations in the GIMIT, which are the Geowissenschaftliche Mitteilung, is the joint magazine of the of the German Geosciences Unions. And there you can read everything what I've done and a little more and you will click on this and put it there. So this is what, what you can do. And then last, the last point is um, always the question, how can we connect data with articles? Because Articles are still, or public uh, scholarly literature is still much, much higher rate ranked. So, when I publish data, it is essential that I connect it to the to the article. We, on the repository side, and this is an example of quite a, an extensive <laughs> number of citations in the data publication, and it took me five minutes because I had the list. So <laughs> And so we make sure to to cite every paper that is that is related to the data. These are many. If it's a data compilation, there are different possibilities to say um, this is data supplement to a paper, or it's just citing, or it's documented by, which might might be relevant for for GIGOS documents like the Rhinix format description or anything. We don't need to repeat everything if there's a paper or a report written about it. Um, that is what the repository is doing. The researcher has to cite the data in the paper. However, what happens when we have this scenario? We have a data publication in 2016. It was a project where we encouraged people to even publish data there where the papers have already been published. And this data publication was published 
was described as a supplement or was a supplement to an article from 2011. The repository, so the, the younger publication, of course, can add a link to the paper in the data publication. But once the paper is published and the PDF is archived, it is not possible to add the citation of the data to, a, to an existing and already published paper. To overcome this, this point, because in the, the history of, of publications, data publications came much later than paper publications, of course, we can use a, de um, a development from the Research Data Alliance, which calls Scolix. It's an interoperability framework for exactly exchanging these informations between links between papers and data. Um, it practically means that I include all the citations to papers in my metadata for the data publication. And when you write an article, the publisher makes sure that the full reference list is also included in the metadata. And then you can put everything into one, one portal and see when there's a new data citing a new paper, you can make the connection. And this, coming back to the slide before, there are some publishers, unfortunately it's only Elsevier, but um, Elsevier has already implemented an additional feature because once there is a new data, they have a little pop-up window on the paper landing page and highlight the data. So when you go to the paper, uh, to the paper, you see that there is data, even though the data was published afterwards. And this is really, really interesting. And I would like to finish with this. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kerstin. Uh, any questions or comments? Yes, Lola. Comment. Um, using the old seat yep. or uh, in the revision of papers, because the review process is a very, I mean, many of us invest a lot of time reviewing papers, mm -hmm. but it is uh, always anonymous. So yeah. nobody knows that you work on this review, but if you include the or the, your or ICD in mm -hmm. the review process, it will be registered that you yeah. how many work you invest in the review. Yeah, that's true. This, this is very interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then you need to be non-anonymous. I, I know that I'm I'm chief editor for a system science data, and because I have registered my orchid with Copernicus, every every statement and I found um, orchid notifications with some very short, okay, that's great, let's publish the paper. And I thought this is not worth publishing, but it does, it is really something, it's it's very good, but we need to be not anonymous, yeah. But orchid is good, it's really good if you maintain it. Um. Are raw and orchid connected to each other? Um, not directly. Orchid and raw have been developed by the same group of people. They are two different institutions. And of course, if you provide your orchid, uh, your 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 personal details, with um, with orchid, and you add your affiliation, then you can add your raw identifier, but because an institution and a person are different, different entities, we it's 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 not together. Does this answer your question? But as they are they are the same people who have been developed both of these identifiers, they make sure to make somehow the connection. Yes, ORCID allows the history of employment to be shown on multiple institutions. Yeah, that's that's you can you can add as many um, employments as you like until you finally get a permanent position. I'd say. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. And there is a Zenodo group for our DUI, GIGOS, GIGOS DUI working group. So if you 
expected some other things, you can go there and look at the presentation of UAW because then you can see the others. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Kasten. Uh, the last presentation of this session will be delivered by uh, sorry, uh, Jose. Jose and, uh, uh, about the Jigo Says 2023, hosted by IGN. Thank you. Good afternoon. So um, let me tell you first that you have nothing to fear with this uh, presentation because it's just uh, an announcement of the next party, the next. Uh, and uh, well, uh, take it as the zero call. Okay, this is the zero call for the next uh, Jigo's days. Uh, we are really proud to organize uh, uh, next Jigo's days uh, next year. Uh, more or less one year from now, because uh, we think that September is is a suitable uh, uh, month uh, for that, and we will be very glad uh, from your visit uh, if uh, we can meet together once again in in Jerez. Uh, I think we, I have no formula in between and no organization chart. I think in this uh, presentation. Uh, what is Jevis? Okay, Jevis is just in the middle of Spain, uh, just a little bit to the east. Jevis uh, is a small town with a small observatory uh, uh, inside. And this observatory is the observatory of Jevis that belongs to the National Geographic Institute of Spain. And this uh, that belongs to the Ministry of, of Transport, okay. The, uh, this morning, um, uh, Dr. Altamimi uh, reminded us that uh, the, the International Association of Geodesy has more than 160 years. And this is very good for me because uh, I can tell you that also that uh, more or less 150 years ago, our founder, uh, General Ibanez Rivero, was one of the first presidents of the, of the International Geodesy Union. Uh, he was a very important guy at, at that moment. So I can say that IGN Spain has a long tradition in geodesy also. And uh, his uh, activities with the meter in Iridium and Platinum distribution in Europe were, were, were very important. And during his press and under his presidency, uh, where was when uh, the, the International Association of Geodesy uh, got a global dimension with the accession of uh, countries like United States, uh, Argentina, Chile, or, or Japan. So, 100 years later, we started uh, our activities in Jeves Observatory, uh, first with uh, uh, radio astronomy. And then we expand to geodesy also. Uh, we, we have a big telescope, a 40 meter telescope that is also used for geodesy, but uh, we started with the very beginning of Vigos with the, the 13.2 meter te telescope with our activities in, in Genesis and uh, gravimetry with, with the superconductor and now with the SLR. Uh, as Esther explained, we are a technological development center of the IBS. Uh, Jeves is also the headquarter of, of uh, the RAEGE network and uh, will be the center base of, of this Gigo Cyber Atlantic affiliate. Well, talking about the, the, the party, talking about the feast, uh, well, how how uh, can you uh, go to Jeves? We have a nice airport in Madrid. So uh, first you have to go to, to, to the yes airport and then it is easy to, to, to uh, get public transport uh, to, to, to Guadalajara, that is the, the, the closest town uh, where you can stay at hotels. And, and then from Jeves to Guadalajara, uh, as mentioned there, you have more or less 20 minutes. 
and then uh, we will arrange uh, the transportation for anyone because okay of course you can stay in uh, in, this, in really small villages close to 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 Jeves, but uh, maybe it will be not so so interesting because you cannot go to madrid or, or, or things like that so we suggest that staying in guadalajara uh, could be the 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 best guadalajara is not really a very big town it's something like uh, less than 100,000 people uh, it's in, in in castilla la mancha that uh, probably you know from the from from uh, don quixote okay that is uh, uh, he roam uh, around the, 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 the this this region of castilla la mancha and uh well as, as i mentioned is the is the is the largest largest populated center uh, center uh, near uh, uh Jeves. and uh as i explained also it will take something like half an hour a little bit less uh, using our transport uh, important what will be the weather like at the moment in september okay. Okay. with with the climate change in one or knows but but now now it's it's se september should be still hot okay should be still hot um you can find 30 degrees but normally uh, we can expect something like 25 something like that okay and uh, well, for those that are not uh, from Europe, well, it, it is uh, the same the same time that here in in Germany. Well, that's part of the party. Okay, okay. What what you can do in Guadalajara? Okay, of course, at as everywhere there are excellent uh, uh, cuisine, and uh, the, as as those guys in Guadalajara, they are hard people. Uh, with the, the they have to resist the the cold weather in winter time and the hot weather in summer time okay they eat a lot and then they they can eat uh, this uh, the the most famous is the, this roast lamb okay uh, on or kid lamb what we call uh, cabrito okay uh, and uh, surely you you will have the the opportunity to to taste and also they are they they we have a a, a strong still uh, the, the the arabian people were there for 700 years so we have still something and uh, the the especially for the search uh, they are we, we are still following some of the the lesson learned you could say okay uh, well um, you can have if you have time you can visit uh, uh, a province that is full of 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 uh, castles from the Middle Ages, because Guadalajara was now is not really a very important city, but before uh, uh, some centuries ago was a really uh, an important one. Okay, uh, we will help you with the hotels, of course, and uh, there are some of them. We have. We have the opportunity this uh, last week. We hold, uh, we held the the the, the SLR uh, workshop, and uh, okay, we have some experience with that. With that, and, and and now we have learned a lot about the possibilities, the hotel possibilities in in uh, in Guadalajara. But there are also other options as i mentioned if you want to go cheaper the, the you can go to to the closest really small village is something to southern people is uh, orche uh, this it will be cheaper and if someone has some issues we can offer some grants to stay in our in our guest house in, but we have no we have only place for four or five people okay but this will we will announce during the next call and, and then you can ask and we will do our best uh, this is very preliminary agenda uh, we talk about two or three days something like that 
maybe two. Uh, and uh, from the 4th to 15th of September, this is still to be defined. I guess that now is not the moment to discuss about that, but but uh, we will come soon with a, with a, a proposal. The first day we can, of course, we can meet and we will have a social event that lasts, lasts today. And the second day we will meet and uh, we can visit the facilities at Jeves Observatory that is uh, nice to, to, to visit. Uh, well, the two pictures are about the recent SLR uh, meeting last week. And this is also from the last meeting. Okay, so just to remind you that the, the sessions uh, should be at the Jeves Observatory if we are still in, in this number, in this uh, between 30 and 40 people. If, if not, we can do in at other place, but close to Jeves. But if, if we are still in 30, 40, this is okay. I remind you once again that the transport from the hotels to Jeves Observatory, uh, as there is no public transport, or there is not so much public transport, we will arrange coffee breaks uh, and, and meals uh, will be at the observatory. And we will try to cover as many expenses as, as we can. And that's all. I hope to see you in Jeves next year. Okay, then uh, we can continue with the last session of the day. This session is dedicated to the GIGOS external activities and they summarize more or less uh, what we are doing with some um, external bodies relating to outreach and uh, external relations. The first presentation will be given by Martin about the GIGOS coordinating office. Yes, thank, you. thank you, Laura. Um, yes, I talk about the GIGOS coordinating office and the outreach and education activities of the last years. Uh, first, I uh, present the GIGOS strategic plan and I focus on one point uh, on the goal. There are um, altogether four goals and the uh, goal four um, concentrate on communication, education and outreach. So it's, it, it's exactly uh, this part, uh, which is also in response uh, of the GIGOS coordinating office. Um, in this goal, there are two objectives defined. The first is uh, objective 4.1, establish a strong internet and online presence. Um, and in this part, our uh, a uh, few things, a uh, well, lot of things have done in the last years. Uh, beginning in 2016, we started with the first uh, social media channel. It was Twitter at this time. Uh, now we have a little bit more. I will come on this uh, later. Uh, then we also uh, created and developed a new Chico's website in, published in December 2020. And also with this, uh, with, with this website, we also uh, started with the Chico's blog and therefore also the, the newsletter with the mailing list. Uh, on the second objectives, outreach uh, to the technical community and general society, uh, we are also doing a lot in the coordinating office. We also support uh, the Chico's sessions at workshops and conferences. 
Um, we also established in 2018 the manager of external relation. It's Alison Gweddock. She will give her presentation after mine. Uh, then also we one part is also the online uh, the online outreach to education and general interested um, audience. There's also the website one part, uh, especially with this easy and uh, easy, easy understandable descriptions, which we have done in the last years, and also the Chigos room. And in my presentation, I would like to go in a little bit uh, more details uh, about uh, these points. The first is the, the Chigos websites. Um, there are several things which are similar to the, um, the old websites, for example, the About Chigos page, so about the Chigos as uh, organization. Uh, then we have also an event part uh, there, um, and we also publish uh, their documents. Um, directly at the website or at the Chico's cloud. And the new thing is the Chico's blog to it's directly uh, visible at the start page uh, of the website, uh, but also with this uh, mailing list, the Chico's newsletter. This is a new part and we would like to inform people, the users about news, uh, about geodesy and of course Chico's and IAG. Um, but the main uh, big new thing on the website is uh, uh, that it serves now as information portal about the observing system. And this is can be separated in three parts, in the services part, in the observations part, and product part. And there we uh, uh, provide several easy understandable descriptions for the general audience. So not mainly for the geodesists, it's for the geoscientists, but also for the general uh, public. And uh, therefore, you've seen it also in other presentations before. Um, I don't want to go in, in much detail of this, but until now, we have 23 product descriptions um, at the websites. Uh, and we also plan to uh, update them regularly and add new, few, uh, new um, products, product description in future. Um, and you can see here also at the list the most visited uh, product descriptions uh, since publishing of them. So for example, the sea surface heights were visited 2,900 uh, times. Um, then we did this also for the observations. It's a little bit newer, but we have also now certain observation descriptions already also um, uh, about the novel observation types. So the uh, radio, uh, GNSS radio occultation, GNSS reflectometry, um, quantum gravimetry, and optical atomic locks with the descriptions. And you can see also the, the list of the most visited uh, descriptions. Yes, another point, of course, is the Chigas film. All of you know it. Uh, we did this uh, Chigas, we, we created and produced this Chigas film uh, in order to dis describe the geodesy and also Chigas and IIG a little bit more. So it's it's a little bit uh, parallel to the Chico's website. Um, and focus on the um, geodetic observation products and services from the of the IIG. It is available in two versions, in a long version, eight minutes, and a short version, one and a half minutes. Um, this is not in all languages, it's only in a few. And in general, it's very, it was very successful. We got a lot of a positive uh, reply uh, from a lot of people. They also want to see more videos uh, about Geodesy. Um, I will come to this a little bit later. And we see, we saw also um, a big uh, increasing of subscribers to the Chigus YouTube channel. And I would like to go in a little bit more detail about uh, the language version, versions. Uh, first, we produced it in uh, English, and we we had the idea to extend the range of this film to translate, translate it um, in some other languages to reach more people, the general society. And so we asked the uh, geodetic community uh, and who will volunteer and translate it and record it. And we were very surprised that so many people um, geodetic people uh, volunteered for it and stitched this. So we have until now nine uh, language versions available. You can see it here in the list. Um, and future language versions will also follow. So the, the Farsi Persian language uh, 
is ready. I have only have to merge it and then publish it. So it will be available uh, very soon. Uh, and then people also were uh, working on the Chinese version. And uh, two weeks ago, we got a, a request uh, to translate it to the Turkish language. Um, I would like also to go in a little bit detail about the numbers. Uh, in total, we, we have 10,000, more than 10,000 uh, views of the video altogether over all language versions. And the red marked are these languages which are, are in comparison to the speakers are uh, very successful. Of course, English, uh, Spanish, also German and Japanese. And I uh, would also highlight the Bulgarian language um, that we have only 8 million speakers worldwide. And in comparison to the speakers, a uh, really huge number of um, visitors. And I'm sure this is uh, due to that uh, this uh, video was um, uh, distributed a lot in social media and also with other colleagues. So I also ask all of you and, and to, to distribute it and send it to colleagues and also in social media networks uh, to get more responses, more visited to this video, that more people are, um, know what Chigos, what IIG, what Geodesy is. Um, yes, then social media is a good point. I will go down a little bit more detail. I've mentioned it also before. Uh, Chigos um, has, or together has, say, has uh, five uh, social media channels. Uh, so from LinkedIn, uh, from Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, YouTube, Facebook, and also I count uh, the Chigos newsletters or the Chigos blog to uh, social media. And the, in the graphic, uh, you can see uh, the time span of one year. So it's uh, October last year to now, and you see here the uh, count of um, uh, followers or subscribers to these uh, social media accounts. So especially you can see here, yes, the Twitter account is the oldest. That's I think the reason why so many uh, subscribers are here since 2016. The others started in the last uh, years. And we see an in, a very big increase in all um, social media channels. Especially, or, uh, um, especially also here in the at the YouTube, um, regarding the film, of course, um, but also uh, LinkedIn is very successful, and it's uh, the, the it, it's more increasing now. Yes, so a short overview about this part. But I also want to go in a little bit more detail about the statistics of uh, of the website. Um, we have altogether uh, ninety two. Uh, thousand visits over the last two years and the visit duration of each visitor is about three minutes in average um, and the daily visits uh, over time or the daily visits are over the two years uh, 130 visitors per day and it but it's increasing um, uh, because in the beginning we had here about 50 visitors it was you can see here the timeline in 2020, we started with the website, 50 visitors to until now, in average, so 218 visitors. And you can also see here um, some peaks in this graphic of the visitors. So each point is each, uh, it, 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 it's a day of um, these two years. And for example, at uh, conferences of Chigos, there were some peaks, but also here um, from where we started the Chigos survey, strategic planning survey is also a little bit peak, um, but you can also see here that the Chigas film was published and there is an average, it was before 130 and then 180 uh, visitors per day. So uh, all these uh, things, what we're doing in social media with the film uh, has an impact also on the uh, visitors of the website. Yes, a short statistic about uh, the visitors, uh, the most visiting the website at, at 11 a.m. or 3 p.m. and on Wednesday, for example. And if we go in a little bit more detail um, of the regions and the countries, um, the majority, or yes, this, the majority of the people come from Europe, then also from Asia, North America, and South America. And you can see also here this, this top 10 regions over the last two years. Okay, and then it's also very interesting, where does the people come to the website? 
and the majority of the people uh, come from uh, search engines like Google. <laughs> uh, and then the second one is uh, uh, directly typing tigers.org uh, or coming uh, directly from the browser. And then a small part from other links from other websites and social media. Um, yes, this, and this the search engine part is uh, increasing a little bit. And from this small part from the social media of also small graphic, so it's it's from each uh, social media uh, channel. Uh, so it's it's uh, very good distributed over all uh, social media, but it's also changing over time. But it's also it, it, it's only a very small amount. It's one percent of the people they come from uh, social media accounts to directly to the websites. Yes, in future, we also would like to create further value um, for, to, for the general society, for the two scientists and also for the two artists. Um, in the near term, so in the next months and half a year, we would like to uh, publish further um, versions, language versions of the Discover Chicas film. Um, then also add, for example, here the inside description um of the observation descriptions um and also we are working now on a video about terrestrial reference frames it's a reviewing process and then we would like to start the the video um yes and in the medium term in general we would like to extend and update the descriptions of the products and observations um create further videos um in cooperation with with the people the the experts in these fields um, and for the future it could be also possible to hold uh, workshops maybe virtual to also reach out to uh, people um, outside of of the uh, developed countries maybe to other countries to have to, to bring the possibility to, uh, to participate uh, to, to participate and uh, um, yes to, to inform the people about uh, recent developments in geodesy and in long term, yes, of course, we would like to grow uh, the number of uh, visitors, followers, and the subscribers at the website and social media. And also a long term project is the Chigos portal. Um, but uh, there I would um, say a little bit more in my second presentation. It's the last of this session um, because it's a lot of things to say. <laughs> and I divide it into two presentations. Yes, thank you for your attention. Uh, are there questions or comments? Thank you, Martin. And I personally thank you, you personally, because you did a lot for outreach and communication. I want to put on the table some suggestions for the future because uh, uh, within the IAG, we have the outreach and communication branch. And uh, I don't know the situation of nomination because we are in the period of nominations for the different positions within the IAG. Uh, the current one, they have limited the resources. And in order to go in the direction of unifying all these activities and avoid overlap and uh, great effort and i again thank you for all what you did is there a possibility to think about merging both in terms of outreach and communication you don't need to answer now mm -hmm. it's just for the <laughs> strategy document that or uh, the workshop that we we, we will organize with the next speaker thank you thank you mm -hmm. um, there is a comment on the chat from chile Oh. You cannot see it. <laughs> oh. Okay, you are uh, there. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I, I think I don't know this video. <laughs> but it was. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, something else? 
another comment? If not, we can move to the next presentation. It we will be given by Alison, uh, GIGOS External Relations. All right, hey everybody. It's nice to see so many people and hi to everybody online. Um, okay, so external relations update. And this is actually timely because we're talking about the GGRF and the UN and this is actually from our meeting in August. All right, so just a little overview of why we have GIGOS outreach and external relations and that we're working toward proactive engagement with the broader Earth observations community, advocating for interoperable, discoverable, and openly available geospatial data, promoting infrastructure development, identifying tangible contributions to the UN Sustainable Development Goals and the Sendai Framework, as well as working with our external partners in capacity building and develop initiatives. And all of this to ensure that geodesy is visible, valued, and a sustainable worldwide asset. So how do we do that from the perspective of GIGOS external relations? Uh, it's kind of a three pronged approach, uh, advocacy, visibility, and collaboration. And so a lot of this we've talked about that that advocacy element and making geodesy more visible and how do we make sure that we collaborate instead of uh, duplicate things to, in order to make the most of our resources. And so advocacy, and this is in our, through the lens of our work with these external organizations. So we've had a lot of work over the last few years uh, developing our presence in the Group on Earth Observations, as was brought up a little bit earlier, and I'll go into some, some greater detail. The community, the Committee on Earth Observation Satellites, and of course, the UNGGIM Subcommittee on Geodesy. And then finally, uh, some experimental uh, work with the, IT the ITU. So with regards to the Group on Earth Observations, uh, GIGOS is there on behalf of the International Association of Geodesy. So if we were to talk in terms of hats that are being worn, uh, the IAG is represented in the Group on Earth Observations. And that has historically been represented by people who are involved in, in GIGOS. And so uh, GIGOS is representing the IAG on the GEO program board. Uh, we are also participating in their executive committee. And part of that is to ensure that within all these discussions of all these different earth observation technologies, that people are routinely reminded of the geodesy that fundamentally un underpins the usefulness of these Earth observations, uh, data, and products. And we've also been uh, participating in the GEO working groups on disaster risk reduction, capacity development, climate change, and open data policies. And I would say in all of these, if you or someone you know would like to be more, more involved or have introductions to these organizations, um, please come to me, come to, to Martin. Uh, we are here to help coordinate those those uh, facilitations. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot be everywhere all at once. So if there are more people who want to be involved in the, the external relations, especially with these organizations or their working groups, you know, we really encourage it and we'll do whatever we can to try to make that a, a fruitful endeavor. Uh, we've continued to have the Geodesy for Sendai group within the group on Earth observations. And I'll go into a little bit more detail on this uh, later on. Uh, we have been working with the Committee on Earth Observation Satellites, and that, switching off of our, taking our IAG hat off, that's actually where GIGOS is representing GIGOS uh, at the, at, in the CIOS uh, sphere. And Richard has been covering a lot of that uh, recently. Uh, and then within the UNGGM Subcommittee on Geodesy, you know, we're trying to make sure that we are um, representing not only is supporting the IAG presence, but also in our diverse member states. As Zuhair pointed out, uh, there, he's there sometimes on behalf of IAG and sometimes also as France. So we, uh, we all try to make sure that we have the right hats and 
I'm very tempted actually to have some hats made because sometimes it's not exactly clear which hat is going on at which time. Okay, so diving into this a little bit deeper. Would you like to get involved in any of these external relations activities? And think about, do you not all have to answer the question at once? Just take it home, think about it. How can our connections to external organizations help you communicate your science? And what gaps or needs could our external partners help to address or fill? And so I was actually taking some notes during the session there earlier today. And I thought that we could do a little bit of a dive into two of these organizations. So some questions were brought up about the group on Earth observations. And just thinking about what we've already seen, there's a great possibility for us to link mountain glacier monitoring with the Geo Mountains Initiative. Um, I could say that actually the, the director of that just tweeted a couple of minutes ago that at uh, COP27, which is the UN Conference on Climate Change taking place in, in Egypt last week, uh, they just included a key draft decision recommended uh, by the, let's see, it's the Scientific and Technical Technological Advice Subsidiary Body, which is a, <laughs> I won't go into the, the details, but uh, so anyway, we have people who are connected with the IP, IPCC. And so if you're interested in having this work that's going on in mountain regions, in geodetic applications in mountain regions, that we can find a way to connect this aspect of geodesy to other technologies, other earth observations work that are going on in these regions and to make sure that people who are maybe studying the, the shape and the state of glaciers can be sure to know that there are geodetic resources, that there are new applications of geodesy that they can make sure that they include in their, in their transdisciplinary research. Uh, again, looking back at what our relationship with GEO can do for GEGOS, we could use it to essentially link gravimetry grim, applications for sea level and climate applications. And as I said, increase the visibility of geodesy in major uh, international panel on climate change and other reports. A lot of this can be where we have the opportunity to make sure that if you do a word search on a PDF file in a major report about climate change or disasters, that this is how we can make sure that if you type in geodesy that something comes up. There are a lot of these reports where you could, it's a 400 page document talking all about climate change and not one word, not once does the word geodesy come up and and this is how we can try to, to uh, try to help that out. Uh, within the Committee on Earth Observation Satellites, uh, this is something that is sometimes called the satellite arm of GEO. And so they really do work uh, in close collaboration a lot of times. We participate in the CIOS Working Group on Disasters. And so if you're interested in, in disaster risk reduction applications, this is something that, that your work could find a way to be more visible in, in among other Earth observation satellites. There are opportunities to link GIGOS work on gravimetry for flood monitoring. They have an entire uh, pilot project on flooding and how to use Earth observation uh, techniques to better understand it and mitigate risk. And as I said, to link geodesy capacity development with other satellite observations, there are some collective efforts being led by CIOS uh, in collaboration with GEO to create kind of communities of practice within capacity development, uh, to reach out to have more people be interested or even aware of geodesy and potentially uh, even get some more uh, early career people and to make sure that our work is sustainable. So in collaboration, speaking of capacity development, we have been involved in a, a number of capacity related capacity development and activities. As we mentioned in the subcommittee on geodesy via both our member states and our IAG participation. Uh, th through the UN Office of Outer Space Affairs International Committee on GNSS. And this is something that it, we're involved both via the IAG representation, uh, the IGS has its own representation there and as well as our colleagues at the International Federation of Surveyors. 
Uh, the group on Earth Observations has a working group on a capacity development uh, that uh, we're actually co-chairing and working towards transitioning this into a community of practice to have capacity development resources for capacity developers in addition to having traditional capacity development uh, aspects. Uh, again, with CIOS, there's a complementary working group on capacity building and, and data democracy. And with the International Federation of Surveyors, as I mentioned, we do uh, interact with them a lot, especially via the GNSS interests. And they have a Asia, Asia Pacific Capacity Development Network that uh, Mia Harasan and, and many of others have, have been very strong in supporting uh, uh, GIGOS contributions. And also recently, we've gotten a bit more involved in their reference frames and practice seminars. And that's something that they hold usually a couple of days before their major annual meeting. And it's a time when a lot of people can come in to educate uh, surveyors and the surveying community about what, are, what is a reference frame? Why would it be useful to you? What, what are potential ways of including use of reference frames in modern surveying practice? And so it's, it's good that we're trying to make sure that we stay in contact with our friends in these other organizations and when there are when there are good moments you know find a way to inject geodesy into major reports or opportunities to have uh, joint outreach efforts with them and so just looking at how this works out in visibility through some of these organizations we can get contacts to make sure that papers featuring geodesy are included in major uh, publications. Uh, for example, the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction's Global Assessment Report on Disaster Risk Reduction. Uh, we've had papers uh, that were featuring on use of geodesy for tsunami early warning, as well as a novel applications of geodesy for uh, multidisciplinary air quality monitoring. Uh, we've had some of the tsunami early warning work from the Geohazards Focus Group uh, included in the Geo Highlights Report. Uh, as well as some of our uh, experimental work with the International Telecommunications Union on using artificial intelligence for uh, geodetic data processing, and that was featured in uh, the World Meteorological Organization's bulletin. And so diving a bit into how working with uh, the group on Earth observations could potentially benefit us, as I've noted, we have this geodesy for the Sendai framework. It used to be called a community activity, and I believe now it's officially referred to as a pilot initiative. And so this is our, our home within GEO to support all aspects of geodesy as we want to make sure that it is visible to and available to the rest of the Earth Observations community. And this, think of this as, as your, your potential place to come. If you want to be involved in GEO, this is here for you. And we've been using this as, as a way to make sure that both the policy and the advocacy and the communications that are being done by GEO are also uh, having a way to connect into a lot of the scientific work that's being accomplished uh, here within GIGOS and in the broader geodesy community. Again, if you would like to join, please send me an email, pull me aside at a coffee break. This, is, this should be something that is seen as a resource for our whole community. And so moving forward, we want to make sure that our external relations continue to support the establishment of the future UN Global Geodetic Center of Excellence. And Jan will be talking about this right after I uh, step down. Uh, engaging in new opportunities to enable and diversify geodesy's contributions to natural hazards and disaster risk reduction and this is through all sorts of novel combinations of the organizations that we work with and the people we get to know in there. And of course, uh, trying to make sure that we track the geodetic indicators to UN Sustainable Development Goals. These are things that help us uh, increase visibility by communicating the value of geodesy in a way that is a bit more approachable to policymakers or, or decision makers. Uh, and with that, Thank you. Here's my email. If you want to be involved in anything in external relations, if any of the regional affiliates would like to send a liaison to be a, a regional external relations representative, I, I wish I could be everywhere all at once, but it's really wonderful when we can have 
more people involved in this. Uh, so, yeah, thank you. Any questions or comments? What about COSPA, the Committee on Space Research? IHG used to have very, very, very close connection to COSPA. Um, I have not been involved in it as of yet. Um, Zuhair, perhaps is there somebody else from IAG who is representing that? Well, Chairman, you know that it is done through Commission 1, which is similar, I mean, identical to Subcommission B1 of COSPA. So they have uh, actually the COSPA in uh, Athen where Commission 1 had uh, a session on, on it. So that, that is ensured via IAG. One. Yeah, but I don't think that it is not totally similar because GEO is more in the political side, whereas uh, COSPAR you have technical committees, subcommissions, etc. So yeah. it's, it's a bit different. So I, I think it's a really good point, and I, and I guess I should clarify that a lot of our external relations that I'm talking about are, as as you here pointed out, more of our bridge to the political sphere, and and really pushing that advocacy element. But yes, COSPAR is it. It would be good for us, and and this is getting back to our need to make sure that that you know we we go hand in hand with all of the other work being done by the IAG. That uh, I will take an action to. Mm -hmm to reach out and make sure that I at least know who has uh, been working with COSPAR on behalf of IG so that we can we can make sure that we collaborate on things in the future. Uh, I would add also that from my side, I mean that uh, what you call the external relation that you are needing is very important on the political side. And I am happy to see that you are open to ask others to join you because more people you have in these spheres it's better for us, for our community. And of course, we have to minimize uh, duplication uh, of effort, etc. And we have to ensure the future because we might decide one day to stop doing that. So we have, I don't know. <laughs> well, I think it's always good to have friends who who collaborate on things. I have a question in this regard. To, to participate in, in this kind of meetings, one has to be part of a national delegation or one needs a special invitation or, uh, or how is it? I think it, it depends. I know that like, for example, the GEO program board is limited to the people who are designated the representatives of those member states or organizations. And it's kind of a, a similar uh, way to how like the UNGGIM structures its meeting. But um, so, going to the geo program board that's usually limited to the people who are the designated representatives but um you look at the, the working groups on disaster risk reduction uh, capacity development climate change open data those are all things that if you're interested um we as the iag representatives can nominate someone to participate on behalf of the organization so it, it is it is open i think that they just try to kind of keep it a bit organized in terms of um, keeping track of who's representing what uh, sometimes, but the, the, especially for um, like the geodesy for Sendai, that is uh, completely open to anybody in geodesy who has any interest in being involved in this. Uh, the CIOS work, I think, is uh, similar, similarly structured to GEO, uh, where uh, we would uh, call up the, the equivalent of the CIOS coordinating office and and say that we would like to send some representatives on behalf of uh, IAG or GIGOS in CIOS it's, it's actually GIGOS so um yeah because you participated in the last geo week because it mm -hmm. was last week and and you attended as um IUG representative IUG can say I sent five people or I think so. I think so yeah I, I think especially Geo Week, that's that's pretty open. Yeah. It's in it's in Spain next year. Everybody can come. <laughs> oh, okay. 
is similar for you and GGIM. If next year at the 13th session, mm -hmm. people want to join from IAG, I will be happy to add yeah. them. No problem. I think it's just a matter of, please let us know if you're interested and, and so we will do whatever we can. For figure. instance, for this year, we had a delegation, President, Vice President, and Secretary General. Although they have also the hat of their own countries, but for IAG, mm -hmm. you can open that to more people. No problem. Absolutely. And I, I would say, you know, thinking about like geo working groups, uh, if you're involved in things that have applications to climate change or disasters, uh, this is a great place to go and meet other people who are working in other branches of Earth observations and also to leverage the, the resources that GEO might be able to provide in terms of uh, connections or opportunities to collaborate on interdisciplinary papers or communications options. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of really great work and, and it's really inspiring to see all of these really interesting applications that are great tools in communicating the value of geodesy in ways that we didn't really expect it to be uh, a, a non, an unexpected benefit. So, um, yeah. Okay, something else? If not, we have now the contribution of Jan about the UNGGIN subcommittee on geodesy and the Global Geodetic Center of Excellence. So good afternoon from my side. <coughs> my name is Jan Dostal. I come from BKG. <coughs> the title is the United no, is this the wrong? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Can't you hear me? Yeah, fine. Okay. <clears throat> the topic I will talk about is about the new Global Geodetic Center of Excellence and about the history, how they came. And I will say that I give the presentation on behalf of not just of the subcommittee on geodesy, but on on behalf of all who will be uh, involved from the spark or from the beginning uh, through the formal establishment of, of this uh, of this uh, center, how has been by Harald announced or that the center has been formal uh, established uh, one or two weeks uh, ago. <clears throat> and the three topics are the global geodetic uh, reference frame. The next one is the uh, subcommittee on geodesy and then as a new player this is the global geodetic center of excellence this is the keywords we will work through at first i will like to read the, the definition the global geodetic reference frame is the authoritative reliable high accuracy and global spatial referencing infrastructure the ggrf includes the celestial and terrestrial reference frame products the infrastructure used to create it and the data analysis and product generation systems. The GGRF also includes a gravimetric observation, product and height system, which underpin measurements of elevation. Then when I read the concept on the, on the center, then I found the centers, the GGRF is at the core of many societal and scientific application, but it mostly unseen, ignored, unappreciated and under-resourced. And then I add the sentence mainly, <clears throat> probably mainly because the society takes it as granted. And this is also the reason what, what Edison were talking about, that it is not referenced and this is not granted. Somebody has to do this. And this has been recognized <clears throat> so that the UNGGIM, that there has been her adopted UNGGIM resolution 2015 uh, to her already mentioned it in the morning on the global geodetic reference frame for sustainable development. It is the first GGRF geoscience related resolution and the main goals of the resolution is to establishing an authoritative, reliable, high accurate and global geospatial referencing infrastructure, support the collection, integration and utilization of all other geospatial, geospatial data and improve earth observation and positioning. 
The GGRF is fundamental for monitoring changes to the Earth, including the continents, ice caps, ocean, and the atmosphere. It is also fundamental for mapping, navigation, and universal timing. And with the time, the geodesy or the reference frame is used for more, even more and more application in the society, and it should be emphasized. <laughs> There are many players who are involved, and in the talk of Alison, from Alison, we, we heard also some some who applies to GGRF, and they are also interesting. There are interesting groups, and one of the most important are the member state, and the GGCE is an institution on the level of UN. That means it, uh, it is a representation on the member states level. <laughs> they build, they build or, or, or finance the main geodetic infrastructure. The, another another point this is the, they are the expert that means the uh, people mostly the people from the international association of geodesy iag or gigos as part of iag who care for the operation service and deliver the geodetic product the next one uh, which is what they mentioned directly here this is uh, fig i see fig somebody uh, like somebody who is the user or applicant and can even 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 held by education, training, or capacity building. And then the United, United Nations uh, itself, where the center is, the, is placed and help the work uh, to help the support the member states. So to continue or go on, 2016, the UNGGIM Committee of Experts established a permanent subcommittee on geodesy and the main task of the SCOG as the development uh, of the roadmap and the GGRF implementation plan addressing the five focus areas. The one is the governments, who sh uh, what should care for the, for the coordination. Then the geodetic infrastructure. The next point of third focus area is the policies, standards, and conventions. The next one is education, training, and capacity building. And the fifth one, this is the communication and outreach. And it is, it is for me, it was uh, actually no wonder that when I compared the strategic plan of GIGOS and, and see these five focus area, they are quite similar. And this is not by, by chance. In the next step, the subcommittee on geodesy was tasked to develop the position paper on sustaining the GGRF. There, there is the topic, the GGRF, to describe the current state and future requirements on the GGRF, because we don't start by zero, the GGRF is already here, is functioning, but uh, maybe not tell that well known for the bright public and therefore the problems here. Uh, introduces a range of work packages for each of the five focus area and introduce the potential and role of the Global Geodetic Center of Excellence. And there, there is in this paper and in the next one, the concept paper, there is where the ID um, get a little bit more shape because the concept paper on establishing the geodetic, the global geodetic center of excellence described the potential and envisaged task, task of, the G, of the GGCE. Both these reference documents has been submitted to the UNGGIM uh, Committee of Experts at its 10th uh, session in 2020. And at the bottom, I add the, the link. You can find them, you can read them, look what they what they what they done the task of the global geodetic center of excellence <clears throat> are tailored to the five focus areas against the enhanced global cooperation and coordination strengthen the geodetic infrastructure assist member states in line with standards policy and conventions support education training and capacity building and improve communication and raise awareness that means these five points are again the focus area similar to the, to, the, to the goals of GIGOS and goals of the GGRF positioning paper. Going further, <coughs> the German um, applied uh, the host, this center, and the offer of the German Federation government was accepted and supported in 2020. And the uh, Center will be placed on the UN campus in Bonn. I myself were there already to look how the offices will, will look like and to introduce this there, the center. 
The finance, the finance is will be by the host country, which is Germany, and especially the BKG uh, office. Uh, additionally, there will be some uh, will be support by virtual segment by Norway, and uh, GGCE will be have, will have two bodies: the steering committee, uh, which oversee the yeah the activity. And the technical advisory committee, and in this te in this uh, technical advisory committee, will be different different um, groups represented. This is the SCOG on the member states level, IAG, FIG, maybe space agency, and what is missing here, the regional UNGGIM committees. <clears throat> here we see uh, the initial. Initial G, uh, the initial state of the GGCE is equivalent to seven full-time equivalent. Four of them are directly financed by UN. Then there are two segments from Germany, and it is intended that I'm one of them. And here already is the virtual segment from Norway. And I can encourage everybody who would like to participate to take an influence to work with us, <clears throat> the member states that they also uh, use the possibility to send a segment or with the virtual segment so that it rise and the member states have a directly um, the influence on the or influence can work and see what is what is uh, what will be done or uh, how it is going on. <clears throat> so now the GGCE is written guardian of the GGRF. This is um, even how I see it. This is the main task. We have the status for the maintenance of GGRF so far is done by IAG or the member states who are financing them and other on the best effort basis. And in my opinion, the former definition of GGRF is, is the abstract because when I learned the topic and I, I read all the papers of the definition and say, oh, it's nice, I understand what is, uh, what is mean by that, but uh, my problem is if I say where I should start. What is in, on technical level the GGRF? What comprises the GGRF? And such question there will be a little bit more for the strategic strategic uh, workshop we have. And the idea is that uh, we need some GGRF association or affiliation so that we are um, creating some, I, I will call it the critical mass, that we are very really something what we can grab, that we need the identification of stakeholders on the GGRF, that we, when we have it, then make some inventory of the GGRF components and also other things addressing the needs or the, the gaps. And what is very important, this is for me, it's the labeling of the components belonging to GGRF uh, and creating the visibility for the member state and for the decision makers, some kind of GGRF stem. The point is when, we, when the sender shall address the politician they have to say what it is about and if they say this is just a geodesy and this is the science in my opinion it's not not enough they say we are caring for the reference frame and the reference frame is really uh, necessary for the society so then there is integration the ggc and gdif initiatives are supported by the professional community that means we should come together and work work together so how the GGC may support the GGRF. One of the ID is uh, some indicators or the quality management. In the previous slide, I showed you, yeah, okay, some critical mass. And then therefore we need uh, quality management. Next to the quality management, some key performance indicator like latency, accuracy, reliability, robustness, redundancy. There has been some ideas or as working done on the G uh, on the GIGOS about the essential geodetic variables, and I think the GGC uh, shall support it and, and accompany this ID uh, together with IAG, SEOG, and and other players. <clears throat> Maybe some uh, quality management certification as a condition for agreement. Uh, for, for the different agreements with GGCE that there is where they assure the quality by the contributors and maybe uh, enables the derivation of GGRF health indicators. And it helps us then 
address the decision makers and um, support the sustainability of the DGRF. There is a, another possibly task of the, of the GGC as example, uh, and it is uh, MOUs or agreements with the GGCE or uh, enabled through GGCE. It will, it will facilitate the collaboration between the member state or the nation institutions. And as example, there is given the BKG and to the Vienna have an MOU to collaborate on VLBI correlation and VAV. There's also Austrian mapping agency is interested to become a partner of this MOU as well. Or for example, the trust fund, the GGCE will uh, have a trust fund where every nation can, can donate small or large amount of money and uh, the joint projects like, I don't know, will be telescope or correlator can be or partially financed through the finance trust. So what's next? The formal establishment of GGCE is almost outdated, but I let it there. Agreement, note where, uh, agreements, note where bars, offices and the UN campus is ongoing. There is also an anecdote about uh, signing the agreement. The point is the agreement is signed, <laughs> but there are no, uh, but um, the German government signed a sheet of paper and uh, in New York, they signed also one a sheet of paper, but the signature, both of the signature are still not on one sheet of the paper because the from German government sign agreement is somewhere on a ship. <laughs> Uh, towards uh, New York, but that we can proceed, that we also can sp spend the money which uh, we have to spend this year, we helped, it, uh, we helped us to do it a different way. Okay, then there we have a formal establishment as was the agreement, there is the appointment of the head of the GGE, GGC and UN staff, there are the four persons, at first the head will be appointed, but uh, even there, you cannot appoint a head until the, 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 the money is not transferred to the UN. Then there are the integration of the second men's Germany to Norway or others. Negotiation between the Germany and UN began in autumn, yet yeah, this is right, uh, from the past and uh, formal establishment by signing of the agreement between UN and UN took place in November 22. So the next point will be also elaborate the geodetic development plan or also the work plan for the center and uh, make in the work plan, for example, the prioritiz prioritization, where are the gaps or what should be achieved in the next steps, depending on the available resources. And we are at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Are there questions or comments? It's just a, a comment. I think uh, the main problem will be to find donors, to find donors to contribute to the GGCE because the money that Germany will put on the table will be just to finance the staff. Yeah. And then to make priority list of things to do then we really need the GGCE to put in place some mechanism to attract donors and stakeholders. That's the, the main critical point for the GGCE, which I don't have a clear vision how this will operate. So I am saying that it is just a, uh, a kind of warning because we need really to have kind of attractive approach in order to attract member states and others to contribute to that. And in terms of the priority list of things to do, we started by actually asking the services within the IAG what are their needs, etc. And of course, they have many things where many things that they want to, uh, to have, but the GGCE will not be able to satisfy all all the needs, so we have to have a kind of priority list, and this should be worked out with the services who are producing the product. 
So we still have a lot of work to do in preparation for the DGCE to start functioning. Maybe at this point yet, now there are money just for the operation of the center, mm -hmm. but uh, at this point I would em emphasize the, uh, the promoting uh, something like the GGRF label so that the GGCE can address the politician because they are talking about, uh, about something which is really here. Outreach and communication component because we have to educate outside that geodesy is fundamental for society and we need to use this a language that is understandable by others and to attract them to contribute to that. And it is not easy. I am I will not be able to communicate uh, because I don't have the communication skills. So you need to have people to do that. And we have experts on the domain of communications and how to communicate the necessity of geodesy for society. But the, the subcommittee of geodesy, the subcommittee of geodesy has a communication and outreach yeah. working group. Yeah, this is will be the uh, 0 0.5 FTE, I think, second month from Norway, right? Second, yeah, they are yeah. really um, strong in the in the outreach. Uh, for those working. who know the uh, Norway delegation, it is Anne Jurgensen. She is doing a lot in terms of communication, and I think Martin is in uh, uh, coordination with her and also with the the uh, branch, uh, the uh, communication and outreach branch of IAG. We need to put something uh, to try to think about unifying all these things because it is for geodesy, for global geodesy. We have different parts in different uh, entities. And one thing would be nice to see how we can put all these efforts together and to be more efficient for the outside in terms of a global geodesy. And the people are the same. Um, something else? Uh, if not, we can continue with the next presentation. Martin, please. Okay. Yes, I have the pleasure to present the last presentation of the day. Um, and I think it's a very important topic. Um, it's the Chigas portal. This uh, topic is not new. It's 15 years old or maybe a little bit longer. Um, but it's a, a, a big task of Chigas. And I would like to go in de more detail of, uh, um, about this, but I also want to show a little bit uh, so, uh, a short introduction about metadata, because the Chicas portal is or should be a metadata platform. So the question is, what is metadata? It was also um, focused a little bit uh, by Kirsten Elger, uh, the presentation before. Uh, metadata is data that provides information about other data. So it's not the data itself. And I found this very interesting graphic, which describes it a little bit. So the data is the treasury there. And the metadata, in this case, is the map where you can find the way, for example, or description where this uh, um, treasury is. And what is metadata exactly? For example, for geodetic data, you can find here, it, it's from a presentation 15 years ago. I took it uh, directly. It's from Doris data cycle, it's geodetic uh, data. And there, the metadata describes, for example, there is the title, an abstract, uh, a status, um, a creation dates, and also a linkage uh, where you can find the original data. Um, but if you're using metadata, you also have to consider standards, and there are standards. Um, the metadata standards are necessary for interoperable and interdisciplinary research. 
and therefore is, for example, the ISO standards, uh, which is widely used for geographic information, ISO standards. Uh, you can see it here, ISO 19115 for metadata definition. And also there's a definition of uh, services and data exchange. Um, and I would like to go a little bit more detail about the data exchange uh, because it's also very important that it's not only uh, machine readable, it should also be human readable. And one solution could be the XML format. Um, it's extensible markup language, um, uh, but it's fulfilling not all the needs of the geographic or ge geodetic community. And therefore uh, a, an extension was established. It's the geographic markup language, GML, to add further ge geospatial features, which are which set of um, primitive geospatial objects like the geometry and uh, coordinates. Um, and for the geodesy, the geodesy, geodesy ML was um, established um, as an extension of the GML and to which describes also further geodetic information. In this case, it's usable, for example, for geodetic stations uh, where you have fields of this uh, metadata for the antenna, for the receiver, cable adjustments. If, if you don't have this, you have to only write it in a common field. So, and but that's, that's not uh, really suitable for, for all um, tasks. Okay, that was a short intro introduction about the metadata. Now I would like to come to the idea of the Chico's portal. I said it's not new, it was it's 15 years ago and there uh, was a def um, uh, definition um, produced. Uh, the Chico's portal is a unique access point for all data, products, information, relevant in the framework of GIGOS for Earth science and application. And there was also a graphic in the presentation 15 years ago um, by Bernd Richter and Kerry Noll at the Unified Analysis Workshop it was presented. Um, it says now users get lost in mountains of information. And this is also the case now. So on similar like uh, 15 years ago. So the user um, has known there are a lot of uh, services and projects and data anywhere, but they don't know how to find this data or what data is available. And they were confused and desperate, desperate. And the solution in this vision should be the Geos portal um, to have a one-stop shop where the user can find uh, all the in this case, metadata, not the data itself, as a metadata platform where, where the user can easily search uh, the, meta, the, the data for the data and see all the metadata of it. Maybe also by a search uh, um, overview or by a map or something like this. So it should provide their, um, the, the metadata of geodetic station information, observation data and product data. And the user should be on the one hand side, uh, the data provider, uh, the IHG services and other authorized non IHG institutions and data consuming users. That's the, the main goal to, to serve them. Yes, I said that uh, it was started 15 years ago and I would like to go a little bit in more detail about the history. I found, I've made a re research in the last months uh, and found a few things about this, mainly from the Unified Analysis Workshop. Um, it started in 2007 that the Unified, Unified Analysis Workshop, the idea was presented and they developed also a position paper about the GIGAS portal and the metadata flow. And in 2009, um, there was also the Chigas book published uh, with their own chapter about this Chigas portal. And they also developed there at the BKG uh, a first version or prototype of this Chigas portal. You can see it on the right side here. And also a, a graphic uh, how it should work. And also in this year, um, the Chigas working group on data and information system, short term DIS was established uh, to find a uh, metadata schema for which, which should be suitable for all um, IG data and products. Yes. Then in 2011, there was a new or uh, updated uh, prototype uh, presented. It was based on the GeoNetwork software. 
and it was also available at the own domain at chicos-portal.org, also hosted by the PKG. Um, and they provided also some test data. And there at the Unified Analysis Workshop, they also um, ask or wanted to encourage the IHG services to contribute uh, with five main products to present them there, um, and then in further steps to present also other data and products. But in this year or in this next year, 2012, um, the developments of the Chico's portal stopped, unfortunately, uh, because, of, because also Bernd Richter was very active there and uh, he changed the position. And yes, they, no, nobody else uh, wanted to do this uh, further. And yes, that's the end of this prototype. In, uh, yes, the, the Chico's working group on DIS was um, transformed to a Chico's committee on DIS. And they, it, it worked further. Uh, um, I think also Bernd Richter was active there together with Kerry Noll. And they, they provided the first version of a metadata schema. Uh, they worked also together with the IIG services. Um, but I found no document available um, from there. And also I contacted and uh, um, in, in indirectly uh, Kerry Noll and wanted to, to um, uh, contact Bernd Richter because both are retired uh, now. And, but I could not find something, some out, outcome of this working group. Maybe you have some <laughs> solution where I can find it. And yes, up to now, there's, there are no further developments in this committee. I also had contact with Nick Brown, who is now the chair, but he did uh, nothing in the last years about this. Yes, in 2016 and 17, the uh, Geos Coordinating Office was transferred from the BKG to the BEV. Um, and we tried to redevelop this. It's there, but this attempt uh, was not successful. And also there were a lot of changes in the head of the Coordinating Office. And then I tried to uh, focus more on the Geos website. But now we have finished the Chico's website and uh, would lo uh, we, would, would look, we, we would like to go to the next uh, point to the Chico's portal and revive, revive the idea of it. Uh, we had also a discussion um, in May in Munich also um, at the Chico's Dach um, uh, meeting. And there was a lot of uh, positive feedback uh, by the community that this is necessary and we should have such a portal. And therefore, yes, I made the research and also uh, together with the Technical University in Vienna, uh, we tried to announce a bachelor thesis, uh, where this person um, can make research on this and maybe develop it also further. And also we would like to, may, may, maybe we get um, a person who uh, can support us at the PEV also in future as maybe a portal manager. Okay, that's about the history. Um, so how can it look, look like in future? Um, yes, the, the main part here is of course the, the software, or the, the package behind that Chico's portal. Um, we need a platform and this platform should have a few requirements. Um, first, it should be an existing data management system uh, because we don't want to reinvent the wheel. <laughs> We don't have the developing time to do this, but, and there are some software packages available. It should, of course, include geospatial features. It should be free available. It should, um, it should be open source, so with a um, big community in the background. And yes, it should be also constantly improving. And I found two solutions, two possible solutions. Um, the first one is the geo network. I mentioned it before, it was also used uh, by the BKG um, 2011 for the prototype and it's, it was uh, developed uh, further and it has a lot of functionality that we can use for the Chico's portal. For example, the metadata can be harvested from other platforms, data centers. It can be validated, created there and also edited there. Um, then you can also create their own metadata schema um, and the metadata can also be exchanged with APIs and there are a lot of standards uh, with other platforms can, it, it can be exchanged. For example, the Geo uh, portal is also compatible to this Geo network. 
and it also have, it, it can also have a, a intuitive search interface and a dynamic map. So it would be a good solution for this. And also we at the BEV also have uh, our data platform as we have such a, a metadata platform. Um, they are also using the geo network. And it's also used uh, worldwide by a lot of um, organizations and national um, entities. Another possibility would be or could be CCAN. I talked with Kirsten Egger a few weeks ago and she uh, uh, suggested this. And it could be also a possibility. It, have in, it, has, it has in, a, in, in addition some visualization of uh, by graphics. It's, I think, a little bit more seamable. And there are also a lot of uh, extensions available. And on GitHub, there are a lot, there are much more um, contributing developers. But which platform we could use for this is uh, a part or should be focused in the research, maybe by the bachelor thesis. Um, so, what, what could be the next steps? In the first step, so we are in the beginning of the, the first phase is the resource, re research phase uh, where we find the best suitable um, platform software for our needs. If you have another uh, solution or suggestion, please um, tell it me. Um, then, of course, we have to make an overview about the existing geodetic metadata. And uh, also, we have to define in which granularity we would like to have the metadata at the GIGAS portal. What Maybe it's uh, um, okay if we, we use uh, only the data, which is also defined in the DOIs, maybe some more that we have to find out. And of course, we have to uh, work closely together with the, with, um, with the uh, GIGOS DOI working group and maybe the committee on this, maybe it can be um, uh, um, compared uh, or uh, yes, together. And of course, then, the build-up phase is important to build up the platform and the metadata schema or what we uh, would like to realize. And the most important thing is then the operating phase uh, where it's also important to integrate the existing metadata of the geodetic data. And it can only be done step by step with the first step to, to use the data which is already available and then also in another in the second point to encourage the data providers, the IG services uh, to create the metadata and in the best way also the DUIs uh, in this step also for the data that we can use also for the GIGAS portal platform. But of course there are also requirements for success, for, for the success for the GIGAS portal, we need in the end, the cooperation of all IG services and metadata providers. In the end, it, it's uh, yes, a great vision to have all the products and observations there, but it, maybe it took very long uh, if, if we have it really there. Uh, but the metadata should be provided by the IG services or the data providers itself, not by the GIGAS portal or the coordinating office or something else. They should provide it, they have to uh, create it and the GIGAS portal only have to harvest it and synchronize the metadata. And yes, of course, also a GIGAS portal manager is needed uh, who should serve as a contact point for all data providers and users, um, should also manage the metadata platforms or install a new harvesting process for a new metadata and also further develop the metadata platform. Okay. Um, Big question is also, is it worth to do, is, to do this? I think yes, and I think also the majority of the community. <laughs> it's very useful for the geodesists, ge geodesists, of course, because they may be also confused in other fields if they want to get the information, but also the geoscientists and the general society to work there as a one-stop shop, I've mentioned it, and this increasingly uh, to increase the visibility of the whole, the, the, the whole geodetic data and products. Of course, also the visibility of the uh, data providers, the IG services, and of course the whole IG, GIGOS, and the whole geodesy. And maybe it also helps to promote geodesy on a political level. Okay, thank you for your attention.
uh, there is a question on the chat. Yeah, would it be possible to use AirDAP providing unified access to various data service, which would allow a front end and allow data providers to maintain their own data? Yes, I don't know this, but I have a, a closer look for, for this. Maybe it's a possible solution. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Yes, maybe El, uh, Kirsten, you. I have some some comments. Um, I think your strategy to use existing metadata is the only one that scales. And if you say you want to, you start with defining your metadata model. Um, this can be can be challenging because if the data centers do not have the metadata, they wouldn't change their metadata. So. Mm. Therefore, I think the, our strategy that I have also shown to to really use meta uh, DUI metadata, but to make sure that it's rich metadata that we speak about, and this is what we're doing in the GWAS DUI working group, speak about what content shall be placed in which field of the metadata, and then harvest the metadata from from the data repositories or the data centers that are minting DUI is good. If you speak about ISO 11115 metadata, this is definitely much more specific to describe geodetic data because it's very much data focused. Mm -hmm. Comparing this to data site metadata is somehow a summary in several parts. And geo network requires ISO 11115 metadata. So you should really encourage then the data repositories to also provide this. But I think this is something we have to, we, you have to make sure in any case to not not need to um, do any metadata update because this should be done on the basis where it's where it's done and of course for for selecting the 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 um the software you use um both seeker and, and iso and geo network are catalog softwares so you will have a more or less animated searchable catalog of your geodetic data um I think neither of them can display the data itself or themselves. Mm -hmm. So today, and I have many experiences with people who want to make build portals and they all speak about this dashboards and visualization of the data. For that, you would need to, to explore different um, techniques and software, but I, I don't know if it's even suitable and necessary for the data. <laughs> for the first one, for the geo network, I think it's also possible there to define our own uh, metadata schema there. And so you can make it a little bit better if you, uh, instead of using only the ISO standard. So I think that could be a solution. I don't know, I have not uh, done more research on this, but we have to look at this, yes, of course. Uh, I like your enthusiasm. Really, I want to thank you again one more time. Uh, I think maybe I am naive, but you really need a kind of assessment of the user requirement. What they need, who are the users, what do they need? If you talk about the IAG services, each service has its own metadata handle. For example, within the IGS and also it's true for the other services, mm -hmm. they have this kind of log file where they have for each single station, all the metadata that is needed. And I know, for instance, at IGN, we are operating the IGS reference frame coordination and to get the metadata in order to be able to combine apples, not apples and onions, then my colleague next door go to these site logs and extract the data to be sure that all the analysis centers are using the same antenna features, et cetera, et cetera. So again, I think you, you are enthusiastic and thank you for that, but probably you need 
to, to have a kind of user requirements. Who are the users? What do they need? Which type of metadata? Before embarking in the development, because the development will take time. And when you have that user requirement, you will shape the way to get these uh, information for mm -hmm. the user. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yes, it's very important to, to find out really the user needs and it should be also all done in the, this, this research, research phase, what we have and also from the service, from the data providers, um, what, what they can uh, provide there from metadata and uh, it's very important, yes. And, and maybe, yes, I'm very, <laughs> maybe I'm very enthusiastic about mm -hmm. this, uh, but it's also a great vision, but I, I'm, I, I know that it takes very long to, to uh, finalize this. The first user that you want to interrogate, these are the services of IAG, because they might be happy with the, what they have. Mm. Yeah, I think we have to, or all of us, we have to distinguish between two issues. One is the idea of the one-stop sh shop, <laughs> And the other one is requirement to get metadata. The one-stop shop is really would be very useful to make it easier to the user, to people who are interested, to get all the data from all the products and results from the various services, maybe also derived products, for instance, in terms mm. of um, sanitary delays or something. And uh, to get it directly in a, let's say, in a, um, a, no, a well-known format and to make it much easier for comparison, validation, etc. That's a one-stop shop. The other is providing metadata, uh, also very useful. And I think as Suhia mentioned, metadata already exists, hardly, <laughs> at some of the services, not, not completely. And it would also be very useful to get a common access to the metadata. So I'm in favor of both, but I think you have to distinguish between these two aspects. But I think you can combine both the, the metadata platform and also the one-stop shop. Yeah, at good. the end you can combine it, but there should be, they say, two entries or two, because yes. it's a different issue. No, no, I would, I would also suggest to get a one-stop shop for the real products, for the data, because so far people have to do a lot of search and to find what they, what they want but, but that's in so terms weak. of length of day or, or coordinates and so on. So it's really difficult. There are some attempts of such databases, but still it is very difficult for a normal user who is mm -hmm. not an insider. But that's also the aim of this metadata platform. But, so, but yeah. <laughs> I, I would okay. like to, to, to add on that uh, because we could talk a very long time about it. It's a one-stop shop for metadata. That's a typical uh, task and purpose of, of a geo portal. In, in any case, you can look where you want uh, that's always the same thing. It's not collecting the same data at a different server. It's just providing the information which you need to find this data. And this is, uh, I think, the, the really uh, important purpose of this work. And I really appreciate everything what you do, but, but also the work on, on this uh, portal on, on geodetic data in, in uh, particular, because this will help increase the visibility of, of this data and also the use of this data. But of course, I fully agree, it's hard work, uh, but you mentioned that uh, it's something which cannot be done by you alone, but uh, th there is uh, additional work needed just to do it. But uh, it's, and I repeat it, a one-stop shop for metadata. And, and the metadata links also to the data directly so
for me, metadata is much more because I am, when I was um, active in IBS, we discussed a lot about metadata. And that's much more than our normal results or the normal products. That's um, meteorological data, that's information about when the clock had a failure, and a lot of additional information which should be in the metadata base. It's not the regular product. So I think we need both. And also the information about the clock breaks and so on is also important for potential users. Uh, in the original concept, um, it also combined, it's not only the metadata platform, Chico's portal, also an information and uh, publishing or uh, visualization um, of, of the products or the data. And one part is realized already at the Chico's website with the descriptions about the products and, and the data. So this is already one part, which is also, which was, which was also defined in the Chico's uh, 2020 book. So this, uh, this kind was realized already. Yes, you can uh, extend it and you can, can make better visualizations of it. It's, of course, it would be very good. And, but you should see this a little bit combines the, the Chico's portal as a metadata platform and also together with the description, the, the descriptions and maybe further also visualizations. Uh, but we want um, um, all at one platform at this Chico's portal. Um, I think this is the only strategy that, that can lead to a success because if I, I think there is a, there's a reason why, for example, GNSS data is not stored at one single place, but distributed in different centers. And um, I know some of these joint data portals, even with distributed data access, but I think if the GIGOS portal would provide, for example, links to different race solutions from different centers where they are and inform about differences and access points. This would be much, much very, very helpful at the first step. And then once you have the DOI or once you have the data link in the metadata, you can directly go and then you can use it really as a, as a useful metadata portal without mm -hmm. going to the data because then you need to transfer all the data. And this is, yeah. Just a very simple question. Um, you have this um, document of the Unified Analysis Workshop from 2010, which is probably the, the most elaborate document of 59 pages on this. Uh, I'll send it to you because this is a, uh, it it's, it's a about lot an, of tables. It's about the metadata flow? Yes, or? yes. It's, yes uh, I, have... I think it's about the standards that Chigos got to. Mm -hmm. I have one version of it, but I'm not sure if it's 50 pages long. So maybe it's another version. Then please send it to I, me. I will send it to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, in the program is written a 10 minutes uh, discussion. We have today a very interesting day. You are not happy, but, but we have interesting conference. <laughs> we, yeah, so we, we have this morning very interesting talks about um, what we have to face in geodesy. And so we have to, to advance geodesy as, as science. Uh, we have also uh, the reports of the regional GIGOS uh, uh, associates, what is also very important to, to get to the close to the society. And now we have uh, some reports on the external relations and, and the um, uh, perspectives of GIGOS about making geodesy more available for outside IAG. Uh, there are comments, discussions, uh, recommendations about the topics uh, treated today. Tomorrow will be also very, very interesting. Tomorrow we have the focus areas and the, and the two bureaus, Chigos bureaus. So tomorrow will be also be exciting.
Um, if there is no more questions or comments, we can meet today at 7 p.m. at the restaurant to drink a lot of German beer. This is the best of the meeting. And um, uh, for the virtual colleagues, the virtual colleagues who want to add something. Uh, if not, then we can reconvene tomorrow at 8.30 uh, and hear the, the focus areas reports. Thank you very much. <laughs>